Chapter Ten, Part Three, of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Chapter Ten: Emperors Decius, Gallus, Aemilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus. Part Three. One, As the prosperity of the Franks composed one of the greatest and most enlightened nations of Europe, the powers of learning and ingenuity had been exhausted in the discovery of their unlettered ancestors. To the tales of credulity have succeeded the systems of fancy. Every passage has been sifted, every spot has been surveyed, that might possibly reveal some faint traces of their origin. It has been supposed that Pannonia, that Gaul, that the northern parts of Germany, gave birth to that celebrated colony of warriors. At length the most rational critics, rejecting the fictitious immigrants of ideal conquerors, have acquiesced in a sentiment whose simplicity persuades us of its truth. They suppose that about the year 240 a new confederacy was formed under the name of Franks by the old inhabitants of the Lower Rhine and the Weiser. The present circle of Westphalia, the Landgraviate of Hesse, and the duchies of Brunswick and Lüneburg, were the ancient of the Chorsi, who, in their inaccessible morasses, defied the Roman arms, of the Cherusci, proud of the fame of Arminius, of the Catai, formidable by their firm and intrepid infantry, and of several other tribes of inferior power and renown. The love of liberty was the ruling passion of these Germans, the enjoyment of it their best treasure. The word that expressed that enjoyment, the most pleasing to the ear, they deserved, they assumed, they maintained the honourable appellation of Franks, or freemen, which concealed, though it did not extinguish, the peculiar names of the several states of the confederacy. Tacit consent and mutual advantage dictated the first laws of the Union. It was gradually cemented by habit and experience. The League of the Franks may admit of some comparison with the Helvetic body, in which every canton, retaining its independent sovereignty, consults with its brethren in the common cause, without acknowledging the authority of any supreme head or representative assembly. But the principle of the two confederacies was extremely different. A peace of two hundred years has rewarded the wise and honest policy of the Swiss. An inconsistent spirit, the thirst of rapine, and a disregard to the most solemn treaties, disgraced the character of the Franks. The Romans had long experienced the daring valour of the people of Lower Germany. The union of their strength threatened Gaul with a more formidable invasion, and required the presence of Gallienus, the heir and colleague of imperial power. Whilst that prince, and his infant son Salonis, displayed in the court of Treves, the majesty of the empire, its armies, were ably conducted by their general, Posthumus, who, though he afterwards betrayed the family of Valerian, was ever faithful to that great interests of the monarchy. The treacherous language of panegyrics and medals darkly announces a long series of victories. Trophies and titles attest, if such evidence can attest, the fame of Posthumus, who is repeatedly styled the conqueror of the Germans and the saviour of Gaul. But a single fact, the only one indeed of which we have any distinct knowledge, erases in a great measure these monuments of vanity and adulation. The Rhine, though dignified with the title of safeguard of the provinces, was an imperfect barrier against the daring spirit of enterprise with which the Franks were actuated. Their rapid devastations stretched from the river to the foot of the Pyrenees. Nor were they stopped by these mountains. Spain, which had never dreaded, was unable to resist the inroads of the Germans. During twelve years, the greatest part of the reign of Gallienus, that opulent country was the theatre of unequal and destructive hostilities. Tarragona, the flourishing capital of a peaceful province, 
was sacked and almost destroyed. And so late as the days of Orosus, who wrote in the fifth century, wretched cottages, scattered amidst the ruins of magnificent cities, still recorded the rage of the barbarians. When the exhausted country no longer supplied a variety of plunder, the Franks seized on some vessels in the ports of Spain, and transported themselves into Mauritania. The distant province was astonished with the fury of these barbarians, who seemed to fall from a new world, as their name, manners, and complexion were equally unknown on the coast of Africa. 2. In that part of Upper Saxony, beyond the Elbe, which is at present called the Marquisat of Lusca, there existed in ancient times a sacred wood, the awful seat of the superstition of the Suavi. None were permitted to enter the holy precincts without confessing, by the servile bonds and suppliant posture, the immediate presence of the sovereign deity. Patriotism contributed, as well as devotion, to consecrate the sonny world, or wood of the Semnons. It was universally believed that the nation had received its first existence on that sacred spot. At stated periods, the numerous tribes who gloried in the Suavic blood resorted thither by their ambassadors, and the memory of their common extraction was perpetrated by barbaric rites and human sacrifices. The wide extended name of the Suavi filled the interior countries of Germany, from the banks of the Uda to those of the Danube. They were distinguished from the other Germans by their peculiar mode of dressing their long hair, which they gathered into a rude knot on the crown of their head, and they delighted in an ornament that showed their ranks more lofty and terrible in the eyes of the enemy. Jealous as the Germans were of military renown, they all confessed the superior valour of the Suavi, and the tribes of the Espetes and Tencteri, who, with a vast army, encountered the dictator Caesar, declared that they esteemed it not a disgrace to have fled before a people to whose arms the immortal gods themselves were unequal. In the reign of the Emperor Caracalla, an innumerable swarm of Servi appeared on the banks of the Main, and in the neighbourhood of the Roman provinces, in quest either of food, of plunder, or of glory. The hasty army of volunteers gradually coalesced into a great and permanent nation, and as it was composed from so many different tribes, assumed the name of Almany, or Olman, to denote at once their various lineage and their common bravery. The latter was soon felt by the Romans in many a hostile inroad. The Olmani fought chiefly on horseback, but their cavalry was rendered still more formidable by a mixture of light infantry, selected from the bravest and most active of the youth, whom frequent exercise had inured to accompany the horsemen in the longest march, the most rapid charge, or the most precipitate retreat. This warlike people of Germans had been astonished by the immense preparations of Alexander Severus. They were dismayed by the arms of his successor, a barbarian equal in valour and fierceness to themselves. But still hovering on the frontiers of the empire, they increased the general disorder that ensued after the death of Decius. They inflicted severe wounds on the rich provinces of Gaul. They were the first who removed the veil that covered the feeble majesty of Italy. A numerous body of the Almany penetrated across the Danube and through the Riatine Alps into the plains of Lombardy, advanced as far as Ravenna, and displayed the victorious banners of barbarians almost in sight of Rome. The insult and danger rekindled in the Senate some sparks of their ancient virtue. Both the emperors were engaged in far distant wars, Valerian in the east and Gallienus on the Rhine. All the hopes and resources of the Romans were in themselves. In this emergency, the senators resumed the defiance of the Republic, drew out the Praetorian guards, who had been left to garrison the capital, and filled up their numbers by enlisting into the public service the stoutest and most willing of the plebeians. The Almany, 
astonished with the sudden appearance of an army more numerous than their own, retired into Germany, laden with spoil, and their retreat was esteemed as a victory by the unwarlike Romans. When Gallienus received the intelligence that his capital was delivered from the barbarians, he was much less delighted than alarmed with the courage of the senate, since it might one day prompt them to rescue the public from domestic tyranny as well as from foreign invasion. His timid ingratitude was published to his subjects, in an edict which prohibited the senators from exercising any military employment, and even from approaching the camps of the legions. But his fears were groundless. The rich and luxurious nobles, sinking into their natural character, accepted as a favour this disgraceful exemption from military service. And as long as they were indulged in the enjoyment of their baths, their theatres, and their villas, they cheerfully resigned the more dangerous cares of the empire to the rough hands of peasants and soldiers. Another invasion of the Almany, of a more formidable aspect, but more glorious event, is mentioned by a writer of the Lower Empire. Three hundred thousand are said to have been vanquished in a battle near Milan, by Gallienus in person, at the head of only ten thousand Romans. We may, however, with great probability, ascribe this incredible victory, either to the credulity of the historian, or to some exaggerated exploits of one of the emperor's lieutenants. It was by arms of a very different nature, that Gallienus endeavoured to protect Italy from the fury of the Germans. He espoused Piper, the daughter of a king of the Marcomanni, a Suevic tribe, which was often confounded with the Almany in their wars and conquests. To the father, as the price of his alliance, he granted an ample settlement in Pannonia. The native charms of unpolished beauty seemed to have fixed the daughter in the affections of the inconsistent emperor, and the bands of policy were more firmly connected by those of love. But the haughty prejudice of Rome still refused the name of marriage to the profane mixture of a citizen and a barbarian, and has stigmatized the German princess with the opprobrious title of concubine of Gallienus. 3. We have already traced the emigration of the Goths from Scandinavia, or at least from Prussia, to the mouth of the Borythianus, and have followed their victorious arms from the Borythianus to the Danube. Under the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, the frontier of the last mentioned river was perpetually infested by the inroads of Germans and Sarmatians. But it was defended by the Romans with more than usual firmness and success. The provinces that were the seat of war recruited the armies of Rome with an inexhaustible supply of hardy soldiers, and more than one of these Illyrian peasants attained the station and displayed the abilities of a general. Though flying parties of the barbarians, who incessantly hovered on the banks of the Danube, penetrated sometimes to the confines of Italy and Macedonia, their progress was commonly checked, or their return intercepted, by the imperial lieutenants. But the great stream of the Gothic hostilities was diverted into a very different channel. The Goths, in their new settlement of the Ukraine, soon became masters of the northern coast of the Euxin. To the south of that inland sea was situated the soft and wealthy provinces of Asia Minor, which possessed all that could attract, and nothing that could resist a barbarian conqueror. The banks of the Borysianus are only sixty miles distant, from the narrow entrance of the peninsula of Crim Tartary, known to the ancients under the name of Chersonese Taurica. On that inhospitable shore, Euripides, embellishing with exquisite art the tales of antiquity, has placed the scene of one of his most affecting tragedies. The bloody sacrifices of Diana, the arrival of Orestes and Pallades, and the triumph of virtue and religion over savage fierceness, served to represent an historical truth that the Tauri, the original inhabitants of the peninsula, 
were in some degree reclaimed from their brutal manners by a gradual intercourse with the Grecian colonies, which settled along the maritime coast. The little kingdom of Bosphorus, whose capital was situated on the straits, through which the Meotis communicates itself to the Euxin, was composed of degenerate Greeks and half-civilized barbarians. It subsisted, as an independent state, from the time of the Philippinesian War, was, at last, swallowed up by the ambition of Mithridates, and, with the rest of his dominions, sunk under the weight of the Roman arms. From the reign of Augustus, the kings of Bosphorus were the humble, but not useless, allies of the empire. By presents, by arms, and by a slight fortification drawn across the isthmus, they effectually guarded against the roving plunderers of Sumatia, the axis of a country which, from its peculiar situation and convenient harbours, commanded the Euxin Sea and Asia Minor. As long as a sceptre was possessed by a lineal succession of kings, they acquitted themselves of their important charge with vigilance and success. Domestic factions and the fears, or private interest, of obscure usurpers who seized on the vacant throne, admitted the Goths into the heart of Bosphorus. With the acquisition of a superfluous waste of fertile soil, the conquerors obtained the command of a naval force, sufficient to transport their armies to the coast of Asia. The ships used in the navigation of the Euxin were of a very singular construction. There were slight, flat-bottomed barks framed of timber only, without the least mixture of iron, and occasionally covered with a shelving roof, on the appearance of a tempest. In these floating houses the Goths carelessly trusted themselves to the mercy of an unknown sea, under the conduct of sailors pressed into the service, and whose skill and fidelity were equally suspicious. But the hopes of plunder had banished every idea of danger, and a natural fearlessness of temper supplied in their minds the more rational confidence, which is the just result of knowledge and experience. Warriors of such a daring spirit must have often murmured against the cowardice of their guides, who required the strongest assurances of a settled calm before they would venture to embark, and would scarcely ever be tempted to lose sight of the land. Such, at least, is the practice of the modern Turks, and they are probably not inferior in the art of navigation to the ancient inhabitants of Borosphius. The fleet of Goths, leaving the coast of Circassa on the left hand, first appeared before Pytus, the utmost limits of the Roman provinces. A city provided with a convenient port, and fortified with a strong wall. Here they met with a resistance more obstinate than they had reason to expect from the feeble garrison of a distant fortress. They were repulsed, and their disappointment seemed to diminish the terror of the Gothic name. As long as Circesianus, an offer of superior rank and merit, defended that frontier, all their efforts were ineffectual. But as soon as he was removed by Valerian to a more honourable but less important station, they resumed the attack of Pytheus, and by the destruction of that city obliterated the memory of their former disgrace. Circling round the eastern extremity of the Euxine Sea, the navigation from Pytheus to Trabzond is about three hundred miles. The course of the Goths carried them in sight of the country of Colchis, so famous by the expedition of the Argonauts, and they even attempted, though without success, to pillage a rich temple at the mouth of the river Phasis. Trebzond, celebrated in the retreat of the Ten Thousand as an ancient colony of Greeks, derived its wealth and splendour from the magnificence of the Emperor Hadrian who had constructed an artificial port on a coast left destitute by nature of secure harbours. The city was large and populous. A double enclosure of walls seemed to defy the fury of the Goths, and the usual garrison had been strengthened by a reinforcement of ten thousand men. But there were not any advantages capable of supplying the absence of discipline and vigilance. The numerous garrison of Trebzond, dissolved in riot and luxury, 
disdained to guard their impregnable fortifications. The Goths soon discovered the supine negligence of the besieged, erected a lofty pile of fascines, ascended the walls in the silence of the night, and entered the defenceless city sword in hand. A general massacre of the people ensued, whilst the affrighted soldiers escaped through the opposite gates of the town. The most holy temples and the most splendid edifices were involved in a common destruction. The booty that fell into the hands of the Goths was immense. The wealth of the adjacent countries had been deposited in Tresbond as in a secure place of refuge. The number of captives was incredible, as the victorious barbarians ranged, without opposition, through the extensive province of Pontus. The rich spoils of Trebzond filled a great fleet of ships that had been found in the port. The robust youth of the sea coast were chained to the oar, and the Goths, satisfied with the success of their first naval expedition, returned in triumph to their new establishment in the kingdom of Bosphorus. The second expedition of the Goths was undertaken with greater powers of men and ships. But they steered a different course, and disdaining the exhausted provinces of Pontus, followed the western coast of the Euxin, passed before the wide mouth of the Brucianus, the Niester, and the Danube, and increasing their fleet by the capture of a great number of fishing barks, they approached the narrow outlet through which the Euxian Sea pours its waters into the Mediterranean, and divides the continents of Europe and Asia. The garrison of Chalcedon was encamped near the temple of Jupiter Urius, on a promontory that commanded the entrance of the strait, and so inconsiderable were the dreaded invasions of the barbarians, that this body of troops surpassed in number the Gothic army. But it was in numbers alone that they surpassed it. They deserted with precipitation their advantageous post, and abandoned the town of Chalcedon, most plentifully stored with arms and money, to the discretion of the conquerors. Whilst they hesitated whether they should prefer the sea, or land of Europe or Asia, for the scene of their hostilities, a perfidious fugitive pointed out Nicomedia, once the capital of the kings of Bithynia, as a rich and easy conquest. He guided the march, which was only sixty miles from the camp of Chalcedon, directed the resistless attack, and partook of the booty. For the Goths had learned sufficient policy to reward the traitor whom they detested. Nice, Prussia, Apamia, Caius, cities that had sometimes rivalled or intimidated the splendour of Nicomedia, were involved in the same calamity, which, in a few weeks, raged without control through the whole province of Bithynia. Three hundred years of peace, enjoyed by the soft inhabitants of Asia, had abolished the excise of arms, and removed the apprehension of danger. The ancient walls were suffered to moulder away, and all the revenue of the most opulent cities was resolved for the construction of baths, temples, and theatres. When the city of Cyzicus withstood the utmost effort of Mithridates, it was distinguished by wise laws, a naval power of two hundred galleys, and three arsenals, of arms, of military engines, and of corn. It was still the seat of wealth and luxury, but of its ancient strength nothing remained except the situation, in a little island off the Propontis connected with the continent of Asia only by two bridges. From the recent sack of Prussia, the Goths advanced within eighteen miles of the city, which they had devoted to destruction. But the ruin of Cyzicus was delayed by a fortunate accident. The season was rainy, and the lake of Polonatis, the reservoir of all springs of Mount Olympus, rose to an uncommon height. The little river of Rhindacus, which issued from the lake, swelled into a broad and rapid stream, and stopped the progress of the Goths. Their retreat to the maritime city of Heraclea, where the fleet had probably been stationed, was attended by a long train of wagons laden with the spoils of Bithynia, and was marked by the flames of Nice and Nicomedia, which they wantonly burnt. Some obscure hints are mentioned of a doubtful combat that secured their retreat. 
but even a complete victory would have been of little moment, as the approach of the autumn equinox summoned them to hasten their return. To navigate the Euxine before the month of May, or after that of September, is esteemed by the modern Turks the most unquestionable instance of rashness and folly. When we are informed that the third fleet, equipped by the Goths in the port of Bosphorus, consisted of five hundred sails of ships, our ready imagination instantly computes and multiplies the formidable armament. But, as we are assured by the judicious Starbo, that the piratical vessels used by the barbarians of Pontus and the lesser Scythia were not capable of containing more than twenty-five or thirty men, we may safely affirm that fifteen thousand warriors, at the most, embarked in this great expedition. Impatient at the limits of the Euxine, they steered their destructive course from the Chimerian to the Thracian Bosphorus. When they had almost gained the middle of the straits, they were suddenly driven back to the entrance of them, till a favourable wind, springing up the next day, carried them in a few hours into the placid sea, or rather lake, of the Propontius. Their landing on the little island of Sisychus was attended with the ruin of that ancient and noble city. From thence, issuing again through the narrow passage of the Hellespont, they pursued the winding navigation amidst the numerous islands scattered over the archipelago, or the Aegean Sea. The assistance of captives and deserters must have been very necessary to pilot their vessels, and to direct their various incursions as well on the coast of Greece as on that of Asia. At length the Gothic fleet anchored in the port of Piraeus, five miles distant from Athens, which had attempted to make some preparations for a vigorous defence. Cleodamus, one of the engineers employed by the emperor's orders to fortify the maritime cities against the Goths, had already begun to repair the ancient walls, fallen to decay since the time of Scylla. The efforts of his skill were ineffectual, and the barbarians became masters of the native seat of the muses and the arts. But while the conquerors abandoned themselves to the license of plunder and impertinence, their fleet, that lay with the slender guard in the harbour of Piraeus, was unexpectedly attacked by the brave Daxippus, who, flying with the engineer Cleodamus, from the sack of Athens, collected the hasty band of volunteers, peasants as well as soldiers, and in some measure avenged the calamities of his country. But this exploit, whatever lustre it might shed on the declining age of Athens, served rather to irritate than to subdue the undaunted spirit of the northern invaders. A general conflagration blazed out at the same time in every district of Greece. Thebes and Argus, Corinth and Sparta, which had formerly waged such memorable wars against each other, were now unable to bring an army into the field, or even to defend their ruined fortifications. The rage of war, both by land and by sea, spread from the eastern point of Sunim to the western coast of Epirus. The Goths had already advanced within sight of Italy, when the approach of such imminent danger awakened the indolent Gallienus from his dream of pleasure. The emperor appeared in arms, and his presence seemed to have checked the ardour, and to have divided the strength of the enemy. Nalobatus, a chief of the Heruli, accepted an honourable capitulation, entered with a large body of his countrymen into the service of Rome, and was invested with the ornaments of a consular dignity, which had never before been profaned by the hands of a barbarian. Great numbers of the Goths, disgusted with the perils and hardships of a tedious voyage, broke into Mercia, with a design of forcing their way over the Danube to their settlements in the Ukraine. The wild attempt would have proved inevitable destruction, if the discord of the Roman generals had not opened to the barbarians the means of an escape. The small remainder of this destroying host returned on board their vessels, and measuring back their way through the Hellespont and the Borysphus, ravaged in their passage the shores of Troy, 
whose fame, immortalized by Homer, will probably survive the memory of the Gothic conquests. As soon as they found themselves in safety within the basin of the Euxin, they landed at Ancalus in Thrace, near the foot of Mount Hamus, and after all their toils indulged themselves in the use of those pleasant and sultry hot baths. What remained of the voyage was a short and easy navigation. Such was the various fate of the third and greatest of their naval enterprises. It may seem difficult to conceive how the original body of fifteen thousand warriors could sustain the losses and diversions of so bold an adventure. But as their numbers were gradually wasted by the sword, by shipwrecks, and by the influence of a warm climate, they were perpetually renewed by troops of banditti and deserters who flocked to the standard of plunder, and by a crowd of fugitive slaves, often of German or Sarmatian extraction, who eagerly seized the glorious opportunity of freedom and revenge. In these expeditions the Gothic nation claimed a superior share of honour and danger. But the tribes that fought under the Gothic banners are sometimes distinguished and sometimes confounded in the imperfect histories of that age. And as the barbarian fleet seemed to issue from the mouth of the Tanis, the vague but familiar appellation of Scythians was frequently bestowed on the mixed multitude. End of chapter 10, part 3「Emperors Decius, Gallus, Aemilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus. Part 4. In the general calamities of mankind, the death of an individual, however exalted, the ruin of an edifice, however famous, are passed over with careless inattention. Yet we cannot forget that the temple of Diana at Ephesus, after having risen with increasing splendour from seven repeated misfortunes, was finally burnt by the Goths in their third naval invasion. The arts of Greece and the wealth of Asia had conspired to erect that sacred and magnificent structure. It was supported by a hundred and twenty-seven marble columns of the Ionic order. They were the gifts of devout monarchs, and each was sixty feet high. The altar was adorned with the masterly sculptures of Paraxteles, who had, perhaps, selected from the favourite legends of the place of the birth of the divine children of Latona, the concealment of Apollo after the slaughter of the Cyclops, and the clemency of Bacchus to the vanquished Amazons. Yet the length of the temple of Ephesus was only four hundred and twenty-five feet, about two-thirds of the measure of the church of St. Peter's at Rome. In other dimensions it was still more inferior to that sublime production of modern architecture. The spreading arms of a Christian cross require a much greater breadth than the oblong temples of the pagans, and the boldest artists of antiquity would have been startled at the proposal of raising in the air a dome of the size and proportions of the Pantheon. The Temple of Diana was, however, admired as one of the wonders of the world. Successive empires the Persian, the Macedonian, and the Roman, had revered its sanctity and enriched its splendour. But the rude savages of the Baltic were destitute of a taste for the elegant arts, and they despised the ideal terrors of a foreign superstition. Another circumstance is related to these invasions, which might deserve our notice, were it not justly to be suspected, as the fanciful conceit of a recent sophist. We are told that in the sack of Athens the Goths had collected all the libraries, and were on the point of setting fire to this funeral pile of Grecian learning. Had not one of their chiefs, of more refined policy than his brethren, dissuaded them from the design, by the profound observation, that as long as the Greeks were addicted to the study of books, they would never apply themselves to the exercise of arms. 
the sagacious counsellor, should the truth of the fact be admitted, reasoned like an ignorant barbarian. In the most polite and powerful nations, genius of every kind has displayed itself about the same period, and the age of science has generally been the age of military virtue and success. 4. The new sovereign of Persia, Artaxerxes and his son Sapor, had triumphed, as we have already seen, over the house of Arsaces. Of the many princes of that ancient race, Chrysoas, king of Armenia, had alone preserved both his life and his independence. He defended himself by that natural strength of his country, by the perpetual resort of fugitives and malcontents, by the alliance of the Romans, and above all by his own courage. Invincible in arms during a thirty years' war, he was at length assassinated by the emissaries of Sapor, king of Persia. The patriotic satraps of Armenia, who asserted the freedom and dignity of the crown, implored the protection of Rome in the favour of Triadatus, the lawful heir. But the son of Chosroes was an infant, the allies were at a distance, and the Persian monarch advanced towards the frontier at the head of an irresistible force. Young Triadatus, the future hope of his country, was saved by the fidelity of a servant, and Armenia continued above twenty-seven years a reluctant province of the great monarchy of Persia. Elated with this easy conquest, and presuming on the distress or the degeneracy of the Romans, Sapor obliged the strong garrisons of Kare and Nisbus to surrender, and spread devastation and terror on either side of the Euphrates. The loss of an important frontier, the ruin of a faithful and natural ally, and the rapid success of Sapor's ambition, affected Rome with a deep sense of the insult as well as of the danger. Valerian flattered himself that the vigilance of his lieutenants would sufficiently provide for the safety of the Rhine and of the Danube. But he resolved, notwithstanding his advanced age, to march in person to the defence of the Euphrates. During his progress through Asia Minor, the naval enterprises of the Goths were suspended, and the afflicted province enjoyed a transient and felicious calm. He passed the Euphrates, encountered the Persian monarch near the walls of Edessa, was vanquished and taken prisoner by Sapor. The particulars of this great event are darkly and imperfectly represented. Yet, by the glimmering light which is afforded us, we may discover a long series of imprudence, of error, and of deserved misfortunes on the side of the Roman Emperor. He reposed an implicit confidence in Macrianus, his praetorian prefect. That worthless minister rendered his master formidably only to the oppressed subjects, and contemptible to the enemies of Rome. By his weak or wicked counsels, the imperial army was betrayed into a situation where valour and military skill were equally unavailing. The vigorous attempt of the Romans to cut their way through the Persian host was repulsed with great slaughter, and Sapor, who encompassed the camp with superior numbers, patiently waited till the increasing rage of famine and pestilence had ensured his victory. The licentious murmurs of the legions soon accused Valerian as the cause of their calamities. Their sedacious clamours demanded an instant capitulation. An immense sum of gold was offered to purchase the permission of a disgraceful retreat. But the Persian, conscious of his superiority, refused the money with disdain, and detaining the deputies, advanced in order of battle to the foot of the Roman rampart, and insisted on a personal conference with the emperor. Valerian was reduced to the necessity of entrusting his life and dignity to the faith of an enemy. The interview ended as it was natural to expect. The emperor was made a prisoner, and his astonished troops laid down their arms. In such a moment of triumph, the pride and policy of Sapor promoted him to fill the vacant throne with a successor entirely dependent on his pleasure. Chirides, an obscure fugitive of Antioch, stained with every vice, was chosen to dishonour the Roman purple and the will of the Persian victor could not fail of being ratified by the acclamations 
however reluctant, of the captive army. The imperial slave was eager to secure the favour of his master by an act of treason to his native country. He conducted Sapor over the Euphrates, and, by the way of Calchas, to the metropolis of the east. So rapid were the motions of the Persian cavalry, that, if we may credit a very judicious historian, the city of Antioch was surprised when the idle multitude was fondly gazing on the amusements of the theatre. The splendid buildings of Antioch, private as well as public, were either pillaged or destroyed, and the numerous inhabitants were put to the sword or led away into captivity. The tide of devastation was stopped for a moment, by the resolution of the high priest of Emesa. Arrayed in his sacerdotal robes, he appeared at the head of a great body of fanatic peasants, armed only with slings, and defended his god and his property from the sacrilegious hand of the followers of Zoroaster. But the ruin of Tarsus, and of many other cities, furnishes a melancholy proof that, except in this singular instance, the conquest of Syria and Cilicia, scarcely interrupted the progress of the Persian arms. The advantages of the narrow passes of Mount Taurus were abandoned, in which an invader, whose principal force consisted in his cavalry, would have been engaged in a very unequal combat, and Sapor was permitted to form the siege of Caesarea, the capital of Cappadocia, a city, though of the second rank, which was supposed to contain four hundred thousand inhabitants. Demosthenes commanded in the place, not so much by the commission of the emperor, as in the voluntary defence of his country. For a long time he deferred its fate, and when at last Caesarea was betrayed by the perfidy of a physician, he cut his way through the Persians, who had been ordered to exert their utmost diligence to take him alive. This heroic chief escaped the power of a foe, who might either have honoured or punished his obstinate valour but many thousands of his fellow-citizens were involved in a general massacre, and Sapor is accused of treating his prisoners with wanton and unrelenting cruelty. Much should undoubtedly be allowed for national animosity, much for humbled pride and impotent revenge. Yet, upon the whole, it is certain that the same prince, who, in Armenia, had displayed the mild aspect of a legislator, showed himself to the Romans under the stern features of a conqueror, he despaired of making any permanent establishment in the empire, and sought only to leave behind him a wasted desert, whilst he transported into Persia the people and the treasure of the provinces. At the time when the East trembled at the name of Sapor, he received a present not unworthy of the greatest kings, a long train of camels laden with the most rare and valuable merchandises. The rich offering was accompanied with an epistle, respectful but not servile, from Odenathus, one of the noblest and most opulent senators of Palmyra. "'Who is this Odenathus?' said the haughty victor, and he commanded that the present should be cast into the Euphrates. That he thus insolently presumes to write to his lord, "'If he entertains a hope of mitigating his punishment, let him fall prostrate before the foot of our throne, with his hands bound behind his back.' Should he hesitate, swift destruction shall be poured on his head, on his whole race, and on his country. The desperate extremity to which the Palmyrenian was reduced, called into action all the latent powers of his soul. He met Sapor, but he met him in arms. Infusing his own spirit into the little army collected from the villages of Syria, and the tents of the desert, he hovered round the Persian host, harassed their retreat, carried off part of the treasure, and, what was dearer than any treasure, several of the women of the great king, who was, at last, obliged to repass Euphrates with some marks of haste and confusion. By this exploit, Odenathus laid the foundations of his future fame and fortunes. The majesty of Rome, oppressed by a Persian, was protected by a Syrian or Arab of Palmyra. The voice of history, which is often little more than the organ of hatred or flattery, reproaches Sapor with a proud abuse of the rights of a conquest. We are told that Valerian, in chains, but invested with the imperial purple, was exposed to the multitude, 
a constant spectacle of fallen greatness, and that, whenever the Persian monarch mounted on horseback, he placed his foot on the neck of a Roman emperor, notwithstanding all the remonstrances of his allies, who repeatedly advised him to remember the vicissitudes of fortune, to dread the returning power of Rome, and to make his illustrious captive the pledge of peace, not the object of insult. So poor still remained inflexible. When Valerian sunk under the weight of shame and grief, his skin, stuffed with straw, was formed into the likeness of a human figure, was preserved for ages in the most celebrated temple of Persia. A more real monument of triumph than the fancied trophies of brass and marble so often erected by Roman vanity. The tale is moral and pathetic, but the truth of it may very fairly be called in question. The letters, still extant from the princes of the East to Sapor, are manifest forgeries. Nor is it natural to suppose that a jealous monarch should, even in the person of a rival, thus publicly degrade the majesty of kings. Whatever treatment the unfortunate Valerian might experience in Persia, it is at least certain that the only emperor of Rome who had ever fallen into the hands of the enemy, languished away his life in hopeless captivity. The emperor Gallienus, who had long supported with impatience the censorial severity of his father and colleague, received the intelligence of his misfortunes, with secret pleasure and avowed indifference. "'I knew that my father was immortal,' said he, "'and since he has acted as it becomes a brave man, I am satisfied.' Whilst Rome lamented the fate of her sovereign, the savage coldness of his son was extolled by the servile courtiers as the perfect firmness of a hero and a stoic. It is difficult to paint the light, the various— the inconsistent character of Gallienus, which he displayed without constraint, as soon as he became sole possessor of the empire. In every art that he attempted, his lively genius enabled him to succeed. And as his genius was destitute of judgment, he attempted every art, except the important ones of war and government. He was a master of several curious but useless sciences, a ready orator, an elegant poet, a skilful gardener, an excellent cook, and most contemptible prince. When the great emergencies of the state required his presence and attention, he was engaged in conversation with the philosopher, Plontius, wasting his time in trifling or licentious pleasures, preparing his initiation to the Grecian mysteries, or soliciting a place in the Archipagus of Athens. His profuse magnificence insulted the general poverty, the solemn ridicule of his triumph impressed a deeper sense of the public disgrace. The repeated intelligence of invasions, defeats, and rebellions he received with a careless smile, and, singling out with effective contempt, some particular production of the lost province, he carelessly asked whether Rome must be ruined, unless it was supplied with linen from Egypt, and Aris cloth from Gaul. There were, however, a few short moments in the life of Gallienus, when, exasperated by some recent injury, he suddenly appeared the intrepid soldier and the cruel tyrant, till, satiated with blood, or fatigued by resistance, he insensibly sunk into the natural mildness and indolence of his character. At the time when the reins of government were held with so loose a hand, it is not surprising that a crowd of usurpers should start up in every province of the empire against the son of Valerian. It was probably some ingenious fancy of comparing the thirty tyrants of Rome with the thirty tyrants of Athens that induced the writers of the Augustan history to select that celebrated number, which has been gradually received into a popular appellation. But in every light the parallel is idle and effective. What resemblance can we discover between a council of thirty persons, the united oppressors of a single city, and an uncertain list of independent rivals, who rose and fell in irregular successions through the extent of a vast empire? Nor can the number of thirty be completed, unless we include in the account the women and children who were honoured with the imperial title. The reign of Gallienus, distracted as it was, produced only nineteen pretenders to the throne, 
Cyrides, Macrianus, Ballista, Odianathus, and Zenobi in the east. In Gaul and the western provinces, Posthumus, Lolanius, Victorianus, and his mother Victoria, Marius, and Tetricus, in Illyricum and the confines of the Danube, in Genus, Reglianus, and Aurelius, in Pontus, Saturninus, in Isuria, Trebellianus, Piso in Thessaly, Valens in Achaia, Aemilianus in Egypt, and Celsus in Africa, to illustrate the obscure monuments of the life and death of each individual, would prove a laborious task, alike barren of instruction and of amusement. We may content ourselves with investigating some general characters, that most strongly mark the condition of the times, and the manners of the men, their pretensions, their motives, their fate, and their destructive consequences of their reception. It is sufficiently known that the odious appellation of tyrant was often employed by the ancients to express the illegal seizure of supreme power, without any reference to the abuse of it. Several of the pretenders who raised the standard of rebellion against the Emperor Gallienus were shining models of virtue, and almost all possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability. Their merit had recommended them to the favour of Valerian, and gradually promoted them to the most important commands of the empire. The generals, who assumed the title of Augustus, were either respected by their troops for their able conduct and severe discipline, or admired for valour and success in war, or beloved for frankness and generosity. The field of victory was often the scene of their election. And even the armour of Marius, the most contemptible of all the candidates for the purple, was distinguished, however by intrepid courage, matchless strength, and blunt honesty. His mean and recent trade cast indeed an air of ridicule on his elevation, but his birth could not be more obscure than was that of the greater part of his rivals, who were born of peasants, and enlisted in the army as private soldiers. In times of confusion every active genius finds the place assigned him by nature, in a general state of war, military merit is the road to glory and to greatness. Of the nineteen tyrants, Tetricus only was a senator, Piso alone was a noble. The blood of Numa, through twenty-eight successive generations, ran in the veins of Caliphanus, Piso, who, by female alliances, claimed a right of exhibiting, in his house, the images of Crassus and of the great Pompey. His ancestors had been repeatedly dignified with all the honours which the commonwealth could bestow. And of all the ancient families of Rome, the Califernian alone had survived the tyranny of the Caesars. The personal qualities of Piso added new lustre to his race. The usurper Valens, by whose order he was killed, confessed with deep remorse that even an enemy ought to have respected the sanctity of Piso and although he died in arms against Gallienus, the Senate, with the Emperor's generous permission, decreed the triumphal ornaments to the memory of so virtuous a rebel. The lieutenants of Valerian were grateful to the father whom they esteemed. They disdained to serve the luxurious indolence of his unworthy son. The throne of the Roman world was unsupported by any principle of loyalty, and treason against such a prince might easily be considered as patriotism to the state. Yet, if we examine with candour the conduct of these usurpers, it will appear that they were much often driven into rebellion by their fears, than urged to it by ambition. They dreaded the cruel suspicions of Gallienus. They equally dreaded the capricious violence of their troops. If the dangerous favour of the army had imprudently declared them deserving of the purple, they were marked for sure destruction, and even prudence would counsel them to secure a short enjoyment of empire, and rather to try the fortune of war than to expect the hand of an executioner. When the clamour of the soldiers invested the reluctant victims with the ensigns of sovereign authority, they sometimes mourned in secret their approaching fate. You have lost, said Saturnus, on the day of his elevation, 
"'You have lost a useful commander, "'and you have made a very wretched emperor.' "'The apprehensions of Saturninus "'were justified by the repeated experience of revolutions. "'Of the nineteen tyrants who started up "'under the reign of Gallienus, "'there was not one who enjoyed a life of peace "'or a natural death. "'As soon as they were invested with the bloody purple, "'they inspired their ardents with the same fears and ambition "'which had occasioned their own revolt.' Encompassed with domestic conspiracy, military sedation, and civil war, they trembled on the edge of precipices, in which, after a longer or shorter term of anxiety, they were inevitably lost. These precarious monarchs received, however, such honours as the flattery of their respective armies and provinces could bestow. But their claim, founded on rebellion, could never obtain the sanction of law or history. Italy, Rome, and the Senate, constantly adhered to the cause of Gallienus, and he alone was considered as the sovereign of the empire. That prince condescended, indeed, to acknowledge the victorious arms of Edenathus, who deserved the honourable distinction by the respectful conduct which he always maintained towards the son of Valerian. With the general applause of the Romans, and the consent of Gallienus, the Senate conferred the title of Augustus on the brave Palmyrenian, and seemed to entrust him with the government of the East, which he already possessed in so independent a manner, that, like a private succession, he bequeathed it to his illustrious widow Zenobia. The rapid and perpetual transitions from the cottage to the throne, and from the throne to the grave, might have amused an indifferent philosopher, were it possible for a philosopher to remain indifferent, amidst the general calamities of humankind. The election of these precarious emperors, their power and their death, were equally destructive to their subjects and adherents. The price of their fatal elevation was instantly discharged to the troops by an immense donative, drawn from the bowels of the exhausted people. However virtuous was their character, however pure their intentions, they found themselves reduced to the hard necessity of supporting their absorption by frequent acts of rapine and cruelty. When they fell, they involved armies and provinces in their fall. There is still exact a most savage mandate from Gallienus to one of his ministers. After the suppression of Ingenus, who had assumed the purple in Illocrum, "'It is not enough,' says the soft but inhuman prince, that you exterminate such as have appeared in arms. The chance of battle might have served me as effectually. The male sex of every age must be extirpated, provided that, in the execution of the children and old men, you can contrive means to save our reputation. Let every one die who has dropped an expression, who has entertained a thought against me, against me, the son of Valerian, the father and brother of so many princes. Remember that in Genus was made emperor. Tear, kill, hew in pieces. I write to you with my own hand, and would inspire you with my own feelings. Whilst the public forces of the state were dissipated in private quarrels, the defenceless provinces lay exposed to every invader. The bravest usurpers were compelled by the perplexity of their situation to conclude ignominious treaties with the common enemy, to purchase with oppressive tributes the neutrality or services of the barbarians, and to introduce hostile and independent nations into the heart of the Roman monarchy. Such were the barbarians, and such the tyrants, who, under the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, dismembered the provinces, and reduced the empire to the lowest pitch of disgrace and ruin, from whence it seemed impossible that it should ever emerge. As far as the barrenness of materials would permit, we have attempted to trace, with order and perspicuity, the general events of that calamitous period. There still remain some particular facts. 1. The disorders of Sicily. 2. The tumults of Alexandria. And 3. The rebellion of the Isaurians which may serve to reflect a strong light on the horrid picture. 1. 
whenever numerous troops of banditti, multiplied by success and impunity, publicly defy, instead of eluding the justice of their country, we may safely infer that the excessive weakness of the government is felt and abused by the lowest ranks of the community. The situation of Sicily preserved it from the barbarians, nor could the disarmed province have supported a usurper. The sufferings of that once flourishing and still fertile island were inflicted by baser hands. A licentious crowd of slaves and peasants reigned for a while over the plundered country, and renewed the memory of the servile wars of more ancient times. Devastations, of which the husbandman was either the victim or the accomplice, must have ruined the agriculture of Sicily. And as the principal estates were the property of the opulent senators of Rome, who often enclosed within a farm the territory of an old republic, it is not improbable that this private injury might affect the capital more deeply than all the conquests of the Goths or the Persians. 2. The foundation of Alexandria was a noble design, at once conceived and executed by the son of Philip, the beautiful and regular form of that great city, second only to Rome itself, comprehended a circumference of fifteen miles. It was peopled by three hundred thousand free inhabitants, besides at least an equal number of slaves. The lucrative trade of Arabia and India flowed through the port of Alexandria, to the capital and provinces of the empire. Idleness was unknown, some were employed in blowing of glass, others in weaving of linen, others again manufacturing the papyrus. Either sex and every age was engaged in the pursuits of industry. Nor did even the blind or the lame want occupation suited to their condition. But the people of Alexandria, a various mixture of nations, united the vanity and inconsistency of the Greeks, with the superstition and obstinacy of the Egyptians. The most trifling occasion, a transient scarcity of flesh or lentils, the neglect of an accustomed salutation, a mistake of precedency in the public baths, or even a religious dispute, were at any time sufficient to kindle a sedation among the vast multitude, whose resentments were furious and implacable. After the capture of Valerian, and the insolence of his son had relaxed the authority of the laws, the Alexandrians abandoned themselves to the ungoverned rage of their passions, and their unhappy country was the theatre of a civil war, which continued, with a few short and suspicious truces, above twelve years. All intercourse was cut off between the several quarters of the afflicted city. Every street was polluted with blood, every building of strength converted into a citadel. Nor did the tumult subside, till a considerable part of Alexandria was irretrievably ruined. The spacious and magnificent district of Brucian, with its palaces and museum, the residence of the kings and philosophers of Egypt, is described above a century afterwards, as already reduced to its present state of dreary solitude. 3. The obscure rebellion of Trebellius, who assumed the purple in Isauria, a petty province of Asia Minor, was attended with strange and memorable consequences. The pageant of royalty was soon destroyed by an officer of Gallienus, but his followers, despairing of mercy, resolved to shake off their allegiance not only to the emperor, but to the empire and suddenly returned to the savage manners from which they had never perfectly been reclaimed. Their craggy rocks, a branch of the wide extended Taurus, protected their inaccessible retreat. The tillage of some fertile valleys supplied them with necessaries, and a habit of raping with the luxuries of life. In the heart of the Roman monarchy, the Assyrians long contained a nation of wild barbarians. Succeeding princes, unable to reduce them to obedience, either by arms or policy, were compelled to acknowledge their weakness, by surrounding the hostile and independent spot with a strong chain of fortifications, which often proved insufficient to restrain the incursions of these domestic foes. 
the Asurians, gradually extending their territory to the sea-coast, subdued the western and mountainous part of Cilicia, formerly the nest of those daring pirates, against whom the Republic had once been obliged to exert its utmost force, under the conduct of the great Pompey. Our habits of thinking so fondly connect the order of the universe with the fate of man, that this gloomy period of history has been decorated with inundations, earthquakes, uncommon meteors, preternatural darkness, and a crowd of prodigies, fictitious or exaggerated. But a long and general famine was a calamity of a more serious kind. It was the inevitable consequence of raping and oppression, which extirpated the produce of the peasant, and the hope of future harvests. Famine is almost always followed by epidemical disease, the effect of scanty and unwholesome food. Other causes must, however, have contributed to the furious plague, which, from the year 250 to the year 265, raged without interruption in every province, every city, and almost every family of the Roman Empire. During some time, five thousand persons died daily in Rome, and many towns that had escaped the hands of the barbarians were entirely depopulated. We have the knowledge of a very curious circumstance, of some use perhaps in the melancholy calculation of human calamities. An exact register was kept at Alexandria, of all the citizens entitled to receive the distribution of corn. It was found that the ancient number of those comprised between the ages of forty and seventy had been equal to the whole sum of claimants, from fourteen to fourscore years of age who remained alive after the reign of Gallienus. Applying this authentic fact to the most correct tables of mortality, it evidently proves that above half the people of Alexandria had perished, and could we venture to extend the analogy to the other provinces, we might suspect that war, pestilence, and famine had consumed in a few years the moiety of the human species. End of chapter 10, part 4。Chapter 11, part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11. Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths. Part 1. Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths, Victories, Triumph, and Death of Aurelian. Under the deplorable reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, the empire was oppressed and almost destroyed by the soldiers, the tyrants, and the barbarians. It was saved by a series of great princes who derived their obscure origin from the martial provinces of Illyricum. Within a period of about thirty years, Claudius, Aurelian, Probus, Diocletian, and his colleagues triumphed over the foreign and domestic enemies of the state, re-established with the military discipline the strength of the frontiers and deserved the glorious title of Restorers of the Roman World. The removal of an effeminate tyrant made way for a succession of heroes. The indignation of the people imputed all their calamities to Gallienus, and the far greater part were indeed the consequence of his dissolute manners and careless administration. He was even destitute of a sense of honour, which so frequently supplies the absence of public virtue. And as long as he was permitted to enjoy the possession of Italy, a victory of the barbarians, the loss of a province, or the rebellion of a general, seldom distributed the tranquil course of his pleasures. At length, a considerable army, stationed on the upper Danube, invested with the imperial purple their leader Aureolus, who, disdaining a confined and barren reign over the mountains of Raetia, passed the Alps, occupied Milan, threatened Rome, and challenged Gallienus to dispute in the field the sovereignty of Italy. 
the emperor provoked by the insult and alarmed by the instant danger suddenly exerted that latent vigour which sometimes broke through the indolence of his temper forcing himself from the luxury of the palace he appeared in arms at the head of his legions and advanced beyond the po to encounter his competitor the corrupted name of pontirolo still preserves the memory of a bridge over the adda which during the action must have proved an object of the utmost importance to both armies the Russian usurper after receiving a total defeat and a dangerous wound retired into milan the siege of that great city was immediately formed the walls were battered with every engine in use among the ancients and aureolus doubtful of his internal strength and hopeless of foreign succors already anticipated the fatal consequences of unsuccessful rebellion his last resource was an attempt to seduce the loyalty of the besiegers he scattered libels through the camp inviting the troops to desert an unworthy master who sacrificed the public happiness to his luxury and the lives of his most valuable subjects to the slightest suspicions the arts of aureolus diffused fears and discontent among the principal officers of his rival a conspiracy was formed by heraclianus the praetorian prefect by marcian a general of rank and reputation and by secrops who commanded a numerous body of the dalmatian guards the death of gallienus was resolved and notwithstanding their desire of first terminating the siege of milan the extreme danger which accompanied every moment's delay obliged them to hasten the execution of their daring purpose at a late hour of the night but while the emperor still protracted the pleasures of the table an alarm was suddenly given that aureolus at the head of all his forces had made a desperate sally from the town gallienus who was never deficient in personal bravery started from his silken couch and without allowing himself time either to put on his armor or to assemble his guards he mounted on horseback and rode full speed towards the supposed place of the attack encompassed by his declared or concealed enemies he soon amidst the nocturnal tumult received a mortal dart from an uncertain hand before he expired a patriotic sentiment using in the mind of gallienus induced him to name a deserving successor and it was his last request that the imperial ornaments should be delivered to claudius who then commanded a detached army in the neighbourhood of pavia the report at least was diligently propagated and the order cheerfully obeyed by the conspirators who had already agreed to place claudius on the throne on the first news of the emperor's death the troops expressed some suspicion and resentment till the one was removed and the other assuaged by a donator of twenty pieces of gold to each soldier they then ratified the election and acknowledged the merit of their new sovereign the obscurity which covered the origin of claudius though it was afterwards embellished by some flattering fictions sufficiently betrays the meanness of his birth we can only discover that he was a native of one of the provinces bordering on the danube that his youth was spent in arms and that his modest valour attracted the favour and confidence of decius the senate and people already considered him an excellent officer equal to the most important trusts and censured the inattention of valerian who suffered him to remain in the subordinate section of a tribune but it was not long before that emperor distinguished the merit of claudius by declaring him general and chief of the illyrian frontier with the command of all the troops in thrace maesia dacia pannonia and dalmatia the appointments of the prefect of egypt the establishments of the proconsul of africa and the sure prospect of the consulship by his victories over the goths he deserved from the senate the honour of a statue and excited the jealous apprehensions of gallienus it was impossible that a soldier could esteem so dissolute a sovereign nor is it easy to conceal a just contempt some unguarded expressions which dropped from claudius were officially transmitted to the royal ear the emperor's answer to an officer of confidence 
describes in very lively colours his own character and that of the times. There is not anything capable of giving me more serious concern than the intelligence content in your last dispatch, that some malicious suggestions have indisposed towards us the mind of our friend and parent Claudius. As you regard your allegiance, use every means to appease his resentment, but conduct your negotiation with secrecy. Let it not reach the knowledge of Dacian troops. They are already provoked, and it might inflame their fury. I myself have sent him some presents. Be it your care that he accept them with pleasure. Above all, let him not suspect that I am made acquainted with his imprudence. The fear of my anger might urge him to desperate counsels. The presence which accompanied this humble epistle, in which the monarch solicited a reconciliation with his discontented subject, consisted of a considerable sum of money, a splendid wardrobe, and a valuable service of silver and gold plate. By such arts, Gallienus softened the indignation and dispelled the fears of his Illyrian general and during the remainder of that reign the formidable sword of claudius was always drawn in the cause of a master whom he despised at last indeed he received from the conspirators the bloody purple of gallienus but he had been absent from their camp and councils and however he might applaud the deed we may candidly presume that he was innocent of the knowledge of it when claudius ascended the throne he was about fifty-four years of age the siege of Milan was still continued, and Aureolus soon discovered that the success of his artifices had only raised up a more determined adversary. He attempted to negotiate with Claudius a treaty of alliance and partition. Tell him, replied the intrepid emperor, that such proposals should have been made to Gallienus. He, perhaps, might have listened to them with patience and accepted a colleague as despicable as himself. This turned refusal and a last unsuccessful effort obliged Aureolus to lead the city and himself to the discretion of the conqueror. The judgment of the army pronounced him worthy of death, and Claudius, after a feeble resistance, consented to the execution of the sentence. Nor was the zeal of the senate less ardent in the cause of their new sovereign. They ratified, perhaps with a sincere transport of zeal, the election of Claudius, and, as his predecessor had shown himself the personal enemy of their order, they exercised, under the name of justice, a severe revenge against his friends and family. The senate was permitted to discharge the ungrateful office of punishment, and the emperor reserved for himself the pleasure and merit of obtaining by his intercession a general act of indemnity. Such ostentatious clemency discovers less of the real character of Claudius than a trifling circumstance in which he seems to have consulted only the dictates of his heart. The frequent rebellions of the provinces had involved almost every person in the guilt of treason, almost every estate in the case of confiscation, and Gallienus often displayed his liberality by distributing among his officers the property of his subjects. On the accession of Claudius, an old woman threw herself at his feet and complained that a general of the late emperor had obtained an arbitrary grant of her patrimony. This general was Claudius himself, who had not entirely escaped the contagion of the times. The emperor blushed at the reproach, but deserved the confidence which she had reposed in his equity. The confession of his fault was accompanied with immediate and ample restitution. In the arduous task which Claudius had undertaken of restoring the empire to its ancient splendor, it was first necessary to revive among his troops a sense of order and obedience. With the authority of a veteran commander, he represented to them that the relaxation of discipline had introduced a long train of disorders, the effect of which were at length experienced by the soldiers themselves. That a people ruined by oppression and indolent from despair could no longer supply a numerous army with the means of luxury or even subsistence, that the danger of each individual had increased with the despotism of the military order, since princes who tremble on the throne will guard their safety by the instant sacrifice of every obnoxious subject, 
the emperor expiated on the mischiefs of a lawless caprice which the soldiers could only gratify at the expense of their own blood as their seditious elections had so frequently been followed by civil wars which consumed the flower of the legions either in the field of battle or in the cruel abuse of victory he painted in the most lively colours the exhausted state of the treasury the desolation of the provinces the disgrace of the roman name and the insolent triumph of rapacious barbarians it was against those barbarians he declared that he intended to point the first effort of their arms tetricus might reign for a while over the west and even zenobia might preserve the dominion of the east these usurpers were his personal adversaries nor could he think of indulging any private resentment till he had saved an empire whose impending ruin would unless it was timely prevented crush both the army and the people the various nations of germany and sarmatia who fought under the gothic standard had already collected an armament more formidable than any which had yet issued from the euxine on the banks of the Niester, one of the great rivers that discharged themselves into that sea they constructed a fleet of two thousand or even six thousand vessels numbers which however incredible they may seem would have been insufficient to transport their pretended army of three hundred and twenty thousand barbarians whatever might be the real strength of the goths the vigour and success of the expedition were not adequate to the greatness of the preparations in their passage through the bosphorus the unskilful pilots were overpowered by the violence of the current and while the multitude of their ships were crowded in a narrow channel many were dashed against each other or against the shore the barbarians made several descents on the coasts both of europe and asia but the open country was already plundered and they were repulsed with shame and loss from the fortified cities which they assaulted a spirit of discouragement and division arose in the fleet and some of their chiefs sailed away towards the islands of crete and cyprus but the main body pursuing a more steady course anchored at length near the foot of mount athos and assaulted the city of thessalonica the wealthy capital of all the macedonian provinces their attacks in which they displayed a fierce but artless bravery were soon interrupted by the rapid approach of claudius hastening to a scene of action that deserved the presence of a warlike prince at the head of the remaining powers of the empire impatient for battle the goths immediately broke up their camp relinquished the siege of thessalonica left their navy at the foot of mount athos traversed to the hills of macedonia and pressed forward to engage the last defence of italy we still possess an original letter addressed by claudius to the senate and people on this memorable occasion conscript fathers says the emperor know that three hundred and twenty thousand goths have invaded the roman territory if i vanquish them your gratitude will reward my services should i fall remember that i am the successor of gallienus the whole republic is fatigued and exhausted we shall fight after valerian after ingenuus regilianus lollianus posthumus celsus and a thousand others whom a just contempt for gallienus provoked into rebellion we are in the want of darts of spears and of shields the strength of the empire gaul and spain are usurped by tetricus and we blush to acknowledge that the archers of the east serve under the banners of zenobia whatever we shall perform will be sufficiently great the melancholy firmness of this epistle announces a hero careless to his fate conscious of his danger and still deriving a well-grounded hope from the resources of his own mind the events surpassed his own expectations and those of the world by the most signal victories he delivered the empire from this host of barbarians and was distinguished by posterity under the glorious appellation of the gothic claudius the imperfect historians of an irregular war do not enable us to describe the order and circumstances of his exploits but if we could be indulged in the allusion we might distribute into three acts this memorable tragedy one the decisive battle was fought near nisus 
a city of Dardania. The legions at first gave away, oppressed by numbers and dismayed by misfortunes. Their ruin was inevitable, had not the abilities of their emperor prepared a seasonable relief. A large detachment, rising out of the secret and difficult passes of the mountains, which, by his order, they had occupied, suddenly assailed the rear of the victorious Goths. The favorable instant was improved by the activity of Claudius. He revived the courage of his troops, restored their ranks, and pressed the barbarians on every side. Fifty thousand men are reported to have been slain in the Battle of Nisus. Several large bodies of barbarians, covering their retreat with the movable fortifications of wagons, retired, or rather escaped, from the field of slaughter. 2. We may presume that some insurmountable difficulty, the fatigue perhaps, or the disobedience of the conquerors, prevented Claudius from completing in one day the destruction of the Goths. The war was diffused over the province of Maesia, Thrace, and Macedonia, and its operations drawn out into a variety of marches, surprises, and tumultuary engagements, as well by sea as by land. When the Romans suffered any loss, it was commonly occasioned by their own cowardice or rashness. But the superior talents of the emperor, his perfect knowledge of the country, and his judicious choice of measures as well as officers assured on most occasions the success of his arms. The immense booty, the fruit of so many victories, consisted for the greater part of cattle and slaves. A select body of the Gothic youth was received among the imperial troops. The remainder was sold into servitude, and so considerable was the number of female captives that every soldier obtained to his share two or three women a circumstance from which we may conclude that the invaders entertained some designs of settlement as well as of plunder since even in a naval expedition they were accompanied by their families three the loss of their fleet which was either taken or sunk had intercepted the retreat of the goths a vast circle of roman posts distributed with skill supported with firmness and gradually closing towards a common centre forced the barbarians into the most inaccessible parts of Mount Hemus, where they found a safe refuge, but a very scanty subsistence. During the course of a rigorous winter in which they were besieged by the emperor's troops, famine and pestilence, desertion and the sword continually diminished the imprisoned multitude. On the return of spring, nothing appeared in arms except a hardy and desperate band the remnant of that mighty host which had embarked at the mouth of the Nister. The pestilence which swept away such numbers of the barbarians at length proved fatal to their conqueror. After a short but glorious reign of two years, Claudius expired at Sirmium, amidst the tears and acclamations of his subjects. In his last illness, he convened the principal officers of the state and army, and in their presence recommended Aurelian, one of his generals, as the most deserving of the throne, and the best qualified to execute the great design which he himself had been permitted only to undertake. The virtues of Claudius, his valour, affability, justice, and temperance, his love of fame and of his country, place him in that short list of emperors who added lustre to the Roman purple. Those virtues, however, were celebrated with peculiar zeal and complacency by the courtly writers of the age of Constantine, who was the great-grandson of Crispus, the elder brother of Claudius. The voice of flattery was soon taught to repeat that gods, who so hastily had snatched Claudius from the earth, rewarded his merit and piety by the perpetual establishment of the empire in his family. Notwithstanding these oracles, the greatness of the Flavian family, a name which it had pleased them to assume, was deferred above twenty years, and the elevation of Claudius occasioned the immediate ruin of his brother, Quintilius, who possessed not sufficient moderation or courage to descend into the private station to which the patriotism of the late emperor had condemned him. Without delay or reflection, he assumed the purple at Aquilia, where he commanded a considerable force. 
and though his reign lasted only seventeen days, he had time to obtain the sanction of the Senate and to experience a mutiny of the troops. As soon as he was informed that the great army of the Danube had invested the well-known valour of Aurelian with imperial power, he sunk under the fame and merit of his rival, and ordering his veins to be opened, prudently withdrew himself from the unequal contest. The general design of this work will not permit us minutely to relate the actions of every emperor after he ascended the throne, much less to deduce the various fortunes of his private life. We shall only observe that the father of Aurelian was a peasant of the territory of Sirmium, who occupied a small farm, the property of Aurelius, a rich senator. His warlike son, enlisted in the troops as a common soldier, successively rose to the rank of a centurion, a tribune, the prefect of a legion, the inspector of the camp, the general, or, as it was then called, the duke of a frontier and at length during the gothic war exercised the important office of commander-in-chief of the cavalry in every station he distinguished himself by matchless vigour rigid discipline and successful conduct he was invested with a consulship by the emperor valerian who styles him in the pompous language of that age the deliverer of illyricum the restorer of gaul and the rival of the scipios at the recommendation of Valerian, a senator of the highest rank and merit, Alpius Crinitus, whose blood was derived from the same source as that of Trajan, adopted the Pannonian peasant, gave him his daughter in marriage, and relieved with his ample fortune the honourable poverty which Aurelian had preserved inviolate. The reign of Aurelian lasted only four years and about nine months, but every instant of that short period was filled by some memorable achievement. He put an end to the Gothic War, chastised the Germans who invaded Italy, recovered Gaul, Spain, and Britain out of the hands of Tetricus, and destroyed the proud monarchy which Zenobia had erected in the east on the ruins of the afflicted empire. It was the rigid attention of Aurelian, even to the minutest articles of discipline, which bestowed such uninterrupted success on his arms. His military regulations are contained in a very concise epistle to one of his inferior officers who is commanded to enforce them as he wishes to become a tribune or he is desirous to live. Gaming, drinking and the arts of divination were severely prohibited. Aurelian expected that his soldiers should be modest, frugal and laborious, that their armor should be constantly kept bright, their weapons sharp their clothing and horses ready for immediate service, that they should live in their quarters with chastity and sobriety, without damaging the cornfields, without stealing even a sheep, a fowl, or a bunch of grapes, without exacting from their landlords either salt or oil or wood. The public allowance, continues the emperor, is sufficient for their support. Their wealth should be collected from the spoils of the enemy, not from the tears of the provincials. A single instance will serve to display the rigour and even cruelty of Aurelian. One of the soldiers had seduced the wife of his host. The guilty wretch was fastened to two trees forcibly drawn towards each other, and his limbs were torn asunder by their sudden separation. A few such examples impressed a salutary consternation. The punishments of Aurelian were terrible, but he had seldom occasion to punish more than once the same offence. His own conduct gave a sanction to his loss, and the seditious legions dreaded a chief who had learned to obey and who was worthy to command. End of chapter 11, part 1 Recording by Kritika Chapter 11, Part 2 of The Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 11, Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths, Part 2. The death of Claudius had revived the fainting spirit of the Goths. The troops which guarded the passes of Mount Hamus and the banks of the Danube 
had been drawn away by the apprehension of a civil war, and it seems probable that the remaining body of the Gothic and Vandalic tribes embraced the favorable opportunity, abandoned their settlements of the Ukraine, traversed the rivers, and swelled with the new multitudes the destroying hosts of their countrymen. The united numbers were at length encountered by Aurelian, and the bloody and doubtful conflict ended only with the approach of night. Exhausted by so many calamities, which they had mutually endured and inflicted during a twenty years' war, the Goths and the Romans consented to a lasting and beneficial treaty. It was earnestly solicited by the barbarians, and cheerfully ratified by the legions, to whose suffrage the prudence of Aurelian referred the decision of that important question. The Gothic nation, engaged to supply the armies of Rome with a body of two thousand auxiliaries, consisting entirely of cavalry, and stipulated in return an undisturbed retreat, with a regular market as far as the Danube, provided by the emperor's care, but at their own expense. The treaty was observed with such religious fidelity, that when a party of five hundred men straggled from the camp in quest of plunder, the king or general of the barbarians commanded that the guilty leader should be apprehended, and shot to death with darts, as a victim devoted to the sanctity of their engagements. It is, however, not unlikely that the precaution of Aurelian, who had exacted as hostages the sons and daughters of the Gothic chiefs, contributed something to this pacific temper. The youths he trained in the exercise of arms, and near to his own person, to the damsels he gave a liberal and Roman education, and by bestowing them in marriage on some of his principal officers, gradually introduced between the two nations the closest and most endearing connections. But the most important condition of peace was understood rather than expressed in the treaty. Aurelian withdrew the Roman forces from Dacia, and tacitly relinquished that great province to the Goths and Vandals. His manly judgment convinced him of the solid advantages, and taught him to despise the seeming disgrace of thus contracting the frontiers of the monarchy, the Dacian subjects, removed from those distant possessions which they were unable to cultivate or defend, added strength and populousness to the southern side of the Danube, a fertile territory, which the repetition of a barbarous inroads had changed into a desert, was yielded to their industry, and the new province of Dacia still preserved the memory of Trajan's conquests. The old country of that name detained, however, a considerable number of its inhabitants, who dreaded exile more than a Gothic master. These degenerate Romans continued to serve the empire, whose allegiance they had renounced, by introducing amongst their conquerors the first notions of agriculture, the useful arts, and the conveniences of civilized life. An intercourse of commerce and language was gradually established within the opposite banks of the Danube, and after Dacia became an independent state, it often proved the firmest barrier of the empire against the invasions of the savages of the north. A sense of interest attached these more settled barbarians to the alliance of Rome, and a permanent interest very frequently ripens into sincere and useful friendship. This various colony, which filled the ancient province, and was insensibly blended into one great people, still acknowledged the superior renown and authority of the Gothic tribe and claimed the fancied honour of a Scandinavian origin. At the same time, the lucky though accidental resemblance of the name of Gete infused among the credulous Goths a vain persuasion that in a remote age their own ancestors, already seated in the Dacian provinces, had received instructions of Samolxis, and checked the victorious arms of Sesostris and Darius. While the vigorous and moderate conduct of Aurelian restored the Illyrian frontier, the nation of the Alemanni violated the conditions of peace, which either Gallenius had purchased, or Claudius had imposed, and, inflamed by their impatient youth, suddenly flew to arms. Forty thousand horse appeared in the field, and the numbers of the infantry doubled those of the cavalry. The first objects of their avarice were a few cities on the Raetian frontier, but their hopes soon rising with success, the rapid march of the Alemanni traced the line of devastation from the Danube to the Po. The emperor was almost at the same time informed of the eruption, and of the retreat of the barbarians. Collecting an active body of troops, he marched with silence and celerity along the skirts of the Hercurian forest, and the Alemanni, laden with the spoils of Italy, arrived at the Danube, without suspecting that on the opposite bank, 
and in an adventurous post a Roman army lay concealed and prepared to intercept their return. Aurelian indulged the fatal security of the barbarians, and permitted about half their forces to pass the river without disturbance and without precaution. Their situation and astonishment gave him an easy victory. His skilful conduct improved the advantage. Disposing the legions in a semicircular form, he advanced the two horns of the crescent across the Danube, and wheeling them on a sudden towards the centre, enclosed the rear of the German host. The dismayed barbarians, on whatsoever side they cast their eyes, beheld, with despair, a wasted country, a deep and rapid stream, a victorious and implacable enemy. Reduced to this distressed condition, the Alemanni no longer disdained to sue for peace. Aurelian received their ambassadors at the head of his camp, and with every circumstance of martial pomp that could display the greatness and discipline of Rome, the legions stood by their arms in well-ordered ranks and awful silence. The principal commanders, distinguished by the ensigns of their rank, appeared on horseback on either side of the imperial throne. Behind the throne, the consecrated images of the emperor, and his predecessors, the golden eagles, and the various titles of the legions, engraved in letters of gold, were exalted in the air on lofty pikes covered with silver. When Aurelian assumed his seat, his manly grace and majestic figure taught the barbarians to revere the person as well as the purple of their conqueror. The ambassadors fell prostrate on the ground in silence. They were commanded to rise and permitted to speak. By the assistance of interpreters, they extenuated their perfidy, magnified their exploits, expatiated on the vicissitudes of fortune and the advantages of peace, and, with an ill-timed confidence, demanded a large subsidy as the price of the allegiance which they offered to the Romans. The answer of the emperor was stern and imperious. He treated their offer with contempt, and their demand with indignation, reproached the barbarians, that they were as ignorant of the arts of war as of the laws of peace, and finally dismissed them with the choice only of submitting to his unconditional mercy, or awaiting the utmost severity of his resentment. Aurelian had resigned a distant province to the Goths, but it was dangerous to trust or to pardon these perfidious barbarians, whose formidable power kept Italy herself perpetual alarms. Immediately after this conference, it should seem that some unexpected emergency required the emperor's presence in Pannonia. He devolved on his lieutenants the care of finishing the destruction of the Alemanni, either by the sword or by the surer operations of famine but an active despair has often triumphed over the indolent assurance of success. The barbarians, finding it impossible to traverse the Danube and the Roman camp, broke through the posts in their rears, which were more feebly or less carefully guarded, and with incredible diligence, but by a different road, returned towards the mountains of Italy. Aurelian, who considered the war as totally extinguished, received the mortifying intelligence of the escape of the Alemanni, and of the ravage which they already committed in the territory of Milan. The legions were commanded to follow, with as much expedition as those heavy bodies were capable of exerting, the rapid flight of an enemy, whose infantry and cavalry moved with almost equal swiftness. A few days afterwards, the emperor himself marched to the relief of Italy, at the head of a chosen body of auxiliaries, among whom were the hostages and the cavalry of the Vandals, and of all the Praetorian guards who had served in the wars on the Danube. As the light troops of the Alemanni had spread themselves from the Alps to the Apennine, the incessant vigilance of Aurelian and his officers was exercised in the discovery, the attack, and the pursuit of the numerous detachments. Notwithstanding this desultory war, three considerable battles are mentioned, in which the principal force of both armies was obstinately engaged. The success was various. In the first, fought near Placentia, the Romans received so severe a blow that, according to the expression of a writer extremely partial to Aurelian, the immediate dissolution of the empire was apprehended. The crafty barbarians, who had lined the woods, suddenly attacked the legions in the dusk of the evening, and it is most probable, after the fatigue and disorder of a long march, the fury of their charge was irresistible. But, at length, after a dreadful slaughter, the patient firmness of the emperor rallied his troops, and restored in some degree the honour of his arms. The second battle was fought near Fano in Umbria, on the spot which, five hundred years before, had been fatal to the brother of Hannibal. Thus far the successful Germans had advanced along the Emilian and Flaminian way, with the design of sacking the defenceless mistress of the world. But Aurelian, who, watchful for the safety of Rome, still hung on their rear, 
found in this place the decisive moment of giving them a total and irretrievable defeat. The flying remnant of their host was exterminated in a third and last battle near Pavia, and Italy was delivered from the inroads of the Alemanni. Fear has been the original parent of superstition, and every new calamity urges trembling mortals to deprecate the wrath of their invisible enemies. Though the best hope of the Republic was in the valour and conduct of Aurelian, yet such was the public consternation when the barbarians were hourly expected at the gates of Rome, that by a decree of the Senate the Sibylline books were consulted. Even the Emperor himself, from a motive either of religion or policy, recommended this salutary measure, chided the tardiness of the Senate, and offered to supply whatever expense, whatever animals, whatever captives of any nation the gods should require. Notwithstanding this liberal offer, it does not appear that any human victims expiated with their bloods the sins of the Roman people. The Sibyl in books and joint ceremonies of a more harmless nature, processions of priests in white robes, attended by a chorus of youths and virgins, lustrations of the city and adjacent country, and sacrifices whose powerful influence disabled the barbarians from passing the mystic ground on which they had been celebrated. However puerile in themselves, these superstitious acts were subservient to the success of the war, and if, in the decisive battle of Fano, the Alemanni fancied they saw an army of spectres combating on the side of Aurelian, he received a real and effectual aid from this imaginary reinforcement. But whatever confidence might be placed in ideal ramparts, the experience of the past and the dread of the future induced the Romans to construct fortifications of a grosser and more substantial kind. The seven hills of Rome had been surrounded by the successors of Romulus, with an ancient wall of more than thirteen miles. The vast enclosure may seem disproportioned to the strength and numbers of the infant state, but it was necessary to secure an ample extent of pasture and arable land against the frequented sun incursions of the tribes of Latium, the perpetual enemies of the Republic. With the progress of Roman greatness, the city and its inhabitants gradually increased, filled up the vacant space, pierced through the useless walls, covered the fields of Mars, and, on every side, followed the public highways in long and beautiful suburbs. The extents of the new walls, erected by Aurelian, and finished in the reign of Probus, was magnified by popular estimation to near fifty, but is reduced by accurate measurements to about twenty-one miles. It was a great, but a melancholy labor, since the defense of the capital betrayed the decline of the monarchy. The Romans of a more prosperous age, who trusted to the arms of the legions the safety of the frontier camps, were very far from entertaining a suspicion that it would ever become necessary to fortify the seat of empire against the inroads of the barbarians. The victory of Claudius over the Goths, and the success of Aurelian against the Alemanni, had already restored to the arms of Rome their ancient superiority over the barbarous nations of the north. To chastise domestic tyrants, and to reunite the dismembered parts of the empire, was a task reserved for the second of those warlike emperors. Though he was acknowledged by the senate and people, the frontiers of Italy, Africa, Illyricum, and Thrace confined the limits of his reign. Gaul, Spain, and Britain, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor, were still possessed by two rebels, who alone, out of so numerous a list, had hitherto escaped the dangers of their situation, and to complete the ignominy of Rome, these rival thrones had been usurped by women. A rapid succession of monarchs had arisen and fallen in the provinces of Gaul. The rigid virtues of Posthumus served only to hasten his destruction. After suppressing a competitor, who had assumed the purple at Mintz, he refused to gratify his troops with the plunder of the rebellious city, and in the seventh year of his reign became the victim of their disappointed avarice. The death of Victorinus, his friend and associate, was occasioned by a less worthy cause. The shining accomplishments of that prince were stained by a licentious passion, which he indulged in acts of violence, with too little regard to the laws of society or even those of love. He was slain at Cologne by a conspiracy of jealous husbands, whose revenge would have appeared more justifiable had they spared the innocence of his son. After the murder of so many valiant princes, it is somewhat remarkable that a female for a long time controlled the fierce legions of Gaul, and still more singular that she was the mother of the unfortunate Victorinus. The arts and treasures of Victoria enabled her successively to place Marius and Tetricus on the throne, 
and to reign with a manly vigor under the name of those dependent emperors. Money of copper, of silver, and of gold was coined in her name. She assumed the titles of Augusta and mother of the camps. Her power ended only with her life, but her life was perhaps shortened by the ingratitude of Tetricus. When, at the instigation of his ambitious patroness, Tetricus assumed the ensigns of royalty, he was governor of the peaceful province of Aquitania, an employment suited to his character and education. He reigned four or five years over Gaul, Spain, and Britain, the slave and sovereign of a licentious army, whom he dreaded, and by whom he was despised. The valour and fortune of Aurelian at length opened the prospect of a deliverance. He ventured to disclose his melancholy situation, and conjured the emperor to hasten to the relief of his unhappy rival. Had this secret correspondence reached the ears of the soldiers, it would most probably have cost Tetricus his life, nor could he resign the sceptre of the West without committing an act of treason against himself. He affected the appearances of a civil war, led his forces into the field against Aurelian, posted them in the most disadvantageous manner, betrayed his own counsels to his enemy, and with a few chosen friends deserted in the beginning of the action. The rebel legions, though disordered and dismayed by the unexpected treachery of their chief, defended themselves with desperate valour, till they were cut in pieces almost to a man, in this bloody and memorable battle, which was fought near Chalon in Champagne. The retreat of the irregular auxiliaries, Franks and Batavians, whom the conqueror soon compelled or persuaded to repass the Rhine, restored the general tranquillity, and the power of Aurelian was acknowledged on the wall of Antoninus to the columns of Hercules. As early as the reign of Claudius, the city of Autun, alone and unassisted, had ventured to declare against the legions of Gaul. After a siege of seven months, they stormed and plundered that unfortunate city, already wasted by famine. Lyon, on the contrary, had resisted with obstinate disaffection the arms of Aurelian. We read of the punishment of Lyon, but there is not any mention of the rewards of Autun. Such, indeed, is the policy of civil war, severely to remember injuries and to forget the most important services. Revenge is profitable, gratitude is expensive. Aurelian had no sooner secured the person and provinces of Tetricus than he turned his arms against Zenobia, the celebrated queen of Palmyra and the East. Modern Europe has produced several illustrious women who have sustained with glory the weight of empire, nor is our own age destitute of such distinguished characters. But if we accept the doubtful achievements of Semiramis, Zenobia is perhaps the only female whose superior genius broke through the servile indolence imposed on her sex by the climate and manner of Asia. She claimed her descent from the Macedonian kings of Egypt, equalled in beauty her ancestor Cleopatra, and far surpassed that princess in chastity and valour. Zenobia was esteemed the most lovely as well as the most heroic of her sex. She was of dark complexion, for in speaking of a lady these trifles become important, her teeth were of pearly whiteness, and her large black eyes sparkled with uncommon fire, tempered by the most attractive sweetness. Her voice was strong and harmonious. Her manly understanding was strengthened and adorned by study. She was not ignorant of the Latin tongue, but possessed in equal perfection the Greek, the Syriac, and the Egyptian languages. She had drawn up for her use an epitome of Oriental history, and familiarly compared the beauties of Homer and Plato under the tuition of the sublime Longinus. This accomplished woman gave her hand to Odenatus, who, from a private station, raised himself to the dominion of the East. She soon became the friend and companion of a hero. In the intervals of war, Odenatus passionately delighted in the exercise of hunting. He pursued with ardor the wild beasts of the desert, lions, panthers, and bears, and the ardor of Zenobia in that dangerous amusement was not inferior to his own. She had inured her constitution to fatigue, disdained the use of a covered carriage, generally appeared on horseback in military habit, and sometimes marched several miles on foot at the head of the troops. The success of Odenatus was in great measure ascribed to her incomparable prudence and fortitude. Their splendid victories over the great king, whom they twice pursued as far as the gates of Tesipon, laid the foundations of their united fame and power, the armies which they commanded, and the provinces which they had saved, acknowledged not any other sovereigns than their invincible chiefs. The Senate and people of Rome revered a stranger who had avenged their captive emperor, 
and even the insensible son of Valerian accepted Odenatus for his legitimate colleague. End of chapter 11, part 2 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland Chapter 11, part 3 of the Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 11. Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths. Part 3. After a successful expedition against the Gothic plunderers of Asia, the Palmyrenian prince returned to the city of Emesa in Syria. Invincible in war, he was there cut off by domestic treason. His favorite amusement of hunting was the cause, or at least the occasion, of his death. His nephew, Maenius, presumed to dart his javelin before that of his uncle, and though admonished of his error, repeated the same insolence. As a monarch, and as a sportsman, Odinatus was provoked, took away his horse, a mark of ignominy among the barbarians, and chastised the rash youth by a short confinement. The event was soon forgot, but the punishment was remembered, and Maenius, with a few daring associates, assassinated his uncle in the midst of a great entertainment. Herod, the son of Odinatus, though not of Zenobia, a young man of a soft and effeminate temper, was killed with his father. But Maenius obtained only the pleasure of revenge by this bloody deed. He had scarcely time to assume the title of Augustus, before he was sacrificed by Zenobia to the memory of her husband. With the assistance of his most faithful friends, she immediately filled the vacant throne, and governed with manly counsels Palmyra, Syria, and the East, above five years. By the death of Odenatus, that authority was at an end which the Senate had granted him only as a personal distinction, but his martial widow, disdaining both the Senate and Gallienus, obliged one of the Roman generals who was sent against her to retreat into Europe with the loss of his army and his reputation. Instead of the little passions which so frequently perplex a female reign, the steady administration of Zenobia was guided by the most judicious maxims of policy. If it was expedient to pardon, she would calm her resentment. If it was necessary to punish, she could impose silence on the voice of pity. Her strict economy was accused of avarice, yet on every proper occasion she appeared magnificent and liberal. The neighboring states of Arabia, Armenia, and Persia dreaded her enmity, and solicited her alliance. To the dominions of Odinatus, which extended from the Euphrates to the frontiers of Bithynia, his widow added the inheritance of her ancestors, the populous and fertile kingdom of Egypt. The emperor Claudius acknowledged her merit, and was content that, while he pursued the Gothic war, she should assert the dignity of the empire in the east. The conduct, however, of Zenobia was attended with some ambiguity, not is it unlikely that she had conceived the design of erecting an independent and hostile monarchy. She blended with the popular manners of Roman princes the stately pomp of the courts of Asia, and exacted from her subjects the same adoration that was paid to the successor of Cyrus. She bestowed on her three sons a Latin education, and often showed them to the troops adorned with the imperial purple. For herself she reserved the diadem, with the splendid but doubtful title of Queen of the East. When Aurelian passed over into Asia, against an adversary whose sex alone could render her an object of contempt, his presence restored obedience to the province of Bithynia, already shaken by the arms and intrigues of Zenobia. Advancing at the head of his legions, he accepted the submission of Ancyra, and was admitted into Tiana, after an obstinate siege, by the help of a perfidious citizen. The generous though fierce temper of Aurelian abandoned the traitor to the rage of the soldiers. A superstitious reverence induced him to treat with lenity the countrymen of Apollonius the philosopher. Antioch was deserted on his approach, till the emperor, by his salutary edicts, recalled the fugitives, and granted a general pardon to all, who, from necessity rather than choice, had been engaged in the service of the Palmyrenian queen. The unexpected mildness of such a conduct reconciled the minds of the Syrians, and as far as the gates of Emesa, the wishes of the people seconded the terror of his arms. Zenobia would have ill-deserved her reputation had she indolently permitted the emperor of the west to approach within a hundred miles of her capital. 
the fate of the East was decided in two great battles, so similar in almost every circumstance that we can scarcely distinguish them from each other, except by observing that the first was fought near Antioch, and the second near Emesa. In both, the Queen of Palmyra animated the armies by her presence, and devolved the execution of her orders on Tzabdes, who had already signalized his military talents by the conquest of Egypt. The numerous forces of Zenobia consisted for the most part of light archers and of heavy cavalry clothed in complete steel. The Moorish and Illyrian horse of Aurelian were unable to sustain the ponderous charge of their antagonists. They fled in real or affected disorder, engaged the Palmyrenians in a laborious pursuit, harassed them by a desultory combat, and at length discomfited this impenetrable but unwieldy body of cavalry. The light infantry in the meantime, when they had exhausted their quivers, remaining without protection against the closer onset, exposed their naked sides to the swords of the legions. Aurelian had chosen these veteran troops, who were usually stationed on the upper Danube, and whose valour had been severely tried in the Alemannic war. After the defeat of Emesa, Zenobia found it impossible to collect a third army. As far as the frontier of Egypt, the nation subject to her empire had joined the standard of the conqueror who detached Probus, the bravest of his generals, to possess himself of the Egyptian provinces. Palmyra was the last resource of the widow of Odenatus. She retired within the walls of her capital, made every preparation for a vigorous resistance, and declared, with the intrepidity of a heroine, that the last moment of her reign and of her life should be the same. Amid the barren deserts of Arabia, a few cultivated spots rise like islands out of the sandy ocean, even the name of Tadmor, or Palmyra, by its signification in the Syriac as well as in the Latin language, denoted the multitude of palm trees which afforded shade and verdure to that temperate region. The air was pure, and the soil, watered by some invaluable springs, was capable of producing fruits as well as corn. A place possessed of such singular advantages, and situated at a convenient distance between the Gulf of Persia and the Mediterranean, was soon frequented by the caravans which conveyed to the nations of Europe a considerable part of the rich commodities of India. Palmyra insensibly increased into an opulent and independent city, and connecting the Roman and the Parthian monarchies by the mutual benefits of commerce, was suffered to observe a humble neutrality, till at length, after the victories of Trajan, the little republic sunk into the bosom of Rome and flourished more than one hundred and fifty years in the subordinate, though honourable, rank of a colony. It was during that peaceful period, if we may judge from a few remaining inscriptions, that the wealthy Palmyrenians constructed those temples, palaces, and porticos of Grecian architecture, whose ruins, scattered over an extent of several miles, have deserved the curiosity of our travellers. The elevation of Odinatus and Zenobia appeared to reflect new splendor on their country, and Palmyra for a while stood forth the rival of Rome, but the competition was fatal, and ages of prosperity were sacrificed to a moment of glory. In his march over the sandy deserts between Emesa and Palmyra, the emperor Aurelian was perpetually harassed by the Arabs, nor could he always defend his army, and especially his baggage, from those flying troops of active and daring robbers who watched the moment of a surprise, and eluded the slow pursuit of the legions. The siege of Palmyra was an object far more difficult and important, and the emperor, who with incessant vigor pressed the attacks in person, was himself wounded with a dart. The Roman people, says Aurelian in an original letter, speak with contempt of the war which I am waging against the woman. They are ignorant both of the character and of the power of Zenobia. It is impossible to enumerate her warlike preparations, of stones, of arrows, and of every species of missile weapons. Every part of the walls is provided with two or three ballists, and artificial fires are thrown from her military engines. The fear of punishment has armed her with desperate courage. Yet still I trust in the protecting deities of Rome, who have hitherto been favorable to all my undertakings. Doubtful, however, of the protection of the gods, and of the event of the siege, Aurelian judged it more prudent to offer terms of an advantageous capitulation to the queen, a splendid retreat, to the citizens, their ancient privileges. His proposals were obstinately rejected, and the refusal was accompanied with insult. The firmness of Zenobia was supported by the hope that in a very short time famine would compel the Roman army to repass the desert, and by the reasonable expectation that the kings of the east, and particularly the Persian monarch, would arm in the defence of their most natural ally. But fortune and the perseverance of Aurelian overcame every obstacle. 
The death of Sapor, which happened about this time, distracted the councils of Persia, and the inconsiderable succours that attempted to relieve Palmyra were easily intercepted either by the arms or by the illiberality of the emperor. From every part of Syria, a regular succession of convoys safely arrived in the camp, which was increased by the return of Probus with his victorious troops from the conquest of Egypt. It was then that Zenobia resolved to fly. She mounted the fleetest of her dromedaries, and had already reached the banks of the Euphrates, about sixty miles from Palmyra, when she was overtaken by the pursuit of Aurelian's light horse, seized, and brought back a captive to the feet of the emperor. Her capital soon afterwards surrendered, and was treated with unexpected lenity. The arms, horses, and camels, with an immense treasure of gold, silver, silk, and precious stones, were all delivered to the conqueror, who, leaving only a garrison of six hundred archers, returned to Emesa, and employed some time in the distribution of rewards and punishments at the end of so memorable a war, which restored to the obedience of Rome those provinces that had renounced their allegiance since the captivity of Valerian. When the Syrian queen was brought into the presence of Aurelian, he sternly asked her, how she had presumed to rise in arms against the emperors of Rome. The answer of Zenobia was a prudent mixture of respect and firmness. Because I disdained to consider as Roman emperors an Aureolus or a Gallienus, you alone I acknowledge as my conqueror and my sovereign. But as female fortitude is commonly artificial, so it is seldom steady or consistent. The courage of Zenobia deserted her in the hour of trial. She trembled at the angry clamours of the soldiers, who called aloud for her immediate execution, forgot the generous despair of Cleopatra, which she had proposed as her model, ignominiously purchased life by the sacrifice of her fame and her friends. It was to their counsels, which governed the weakness of her sex, that she imputed the guilt of her obstinate resistance. It was on their heads that she directed the vengeance of the cruel Aurelian, the fame of Longinus, who was included among the numerous and perhaps innocent victims of her fear, will survive that of the queen who betrayed, or the tyrant who condemned him. Genius and learning were incapable of moving a fierce unlettered soldier, but they had served to elevate and harmonize the soul of Longinus. Without uttering a complaint, he calmly followed the executioner, pitying his unhappy mistress, and bestowing comforts on his afflicted friends. Returning from the conquest of the East, Aurelian had already crossed the straits which divided Europe from Asia, when he was provoked by the intelligence that the Palmyrenians had massacred the governor and garrison which he had left among them, and they again re erected the standard of revolt. Without a moment's deliberation, he once more turned his face towards Syria. Antioch was alarmed by his rapid approach, and the helpless city of Palmyra felt the irresistible weight of his resentment. We have a letter of Aurelian himself, in which he acknowledges that old men, women, children, and peasants had been involved in that dreadful execution which should have been confined to armed rebellion. And although his principal concern seems directed to the re-establishment of a temple of the sun, he discovers some pity for the remnants of the Palmyrenians, to whom he grants the permission of rebuilding and inhabiting their city. But it is easier to destroy than to restore. The seat of commerce, of arts, and of Zenobia, gradually sunk into an obscure town, a trifling fortress, and at length a miserable village. The present citizens of Palmyra, consisting of thirty or forty families, have erected their mud cottages within the spacious court of a magnificent temple. Another and a last labor still awaited the indefatigable Aurelian, to suppress a dangerous though obscure rebel, who during the revolt of Palmyra had arisen on the banks of the Nile. Firmus, the friend and ally, as he proudly styled himself, of Odenatus and Zenobia, was no more than a wealthy merchant of Egypt. In the course of his trade to India, he had formed very intimate connections with the Saracens and the Blemmias, whose situation on either coast of the Red Sea gave them an easy introduction into the Upper Egypt. The Egyptians he inflamed with the hope of freedom, and, at the head of the furious multitude, broke into the city of Alexandria, where he assumed the imperial purple, coined money, published edicts, and raised an army which, as he vainly boasted, he was capable of maintaining from the sole profits of his paper trade. Such troops were a feeble defence against the approach of Aurelian, and it seems almost unnecessary to relate that Firmus was routed, taken, tortured, and put to death. Aurelian might now congratulate the Senate, the people, and himself, and in little more than three years he had restored universal peace and order to the Roman world. Since the foundation of Rome, no general had more nobly deserved a triumph than Aurelian. 
nor was a triumph ever celebrated with superior pride and magnificence. The pomp was opened by twenty elephants, four royal tigers, and above two hundred of the most curious animals from every climate of the north, the east, and the south. They were followed by sixteen hundred gladiators, devoted to the cruel amusement of the amphitheatre. The wealth of Asia, the arms and ensigns of so many conquered nations, and the magnificent plate and wardrobe of the Syrian queen, were disposed in exact symmetry or artful disorder. The ambassadors of the most remote parts of the earth, of Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia, Bactriana, India, and China, all remarkable by their rich or singular dresses, displayed the fame and power of the Roman emperor, exposed likewise to the public view the presents that he had received, and particularly a great number of crowns of gold, the offerings of grateful cities. The victories of Aurelian were attested by a long train of captives who reluctantly attended his triumph. Goths, Vandals, Sarmatians, Alemanni, Franks, Gauls, Syrians, and Egyptians. Each people was distinguished by its peculiar inscription, and the title of Amazons was bestowed on ten martial heroines of the Gothic nation who had been taken in arms. But every eye, disregarding the crowd of captives, was fixed on the Emperor Tetricus and the Queen of the East. The former, as well as his son, whom he had created Augustus, was dressed in Gallic trousers, a saffron tunic, and a robe of purple. The beauteous figure of Zenobia was confined by fetters of gold. A slave supported the gold chain which encircled her neck, and she almost fainted under the intolerable weight of jewels. She preceded on foot the magnificent chariot, in which she once hoped to enter the gates of Rome. It was followed by two other chariots, still more sumptuous, of Odinatus and the Persian monarch. The triumphal car of Aurelian, it had formerly been used by a Gothic king, was drawn on this memorable occasion, either by four stags or by four elephants. The most illustrious of the senate, the people, and the army closed this solemn procession. Unfeigned joy, wonder, and gratitude swelled the acclamations of the multitude, but the satisfaction of the senate was clouded by the appearance of Tetricus, nor could they suppress a rising murmur the haughty emperor should thus expose to public ignominy the person of a Roman and a magistrate. But, however, in the treatment of his unfortunate rivals, Aurelian might indulge his pride. He behaved towards them with a generous clemency, which was seldom exercised by the ancient conquerors. Princes who, without success, had defended their throne or freedom, were frequently strangled in prison as soon as the triumphal pomp ascended the capital. These usurpers, whom their defeat had convicted of the crime of treason, were permitted to spend their lives in affluence and honourable repose. The emperor presented Zenobia with an elegant villa at Tibur, or Tivoli, about twenty miles from the capital. The Syrian queen insensibly sunk into a Roman matron, her daughters married into noble families, and her race was not yet extinct in the fifth century. Tetricus and his son were reinstated in their ranks and fortunes. They erected on the Salian hill a magnificent palace, and as soon as it was finished, invited Aurelian to supper. On his entrance, he was agreeably surprised with a picture which represented their singular history. They were delineated offering to the emperor a civic crown and a scepter of Gaul, and again receiving at his hands the ornaments of the senatorial dignity. The father was afterwards invested with the government of Lucania, and Aurelian, who soon admitted the abdicated monarch to his friendship and conversation, familiarly asked him whether it were not more desirable to administer a province of Italy than the reign beyond the Alps. The son long continued a respectable member of the Senate, nor was there any one of the Roman nobility more esteemed by Aurelian as well as by his successors. So long and so various was the pomp of Aurelian's triumph, that although it opened with the dawn of day, the slow majesty of the procession ascended not the capital before the ninth hour, and it was already dark when the emperor returned to the palace. Pestiola was protracted by theatrical representations, the games of the circus, the hunting of wild beasts, combat of gladiators, and naval engagements. Liberal donatives were distributed to the army and people, and several institutions, agreeable or beneficial to the city, contributed to perpetuate the glory of Aurelian. A considerable portion of his oriental spoils was consecrated to the gods of Rome, the capital, and every other temple glittered with the offerings of his ostentious piety, and the temple of the sun alone received about fifteen thousand pounds of gold. This last was in a magnificent structure, erected by the emperor on the side of the Quirinal hill, 
and dedicated soon after the triumph that deity whom aurelian adorned as the parent of his life and fortune his mother had been an inferior priestess in the chapel of the sun a peculiar devotion to the god of light was a sentiment which the fortunate peasant imbibed in his infancy and every step of his elevation every victory of his reign fortified superstition by gratitude the arms of aurelian had vanquished the foreign and domestic foes of the republic we are assured that by his salutary rigour crimes and factions mischievous arts and pernicious connivance the luxurious growth of a feeble and oppressive government were eradicated throughout the roman world but if we attentively reflect how much swifter is the process of corruption than its cure and if we remember that the years abandoned to public disorders exceeded the months allotted to the martial reign of aurelian we must confess that a few short intervals of peace were insufficient for the arduous work of reformation even his attempt to restore the integrity of the coin was opposed by a formidable insurrection the emperor's vexation breaks out in one of his private letters surely says he the gods have decreed that my life should be a perpetual warfare a sedition within the walls has just now given birth to a very serious civil war the workmen of the mint at the instigation of felicissimus a slave to whom i had entrusted an employment in the finances have risen in rebellion they are at length suppressed but seven thousand of my soldiers have been slain in the contest of those troops whose ordinary station is in dacia and the camps along the danube other writers who confirm the same fact add likewise that it happened soon after aurelian's triumph the decisive engagement was fought on the salian hill that the workmen of the mint had adulterated the coin and that the emperor restored the public credit by delivering out good money in exchange for the bad which the people was commanded to bring into the treasury we might content ourselves with relating this extraordinary transaction but we cannot dissemble how much in its present form it appears to us inconsistent and incredible the debasement of the coin is indeed well suited to the administration of gallienus nor is it unlikely that the instruments of the corruption might dread the inflexible justice of aurelian but the guilt as well as the profit must have been confined to a very few nor is it easy to conceive by what arts they could arm a people whom they had injured against the monarch whom they had betrayed we might naturally expect that such miscreants should have shared the public detestation with the informers and the other ministers of oppression and that the reformation of the coin should have been an action equally popular with the destruction of those obsolete accounts which by the emperor's order were burnt in the forum of trajan in an age when the principles of commerce were so imperfectly understood the most desirable end might perhaps be effected by harsh and injudicious means but a temporary grievance of such a nature can scarcely excite and support a serious civil war the repetition of intolerable taxes imposed either on the land or the necessities of life may at last provoke those who will not or who cannot relinquish their country but the case is far otherwise in every operation which by whatsoever expedience restores the just value of money the transient evil is soon obliterated by the permanent benefit the loss is divided amongst multitudes and if a few wealthy individuals experience a sensible diminution of treasure with their riches they at the same time lose the degree of weight and importance which they derive from the possession of them however aurelian might choose to disguise the real cause of the insurrection his reformation of the coin could furnish only a faint pretence to a party already powerful and discontented rome though deprived of freedom was distracted by faction the people towards whom the emperor himself a plebeian always expressed a particular fondness lived in perpetual dissension with the senate the equestrian order and the praetorian guards nothing less than the firm though secret conspiracy of these orders of the authority of the first the wealth of the second and the arms of the third could have displayed a strength capable of contending in battle with the veteran legions of the danube which under the conduct of a martial sovereign had achieved the conquest of the west and of the east whatever was the cause or the object of this rebellion imputed with so little probability to the workmen of the mint aurelian used his victory with unrelenting rigour he was naturally of a severe disposition a peasant and a soldier his nerves yielded not easily to the impressions of sympathy and he could sustain without emotion the sight of tortures and death trained from his earliest youth in the exercise of arms he set too small a value on the life of a citizen chastised by military execution the slightest offences and transferred the stern discipline of the camp into the civil administration of the laws 
His love of justice often became a blind and furious passion, and whenever he deemed his own or the public safety endangered, he disregarded the rules of evidence and the proportion of punishments. The unprovoked rebellion with which the Romans rewarded his services exasperated his haughty spirit. The noblest families of the capital were involved in the guilt or suspicion of this dark conspiracy, and as the spirit of revenge urged the bloody persecution, and it proved fatal to one of the nephews of the emperor. The executioners, if we may use the expression of a contemporary poet, were fatigued, the prisons were crowded, and the unhappy senate lamented the death or absence of its most illustrious members. Nor was the pride of Aurelian less offensive to that assembly than his cruelty. Ignorant or impatient of the restraints of civil institutions, he disdained to hold his power by any other title than that of the sword, and governed by right of conquest and empire, which he had saved and subdued. It was observed by one of the most sagacious of the Roman princes that the talents of his predecessor Aurelian were better suited to the command of an army than to the government of an empire. Conscious of the character in which nature and experience had enabled him to excel, he again took to the field a few months after his triumph. It was expedient to exercise the restless temper of the legions in some foreign war, and a Persian monarch, exulting in the shame of a Valerian, still braved with impunity the offended majesty of Rome. At the head of an army, less formidable by its numbers than by its discipline and valor, the emperor advanced as far as the straits which divide Europe from Asia. He there experienced that the most absolute power is a weak defense against the effects of despair. He had threatened one of his secretaries who was accused of extortion, and it was known that he seldom threatened in vain. The last hope which remained from the criminal was to involve some of his principal officers in the army in his danger, or at least in his fears. Artfully counterfeiting his master's hand, he showed them, in a long and bloody list, their own names devoted to death. Without suspecting or examining the fraud, they resolved to secure their lives by the murder of the emperor. On his march between Byzantium and Heraclea, Aurelian was suddenly attacked by the conspirators, whose stations gave them a right to surround his person, and after a short resistance, fell by the hand of Mukapur, a general whom he had always loved and trusted. He died regretted by the army, detested by the senate, but universally acknowledged as a warlike and fortunate prince, the useful, though severe reformer of a degenerate state. End of chapter 11 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Volume 1. By Edward Gibbon. Chapter 12. Reigns of Tacitus, Proba, Carew, and his Sons. Part 1. Conduct of the Army and Senate after the death of Aurelian. Reigns of Tacitus, Proba, Carew, and his sons. Such was the unhappy condition of the Roman emperors, that whatever might be their conduct, their fate was commonly the same. A life of pleasure or virtue, of severity or mildness, of indolence or glory, alike led to an untimely grave, and almost every reign is closed by the same disgusting repetition of treason and murder. The death of Orlean, however, is remarkable by its extraordinary consequences. The legions admired, lamented, and revenged their victorious chief. The artifice of his perfidious secretary was discovered and punished. The deluded conspirators attended the funeral of their injured sovereign, with sincere or well-feigned contrition, and submitted to the unanimous resolution of the military order, which was signified by the following epistle. The brave and fortunate armies to the Senate and people of Rome, the crime of one man and the error of many, have deprived us of the late emperor Orlean. May it please you, venerable lords and fathers, 
to place him in the number of the gods, and to appoint a successor whom your judgment shall declare worthy of the imperial purple. None of those whose guilt or misfortune have contributed to our loss shall ever reign over us. The Roman senators heard, without surprise, that another emperor had been assassinated in his camp. They secretly rejoiced in the fall of Orleans, but the modest and dutiful address of the legions, when it was communicated in full assembly by the consul, diffused the most pleasing astonishment. Such honours as fear and perhaps esteem could extort, they liberally poured forth on the memory of their deceased sovereign. Such acknowledgments as gratitude could inspire, they returned to the faithful armies of the Republic, who entertained so just a sense of the legal authority of the Senate in the choice of an emperor. Yet notwithstanding this flattering appeal, the most prudent of the assembly declined exposing their safety and dignity to the caprice of an armed multitude. The strength of the legions was, indeed, a pledge of their sincerity, since those who may command are seldom reduced to the necessity of dissembling. But could it naturally be expected that a hasty repentance would correct the inveterate habits of fourscore years? Should the soldiers relapse into their accustomed seditions, their insolence might disgrace the majesty of the Senate, and prove fatal to the object of its choice. Motives like these dictated a decree by which the election of a new emperor was referred to the suffrage of the military order. The contention that ensued is one of the best attested but most improbable events in the history of mankind. The troops, as if saturated with the exercise of power, again conjured the Senate to invest one of its own body with the imperial purple. The Senate still persisted in its refusal, the army in its request. The reciprocal offer was pressed and rejected at least three times, and, whilst the obstinate modesty of either party was resolved to receive a master from the hands of the other, eight months insensibly elapsed an amazing period of tranquil anarchy, during which the Roman world remained without a sovereign, without an usurper, and without a sedition. The generals and magistrates appointed by Orleans continued to execute their ordinary functions, and it is observed that a proconsul of Asia was the only considerable person removed from his office in the whole course of the interregnum. An event somewhat similar, but much less authentic, is supposed to have happened after the death of Romulus, who, in his life and character, bore some affinity with Orlean. The throne was vacant during twelve months, till the election of a Sabine philosopher, and the public peace was guarded in the same manner, by the union of the several orders of the state. But in the time of Numa and Romulus, the arms of the people were controlled by the authority of the patricians, and the balance of freedom was easily preserved in a small and virtuous community. The decline of the Roman state, far different from its infancy, was attended with every circumstance that could banish from an interregnum the prospect of obedience and harmony, an immense and tumultuous capital, a wide extent of empire, the servile equality of despotism, an army of 400,000 mercenaries, and the experience of frequent revolutions. Yet notwithstanding all these temptations, the discipline and memory of Orleans still restrained the sedigious temper of the troops, as well as the fatal ambition of their leaders. The flower of the legions maintained their stations on the banks of the Bosphorus, and the imperial standard awed the less powerful camps of Rome and of the provinces. 
A generous though transient enthusiasm seemed to animate the military order, and we may hope that a few real patriots cultivated the returning friendship of the army and the senate as the only expedient capable of restoring the republic to its ancient beauty and vigour. On the 25th of September, near eight months after the murder of Orleon, the consul convoked an assembly of the Senate, and reported the doubtful and dangerous situation of the empire. He slightly insinuated that the precarious loyalty of the soldiers depended on the chance of every hour, and of every accident, that he represented, with the most convincing eloquence, the various dangers that might attend any further delay in the choice of an emperor. Intelligence, he said, was already received, that the Germans had passed the Rhine, and occupied some of the strongest and most opulent cities of Gaul. The ambition of the Persian king kept the East in perpetual alarms, Egypt, Africa, and Ilricum were exposed to foreign and domestic arms, and the levity of Syria would prefer even a female sceptre to the sanctity of the Roman laws. The consul, then addressing himself to Tacitus, the first of the senators, required his opinion on the important subject of a proper candidate for the vacant throne, if we can prefer personal merit to accidental greatness, we shall esteem the birth of Tacitus more truly noble than that of kings. He claimed his descent from the philosophic historian, whose writings will instruct the last generations of mankind. The senator Tacitus was then seventy-five years of age. The long period of his innocent life was adorned with wealth and honours. He had twice been invested with the consular dignity, and enjoyed with elegance and sobriety his ample patrimony of between two and three million sterling. The experience of so many princes whom he had esteemed or endured, from the vain follies of Alagabalus to the useful rigour of Orleon, taught him to form a just estimate of the duties, the dangers, and the temptations of their sublime station. From the assiduous study of his immortal ancestor, he derived the knowledge of the Roman constitution and of human nature. The voice of the people had already named Tacitus as the citizen the most worthy of empire. The ungrateful rumour reached his ears and induced him to seek the retirement of one of his villas in Campania. He had passed two months in the delightful privacy of Bay, when he reluctantly obeyed the summons of the consul to resume his honourable place in the Senate, and to assist the Republic with his counsels on this important occasion. He arose to speak, when from every quarter of the house he was saluted with the names of Augustus and Emperor. Tacitus Augustus, the gods preserve thee. We choose thee for our sovereign. To thy care we entrust the republic and the world. Accept the empire from the authority of the senate. It is due to thy rank, to thy conduct, to thy manners. As soon as the tumult of acclamation subsided, Tacitus attempted to decline the dangerous honour, and to express his wonder that they should elect his age and infirmities to succeed the martial vigour of Orleon. Are these limbs, conscript fathers, fitted to sustain the weight of armour, or to practise the exercises of the camp? The variety of climates and the hardships of a military life would soon oppress a feeble constitution, which subsists only by the most tender management. My exhausted strength scarcely enables me to discharge the duty of a senator. How insufficient would it prove to the arduous labours of war and government? Can you hope that the legions will respect a weak old man, whose days have been spent in the shade of peace and retirement? 
Can you desire that I should ever find reason to regret the favorable opinion of the Senate? The reluctance of Tacitus, and it might possibly be sincere, was encountered by the affectionate obstinacy of the Senate. Five hundred voices repeated at once, in eloquent confusion, that the greatest of the Roman princes, Numa, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, had ascended the throne in a very advanced season of life, that the mind, not the body, a sovereign, not a soldier, was the object of their choice, and that they expected from him no more than to guide by his wisdom the valour of the legions. These pressing, though tumultuary, instances were seconded by a more regular oration of Metius Falconus, the next on the consular bench to Tacitus himself. He reminded the assembly of the evils which Rome had endured from the vices of headstrong and capricious youths, congratulated them on the election of a virtuous and experienced senator, and, with a manly, though perhaps a selfish, freedom, exhorted Tacitus to remember the reasons of his elevation, and to seek a successor, not in his own family, but in the Republic. The speech of Falconus was enforced by a general acclamation. The emperor-elect submitted to the authority of his country, and received the voluntary homage of his equals. The judgment of the Senate was confirmed by the consent of the Roman people, and of the Praetorian guards. The administration of Tacitus was not unworthy of his life and principles. A grateful servant of the Senate, he considered that national council as the author, and himself as the subject of the laws. He studied to heal the wounds which imperial pride, civil discord, and military violence had inflicted on the Constitution, and to restore, at least, the image of the ancient republic, as it had been preserved by the policy of Augustus, and the virtues of Trajan and the Antonines. It may not be useless to recapitulate some of the most important prerogatives which the Senate appeared to have regained by the election of Tacitus. 1. To invest one of their body, under the title of emperor, with the general command of the armies and the government of the frontier provinces. 2. To determine the list, or, as it was then styled, the College of Consuls. They were twelve in number, who, in successive pairs, each during the space of two months, filled the year and represented dignity of that ancient office. The authority of the Senate, in the nomination of the consuls, was exercised with such independent freedom, that no regard was paid to an irregular request of the emperor in favour of his brother Florinus. The Senate, exclaimed Tacitus, with the honest transport of a patriot, understand the character of a prince whom they have chosen. 3. To appoint the proconsuls and presidents of the provinces, and to confer on all magistrates their civil jurisdiction. 4. To receive appeals through the intermediate office of the prefect of the city from all the tribunals of the empire. 5. To give force and validity, by their decrees, to such as they should approve of the emperor's edict. 6. To these several branches of authority, we may add some inspection over the finances, since, even in the stern reign of Orleans, it was in their power to divert a part of the revenue from the public service. Circular epistles were sent, without delay, to all the principal cities of the empire, Treves, Milan, Aquilia, Thessalonica, Corinth, Athens, Antioch, Alexandria, and Carthage, to claim their obedience, and to inform them of the happy revolution, 
which had restored the Roman Senate to its ancient dignity. Two of these epistles are still extant. We likewise possess two very singular fragments of the private correspondence of the senators on this occasion. They discover the most excessive joy and the most unbounded hopes. Cast away your indolence. It is thus that one of the senators addressed his friend. Emerge from your retirements, obey, and paternally. Give yourself to the city, to the senate. Rome flourishes. The whole republic flourishes. Thanks to the Roman army, to an army truly Roman. At length we have recovered our just authority, the end of all our desires. We hear appeals, we appoint proconsuls, we create emperors, perhaps too we may restrain them, to the wise a word is sufficient. These lofty expectations were, however, soon disappointed, nor indeed was it possible that the armies and the provinces should long obey the luxuries and unwarlike nobles of Rome. On the slightest touch, the unsupported fabric of their pride and power fell to the ground. The expiring senate displayed a sudden luster, blazed for a moment, and was extinguished forever. All that had yet passed at Rome was no more than a theatrical representation, unless it was ratified by the more substantial power of the legions. Leaving the senators to enjoy their dream of freedom and ambition, Tacitus proceeded to the Thracian camp, and was there, by the Praetorian prefect, presented to the assembled troops as the prince whom they themselves had demanded, and whom the senate had bestowed. As soon as the prefect was silent, the emperor addressed himself to the soldiers with eloquence and propriety. He gratified their avarice by a liberal distribution of treasure, under the names of pay and donative. He engaged their esteem by a spirited declaration that although his age might disable him from the performance of military exploits, his counsel should never be unworthy of a Roman general, the successor of the brave Orleon. Whilst the deceased emperor was making preparations for a second expedition into the east, he had negotiated with the Alani, a Scythian people, who pitched their tents in the neighbourhood of the Lake Mootis. Those barbarians, allured by presents and subsidies, had promised to invade Persia with a numerous body of light cavalry. They were faithful to their engagements, but when they arrived on the Roman frontier, Aulian was already dead. The design of Persian war was at least suspended, and the generals, who, during the interregnum, exercised a doubtful authority, were unprepared either to receive or to oppose them. Provoked by such treatment, which they considered as trifling and perfidious, the Alani had recourse to their own valour for their payment and revenge, and as they moved with the usual swiftness of Tartars, they had soon spread themselves over the provinces of Pontus, Cappadocia, Cilicia, and Galatia. The legions, who from the opposite shores of the Bosphorus could almost distinguish the flames of the cities and villages, impatiently urged their general to lead them against the invaders. The conduct of Tacitus was suitable to his age and station. He convinced the barbarians of the faith, as well as the power of the empire. Great numbers of the Alani, appeased by the punctual discharge of the engagements which Aulian had contracted with them, relinquished their booty and captives, and quietly retreated to their own deserts, beyond the Phasis. Against the remainder, who refused peace, the Roman emperor waged, in person, a successful war, seconded by an army of brave and experienced veterans. In a few weeks he delivered the provinces of Asia from the terror of the Scythian invasion. 
but the glory and life of Tacitus were of short duration. Transported in the depth of winter from the soft retirement of Campania to the foot of Mount Caucasus, he sunk under the unaccustomed hardships of a military life. The fatigues of the body were aggravated by the cares of the mind. For a while the angry and selfish passions of the soldiers had been suspended by the enthusiasm of public virtue. They soon broke out with redoubled violence, and raged in the camp, and even in the tent of the aged emperor. His mild and amiable character served only to inspire contempt, and he was incessantly tormented with factions which he could not assuage and by demands which it was impossible to satisfy. Whatever flattering expectations he had conceived of reconciling the public disorders, Tacitus soon was convinced that the licentiousness of the army disdained the feeble restraint of laws, and his last hour was hastened by anguish and disappointment. It may be doubtful whether the soldiers imbrued their hands in the blood of this innocent prince. It is certain that their insolence was the cause of his death. He expired at Tyana in Cappadocia, after a reign of only six months and about twenty days. The eyes of Tacitus were scarcely closed before his brother Florinus showed himself unworthy to reign by the hasty usurpation of the purple. Without expecting the approbation of the Senate, the reverence for the Roman constitution, which yet influenced the camp and the provinces, was sufficiently strong to dispose them to censure, but not to provoke them to oppose, the precipitate ambition of Florinus. The discontent would have evaporated in idle murmurs, had not the general of the East, the heroic proba boldly declared himself the avenger of the Senate. The contest, however, was still unequal. Nor could the most able leader at the head of the effeminate troops of Egypt and Syria encounter, with any hopes of victory, the legions of Europe, whose irresistible strength appeared to support the brother of Tacitus. But the fortune and activity of Probar triumph over every obstacle. The hardy veterans of his rival, accustomed to cold climates, sickened and consumed away in sultry heats of Cilicia, where the summer proved remarkably unwholesome. Their numbers were diminished by frequent desertion. The passes of the mountains were feebly defended. Tarsus opened its gates, and the soldiers of Florinus, when they had permitted him to enjoy the imperial title about three months, delivered the empire from civil war by the easy sacrifice of a prince whom they despised. The perpetual revolutions of the throne had so perfectly erased every notion of hereditary title that the family of an unfortunate emperor was incapable of exciting the jealousy of his successors. The children of Tacitus and Florinus were permitted to descend into a private station, and to mingle with the general mass of the people. Their poverty indeed became an additional safeguard to their innocence. When Tacitus was elected by the Senate, he resigned his ample patrimony to the public service, an act of generosity specious in appearance but which evidently disclosed his intention of transmitting the empire to his descendants. The only consolation of their fallen state was the remembrance of transient greatness, and a distant hope, the child of a flattering prophecy, that at the end of a thousand years a monarch of the race of Tacitus should arise, the protector of the Senate, the restorer of Rome, and the conqueror of the whole earth. The peasants of Illyricum, who had already given Claudius and Orlean to the sinking empire, had an equal right to glory in the elevation of Proba. About twenty years before, the emperor Valerian, with his usual penetration, 
had discovered the rising merit of the young soldier, on whom he conferred the rank of tribune, long before the age prescribed by the military regulations. The tribune soon justified his choice by a victory over a great body of Sarmatians, in which he saved the life of a near relation of Valerian, and deserved to receive from the emperor's hand the collars, bracelets, spears, and banners, the mural and the civic crown, and all the honorable rewards reserved by ancient Rome for successful valor. The third, and afterwards the tenth, legion were entrusted to the command of Probar, who, in every step of his promotion, showed himself superior to the station which filled Africa and Pontus, the Rhine, the Danube, the Euphrates, and the Nile, by turns afforded him the most splendid occasions of displaying his personal prowess and his conduct in war. Orleon was indebted for the honest courage with which he often checked the cruelty of his master. Tacitus, who desired by the abilities of his generals to supply his own deficiency of military talents, named him commander-in-chief of all the eastern provinces, with five times the usual salary, the promise of the consulship, and the hope of a triumph. When Probar ascended the imperial throne, he was about forty-four years of age, in the full possession of his fame, of the love of the army, and of a mature vigor of mind and body. His acknowledged merit, and the success of his arms against Florinus, left him without an enemy or a competitor. Yet if we may credit his own professions, very far from being desirous of the empire, he had accepted it with the most sincere reluctance. But it is no longer in my power, says Probar, in a private letter, to lay down a title so full of envy and of danger. I must continue to personate the character which the soldiers have imposed upon me. His dutiful address to the Senate displayed the sentiments, or at least the language, of a Roman patriot. When you elected one of your order, conscript fathers, to succeed the emperor, Orleon, you acted in a manner suitable to your justice and wisdom, for you are the legal sovereigns of the world, and the power which you derive from your ancestors will descend to your posterity. Happy would it have been, if Florinus, instead of unsurping the purple of his brother, like a private inheritance, had expected what your majesty might determine, either in his favour or in that of other person. The prudent soldiers have punished his rashness. To me they have offered the title of Augustus, but I submit to your clemency my pretensions and my merits. When this respectful epistle was read by the consul, the senators were unable to disguise their satisfaction that Probar should condescend thus numbly to solicit a sceptre which he already possessed. They celebrated with the warmest gratitude his virtues, his exploits, and above all his moderation. A decree immediately passed, without a dissenting voice, to ratify the election of the eastern armies, and to confer on their chief all the several branches of the imperial dignity, the names of Caesar and Augustus, the title of father of his country, the right of making in the same day three motions in the Senate, the office of Pontifex, Maximus, the tribunician power, and the proconsular command, a mode of investiture, which, though it seemed to multiply the authority of the emperor, expressed the constitution of the ancient republic. The reign of Probus corresponded with this fair beginning. The senate was permitted to direct the civil administration of the empire. Their faithful general asserted the honor of the Roman arms, 
and often laid at their feet crowns of gold and barbaric trophies, the fruits of his numerous victories, yet whilst he gratified their vanity, he must secretly have despised their indolence and weakness, though it was every moment in their power to repeal the disgraceful edict of Gallinus, the proud successors of the Scipios patiently acquiesced in their exclusion from all military employments. They soon experienced that those who refused the sword must renounce the sceptre. End of chapter 12, part 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 12. Reigns of Tacitus, Proba, Carus, and his sons. Part 2. The strength of Aurelian had crushed on every side of the enemies of Rome. After his death they seemed to revive with an increase of fury and of numbers. They were again vanquished by the active vigour of Proba, who, in a short reign of about six years, equalled the fame of ancient heroes and restored peace and order to every province of the Roman world. The dangerous frontier of Rachia is so firmly secured that he left it without the suspicion of an enemy. He broke the wandering power of the Sarmatian tribes, and by the terror of his arms compelled those barbarians to relinquish their spoil. The Gothic nation courted the alliance of so warlike an emperor, he attacked the Azurians in their mountains, besieged and took several of their strongest castles, and flattered himself that he had forever suppressed a domestic foe, whose independence so deeply wounded the majesty of the empire. The troubles excited by the usurper Firmus in the Upper Egypt had never been perfectly appeased, and the city of Polemus and Coptus fortified by the alliance of the Blemies, still maintained an obscure rebellion. The chastisement of those cities, and of their auxiliaries, the savages of the south, is said to have alarmed the court of Persia, and the great king sued in vain for the friendship of Probar. Most of the exploits which distinguished his reign were achieved by the personal valour and conduct of the emperor, insomuch that the writer of his life expresses some amazement how, in so short a time, a single man could be present in so many distant wars. The remaining actions he entrusted to the care of his lieutenants, the judicious choice of whom forms no inconsiderable part of his glory. Carus, Diocletian, Maximian, Constantius, Galerius, Asclepius, and Annabilius, and a crowd of other chiefs, who afterwards ascended or supported the throne, were trained to arms in the severe school of Aurelian and Probar. But the most important service which Probar rendered to the Republic was the deliverance of Gaul and the recovery of seventy flourishing cities oppressed by the barbarians of Germany, who, since the death of Aurelian, had ravaged that great province with impunity. Among the various multitude of those fierce invaders, we may distinguish, with some degree of clearness, three great armies, or rather nations, successively vanquished by the valour of Probar. He drove back the Franks into their morasses, a descriptive circumstance from whence we may infer that the confederacy known by the manly appellation of free 
already occupied the flat maritime country, intersected and almost overflown by the stagnating waters of the Rhine, and that several tribes of the Frisians and Batavians had acceded to their alliance. He vanquished the Burgundians, a considerable people of the Vandalus race. They had wandered in quest of booty from the banks of the Oder to those of the Seine. They esteemed themselves sufficiently fortunate to purchase, by the restitution of all their booty, the permission of an undisturbed retreat. They attempted to elude that article of the treaty. Their punishment was immediate and terrible, but of all the invaders of Gaul, the most formidable were the Lygians, a distant people, who reigned over a wide domain on the frontiers of Poland and Silesia. In the Lygian nation, the Ari held the first rank by their numbers of fierceness. The Ari, it is thus that they are described by the energy of Tacitus, studied to improve by art and circumstances the innate terrors of their barbarism. Their shields are black, their bodies are painted black. They choose for the combat the darkest hour of the night. Their host advances, covered, as it were, with a funeral shade. Nor do they often find an enemy capable of sustaining so strange and infernal an aspect. Of all our senses, the eyes are first vanquished in battle. Yet the arms and discipline of the Romans easily discomfited these horrid phantoms. The Lygi were defeated in a general engagement, and Semno, the most renowned of their chiefs, fell alive into the hands of Probar. That prudent emperor, unwilling to reduce a brave people to despair, granted them an honourable capitulation, and permitted them to return in safety to their native country. But the losses which they suffered in the march, the battle, and the retreat, broke the power of the nation, nor is the Lygian name ever repeated in the history either of Germany or of the empire. The deliverance of Gaul is reported to have cost the lives of 400,000 of the invaders, a work of labor to the Romans, and of expense to the emperor, who gave a piece of gold for the head of every barbarian. But as the fame of warriors is built on the destruction of humankind, we may naturally suspect that the Sangeria account was multiplied by the adherence of the soldiers, and accepted without any very severe examination by the liberal vanity of Probar. Since the expedition of Maximin, the Roman generals had confined their ambition to a defensive war against the nations of Germany, who perpetually pressed on the frontiers of the empire. The more daring Probar pursued his Gaelic victories, passed the Rhine, and displayed his invincible eagles on the banks of the Elbe and the Necker. He was fully convinced that nothing could reconcile the minds of the barbarians to peace, unless they experienced, in their own country, the calamities of war. Germany, exhausted by the ill success at the last emigration, was astonished by his presence. Nine of the most considerable princes repaired to his camp, and fell prostrate at his feet. Such a treaty was humbly received by the Germans, as it pleased the conqueror to dictate. He exacted a strict restitution of the effects and captives which they had carried away from the provinces and obliged their own magistrates to punish the more obstinate robbers who presumed to detain any part of the spoil. A considerable tribute of corn, cattle, and horses, the only wealth of barbarians, was reserved for the use of the garrisons which Probar established on the limits of their territory. He even entertained some thoughts 
of compelling the Germans to relinquish the exercise of arms, and to trust their differences to the justice, their safety to the power of Rome. To accomplish these salutary ends, the constant residence of an imperial governor, supported by a numerous army, was indispensably requisite. Probar therefore judged it more expedient to defer the execution of so great a design, which was indeed rather a specious than solid utility. Had Germany been reduced into the state of a province, the Romans, with immense labour and expense, would have acquired only a more extensive boundary to defend against the fiercer and more active barbarians of Scythia. Instead of reducing the warlike natives of Germany to the condition of subjects, Probar contented himself with the humble expedient of raising a bulwark against their inroads. The country which now forms the circle of Swabia had been left desert in the age of Augustus by the emigration of its ancient inhabitants. The fertility of the soil soon attracted a new colony, from the adjacent provinces of Gaul. Crowds of adventurers, of a roaming temper, and of desperate fortunes, occupied the doubtful possession, and acknowledged, by the payment of tithes, the majesty of the empire. To protect these new subjects, a line of frontier garrisons was gradually extended from the Rhine to the Danube. About the reign of Hadrian, when that mode of defence began to be practised, these garrisons were connected and covered by a strong entrenchment of trees and palisades. In the place of so rude a bulwark, the emperor Probar constructed a stone wall of a considerable height, and strengthened it by towers at convenient distances. From the neighbourhood of Neustadt and Ratisbon on the Danube, it stretched across hills, valleys, rivers, and morasses, as far as Wimpfen on the Necker, and at length terminated on the banks of the Rhine, after a winding course of near two hundred miles. This important barrier, uniting the two mighty streams that protected the provinces of Europe, seemed to fill up the vacant space through which the barbarians, and particularly the Alemanni, could penetrate with the greatest facility into the heart of the empire. But the experience of the world, from China to Britain, has exposed the vain attempt of fortifying any extensive tract of country. An active enemy, who can select and vary his points of attack, must, in the end, discover some feeble spot, on some unguarded moment. The strength, as well as the attention, of the defenders is divided, and such are the blind effects of terror on the finest troops, that a line broken in a single place is almost instantly deserted. The fate of the wall which Probar erected may confirm the general observation. Within a few years after his death, it was overthrown by the alimony. Its scattered ruins, universally ascribed to the power of the daemon, now serve only to excite the wonder of the Swabian peasant. Among the useful conditions of peace imposed by Probar on the vanquished nations of Germany was the obligation of supplying the Roman army with 16,000 recruits, the bravest and most robust of their youth, the emperor dispersed them through all the provinces, and distributed this dangerous reinforcement in small bands of fifty or sixty each, among the national troops, judiciously observing that the aid which the republic derived from the barbarians should be felt but not seen. Their aid was now become necessary, the feeble elegance of Italy and the internal provinces could no longer support the weight of arms. The hardy frontiers of the Rhine and Danube still produced minds and bodies equal to the labours of the camp, but 
that a perpetual series of wars had gradually diminished their numbers. The infrequency of marriage and the ruin of agriculture affected the principles of population, and not only destroyed the strength of the present, but intercepted the hope of future generations. The wisdom of Probar embraced a great and beneficial plan of replenishing the exhausted frontiers by new colonies of captive or fugitive barbarians, on whom he bestowed lands, cattle, instruments of husbandry, and every encouragement that might engage them to educate a race of soldiers for the service of the Republic. Into Britain, and most probably into Cambridgeshire, he transported a considerable body of vandals. The impossibility of an escape reconciled them to their situation, and in the subsequent troubles of that island they approved themselves the most faithful servants of the state. Great numbers of Franks and Jeopardy were settled on the banks of the Danube and the Rhine, a hundred thousand Bastane, expelled from their own country, cheerfully accepted an establishment in Thrace, and soon imbibed the manners and sentiments of Roman subjects. But the expectations of Probar were too often disappointed. The impatience and idleness of the barbarians could ill brook the slow labours of agriculture their unconquerable love of freedom, rising against despotism, provoked them into hasty rebellions, alike fatal to themselves and to the provinces, nor could these artificial supplies, however repeated by succeeding emperors, restore the important limit of Gaul and Ilricrum to its ancient and native vigour. Of all the barbarians who abandoned their new settlements and disturbed the public tranquillity, a very small number returned to their own country. For a short season they might wander in arms through the empire, but in the end they were surely destroyed by the power of a warlike emperor. The successful rashness of a party of Franks was attended, however, with such memorable consequences that it ought not to be passed unnoticed. They had been established by Probar on the sea coast of Pontus, with a view of strengthening the frontier against the inroads of the Alani. A fleet stationed in one of the harbours of the Exine fell into the hands of the Franks, and they resolved, through unknown seas, to explore their way from the mouth of the Phasis to that of the Rhine they easily escaped through the Bosphorus and the Hellespont, and cruising along the Mediterranean, indulged their appetite for revenge and plunder by frequent descents on the unsuspecting shores of Asia, Greece, and Africa. The opulent city of Syracuse, in which port the natives of Athens and Carthage had formerly been sunk, was sacked by a handful of barbarians, who massacred the greatest part of the trembling inhabitants. From the island of Sicily, the Franks proceeded to the columns of Hercules, trusted themselves to the ocean, coasted round Spain and Gaul, and steering their triumphant course through the British Channel, at length finished their surprising voyage by landing in safety on the Batavian or Frisian shores. The example of their success, instructing their countrymen to conceive the advantages and to despise the dangers of the sea, pointed out to their enterprising spirit a new road to wealth and glory. Notwithstanding the vigilance and activity of Probar, it was almost impossible that he could at once contain in obedience every part of his wide-extended dominions. The barbarians, who broke their chains, had seized the favourable opportunity of a domestic war. When the emperor marched to the relief of Gaul, he devolved the command of the east on Saturnius. That general, a man of merit and experience, was driven into rebellion by the absence of his sovereign, 
the levity of the Alexandrian people, the pressing instances of his friends, and his own fears, but from the moment of his elevation he never entertained a hope of empire, or even of life. Alas, he said, the republic has lost a useful servant, and the rashness of an hour has destroyed the services of many years. You know not, continued he, the misery of sovereign power. A sword is perpetually suspended over our head. We dread our very guards. We distrust our companions. The choice of action or of repose is no longer in our disposition, nor is there any age or character or conduct that can protect us from the censure of envy. In thus exalting me to the throne, you have doomed me to a life of cares, and to an untimely fate. The only consolation which remains is the assurance that I shall not fall alone. But as the former part of his prediction was verified by the victory, so the latter was disappointed by the clemency of Probar. That amiable prince attempted even to save the unhappy Saturninus from the fury of the soldiers. He had more than once solicited the usurper himself to place some confidence in the mercy of the sovereign who so highly esteemed his character, that he had punished, as a malicious informer, the first who related the improbable news of his disaffection. Saturninus might, perhaps, have embraced the generous offer, had he not been restrained by the obstinate distrust of his adherents. Their guilt was deeper, and their hopes were more sanguine than those of their experienced leader. The revolt of Saturninus was scarcely extinguished in the east, before new troubles were excited in the west by the rebellion of Bonassus and Proculus in Gaul. The most distinguished merit of those two officers was their respective prowess, of the one in the combats of Bacchus, of the other in those of Venice. Yet neither of them was destitute of courage and capacity, and both sustained with honour the august character which the fear of punishment had engaged them to assume, till they sunk at length beneath the superior genius of Proba. He used the victory with his accustomed moderation, and spared the fortune as well as the lives of their innocent families. The arms of Probar had now suppressed all the foreign and domestic enemies of the state. His mild but steady administration confirmed the re-establishment of the public tranquillity, nor was there left in the provinces a hostile barbarian, a tyrant or even a robber, to revive the memory of past disorders. It was time that the emperor should revisit Rome, and celebrate his own glory and the general happiness. The triumph due to the valour of Probar was conducted with a magnificence suitable to his fortune, and the people who had so lately admired the trophies of Orleon gazed with equal pleasure on those of his heroic successor. We cannot, on this occasion, forget the desperate courage of about fourscore gladiators, reserved, with near six hundred others, for the inhuman sports of the amphitheatre. Disdaining to shed their blood for the amusement of the populace, they killed their keepers, broke from the place of their confinement, and filled the streets of Rome with blood and confusion. After an obstinate resistance, they were overpowered and cut in pieces by the regular forces, but they obtained at least an honourable death and the satisfaction of a just revenge. The military discipline which reigned in the camps of Probar was less cruel than that of Orleon, but it was equally rigid and exact. The latter had punished the irregularities of the soldiers with unrelenting severity. The former prevented them by employing the legions in constant and useful labours. 
When Probar commanded in Egypt, he executed many considerable works for the splendor and benefit of that rich country. The navigation of the Nile, so important to Rome itself, was improved, and temples, buildings, porticoes, and palaces were constructed by the hands of the soldiers, who acted by turns as architects, as engineers, and as husbandmen. It was reported of Hannibal that in order to preserve his troops from the dangerous temptations of idleness, he had obliged them to form large plantations of olive trees along the coast of Africa. From a similar principle, Probar exercised his legions in covering with rich vineyards the hills of Gaul and Pannonia, and two considerable spots are described which were entirely dug and planted by military labor. One of these, known under the name of Mount Elmo, was situated near Sirmium, the country where Probar was born, for which he ever retained a partial affection, and whose gratitude he endeavored to secure, by converting into tillage a large and unhealthy tract of marshy ground. An army thus employed constituted perhaps the most useful, as well as the bravest portion of Roman subjects. But in the prosecution of a favorite scheme, the best of men, satisfied with the rectitude of their intentions, are subject to forget the bounds of moderation, nor did Probar himself sufficiently consult the patience and disposition of his fierce legionaries. The dangers of the military profession seem only to be compensated by a life of pleasure and idleness, but if the duties of the soldier are incessantly aggravated by the labors of the peasant, he will at last sink under the intolerable burden, or shake it off with indignation. The imprudence of Probar is said to have inflamed the discontent of his troops. More attentive to the interests of mankind than to those of the army, he expressed the vain hope that, by the establishment of universal peace, he should soon abolish the necessity of a standing and mercenary force. The unguarded expression proved fatal to him. In one of the hottest days of summer, as he severely urged the unwholesome labor of drainage, the masses of Sirmium, the soldiers, impatient of fatigue, on a sudden threw down their tools, grasped their arms, and broke out into a furious mutiny. The emperor, conscious of his danger, took refuge in a lofty tower, constructed for the purpose of surveying the progress of the work. The tower was instantly forced, and a thousand swords were plunged at once into the bosom of the unfortunate Probar. The rage of the troops subsided as soon as it had been gratified. They then lamented their fatal rashness, forgot the severity of the emperor, whom they had massacred, and hastened to perpetuate, by an honorable monument, the memory of his virtues and victories. When the legions had indulged their grief, and repentance for the death of Probar, their unanimous consent declared Carus, his Praetorian prefect, the most deserving of the imperial throne. Every circumstance that relates to this prince appears of a mixed and doubtful nature. He gloried in the title of Roman citizen, and affected to compare the purity of his blood with the foreign and even barbarous origin of the preceding emperors. Yet the most inquisitive of his contemporaries, very far from admitting his claim, have variously deduced his own birth, or that of his parents, from Ilricum, from Gaul, or from Africa. Though a soldier, he had received a learned education, though a senator, he was invested with the first dignity of the army, and in an age when the civil and military professions began to be irrecoverably separated from each other, they were united in the person of Carus. 
notwithstanding the severe justice which he exercised against the assassins of Probar, to whose favour and esteem he was highly indebted, he could not escape the suspicion of being accessory to a deed from whence he derived the principal advantage. He enjoyed, at least, before his elevation, an acknowledged character of virtue and abilities, but his austere temper insensibly degenerated into moroseness and cruelty, and the imperfect writers of his life almost hesitate whether they shall not rank him in the number of Roman tyrants. When Carus assumed the purple, he was about sixty years of age, and his two sons, Carinus and Numerian, had already attained the season of manhood. The authority of the Senate expired with Probar, nor was the repentance of the soldiers displayed by the same dutiful regard for the civil power, which they had testified after the unfortunate death of Orleans. The election of Carus was decided without expecting the approbation of the Senate, and the new emperor contented himself with announcing, in a cold and stately epistle, that he had ascended the vacant throne, a behaviour so very opposite to that of his amiable predecessor afforded no favourable presage of the new reign, and the Romans, deprived of power and freedom, asserted their privilege of licentious murmurs. The voice of congratulation and flattery was not, however, silent and we may still peruse, with pleasure and contempt, and a cloak which was composed on the accession of the Emperor Carus. Two shepherds, avoiding the noontide heat, retire into the cave of Faunus. On a spreading beach they discover some recent characters. The rural deity had described, in prophetic verses, the felicity promised to the empire under the reign of so great a prince. Faunus hails the approach of that hero, who, receiving on his shoulders the sinking weight of the Roman world, shall extinguish war and faction, and once again restore the innocence and security of the golden age. It is more than probable that these elegant trifles never reach the ears of a veteran general, who, with the consent of their legions, was preparing to execute the long-suspended design of the Persian War. Before his departure for this distant expedition, Carus conferred on his two sons, Carinus and Numerian, the title of Caesar, and investing the former with almost an equal share of the imperial power, directed the young prince first to suppress some troubles which had arisen in Gaul, and afterwards to fix the seat of his residence at Rome and to assume the government of the western provinces. The safety of Ilricrum was confirmed by a memorable defeat of the Sarmatians. Sixteen thousand of those barbarians remained on the field of battle, and the number of captives amounted to twenty thousand. The old emperor, animated with the fame and prospect of victory, pursued his march in the midst of winter through the countries of Thrace and Asia Minor, and at length, with his younger son, Numerian, arrived on the confines of the Persian monarchy. There, encamping on the summit of a lofty mountain, he pointed out to his troops the opulence and luxury of the enemy whom they were about to invade. The successor of Artaxerxes, Varanes, or Brahram, Though he had subdued the Segestans, one of the most warlike nations of Upper Asia, was alarmed at the approach of the Romans, and endeavoured to retard their progress by a negotiation of peace. His ambassadors entered the camp about sunset, at the time when the troops were satisfying their hunger with a frugal repast. The Persians expressed their desire of being introduced to the presence of the Roman emperor. They were at length conducted to a soldier 
who was seated on the grass. A piece of stale bacon and a few hard peas composed his supper. A coarse woolen garment of purple was the only circumstance that announced his dignity. The conference was conducted with the same disregard of courtly elegance. Carus, taking off a cap which he wore to conceal his baldness, assured the ambassadors that, unless their masters acknowledged the superiority of Rome, he would speedily render Persia as naked of trees as his own head was destitute of hair. Notwithstanding some traces of art and preparation, we may discover in this scene the manners of Carus, and the severe simplicity which the martial princes, who succeeded Gallienus, had already restored in the Roman camps. The ministers of the great king trembled and retired. The threats of Carus were not without effect. He ravaged Mesopotamia, cut in pieces whatever opposed his passage, made himself master of the great cities of Seleucia and Cestaphon, which seemed to have surrendered without resistance, and carried his victorious arms beyond the Tigris. He had seized the favorable moment for an invasion. The Persian councils were distracted by domestic factions, and the greater part of their forces were detained on the frontiers of India. Rome and the East received with transports the news of such important advantages. Flattery and hope painted, in the most lively colors, the fall of Persia, the conquest of Arabia, the submission of Egypt, and a lasting deliverance from the inroads of the Scythian nations. But the reign of Carus was destined to expose the vanity of predictions. They were scarcely uttered before they were contradicted by his death, an event attended with such ambiguous circumstances, that it may be related in a letter from his own secretary to the prefect of the city. Carus, says he, our dearest emperor, was confined by sickness to his bed, when a furious tempest arose in the camp. The darkness which overspread the sky was so thick that we could no longer distinguish each other, and the incessant flashes of lightning took from us the knowledge of all that passed in the general confusion. Immediately after the most violent clap of thunder, we heard a sudden cry that the emperor was dead, and it soon appeared that his chamberlains, in a rage of grief, had set fire to the royal pavilion a circumstance which gave rise to the report that Carus was killed by lightning. But, as far as we have been able to investigate the truth, his death was the natural effect of his disorder. End of chapter 12, part 2「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. « The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. » Volume 1. By Edward Gibbon. Chapter 12. Reigns of Tacitus, Proba, Carus and his sons. Part 3. The vacancy of the throne was not productive of any disturbance. The ambition of the aspiring generals was checked by their natural fears, and young Nemerian, with his absent brother Carinus, were unanimously acknowledged as Roman emperors. The public expected that the successor of Carus would pursue his father's footsteps, and, without allowing the Persians to recover from their consternation, would advance sword in hand to the palaces of Susa and Ecbatana. But the legions, however strong in numbers and discipline, were dismayed by the most abject superstition. 
notwithstanding all the arts that were practised to disguise the manner of the late emperor's death, it was found impossible to remove the opinion of the multitude, and the power of opinion is irresistible. Places or persons struck with lightning were considered by the ancients with pious horror, as singularly devoted to the wrath of heaven. An oracle was remembered, which marked the river Tigris as the fatal boundary of the Roman arms. The troops, terrified with the fate of Carus and with their own danger, called aloud on young Numerian to obey the will of the gods and to lead them away from this inauspicious scene of war. The feeble emperor was unable to subdue their obstinate prejudice, and the Persians wondered at the unexpected retreat of a victorious enemy. The intelligence of the mysterious fate of the late emperor was soon carried from the frontiers of Persia to Rome, and the Senate, as well as the provinces, congratulated the accession of the sons of Carus. These fortunate youths were strangers, however, to that conscious superiority, either of birth or of merit, which can alone render the possession of a throne easy, and as it were natural. Born and educated in a private station, the election of their father raised them at once to the rank of princes, and his death, which happened about sixteen months afterwards, left them the unexpected legacy of a vast empire. To sustain with temper this rapid elevation, an uncommon share of virtue and prudence was requisite, and Carinus, the elder of the brothers, was more than commonly deficient in those qualities. In the Gaelic war he discovered some degree of personal courage, but from the moment of his arrival at Rome, he abandoned himself to the luxury of the capital, and to the abuse of his fortune. He was soft, yet cruel, devoted to pleasure, but destitute of taste, and though exquisitely susceptible of vanity, indifferent to the public esteem. In the course of a few months, he successively married and divorced nine wives, most of whom he left pregnant and notwithstanding this legal inconstancy, found time to indulge such a variety of irregular appetites as brought dishonour on himself and on the noblest houses of Rome. He beheld with inveterate hatred all those who might remember his former obscurity, or censor his present conduct. He banished or put to death the friends and counsellors whom his father had placed about him, to guide his inexperienced youth, and he persecuted with the meanest revenge his schoolfellows and companions who had not sufficiently respected the latent majesty of the emperor. With the senators Carinus affected a lofty and regal demeanour, frequently declaring that he designed to distribute their estates among the populace of Rome. From the dregs of that populace he selected his favourites, and even his ministers. The palace, and even the imperial table, were filled with singers, dancers, prostitutes, and all the various retinue of vice and folly. One of his doorkeepers he entrusted with the government of the city, in the room of the Praetorian Prefect, whom he put to death, Carinus substituted one of the ministers of his loser pleasures. Another, who possessed the same, or even a more infamous, title to favour, was invested with the consulship. A confidential secretary, who had acquired uncommon skill in the art of forgery, delivered the indolent emperor with his own consent from the irksome duty of signing his name. When the Emperor Carus undertook the Persian War, he was induced, by motives of affection as well as policy, to secure the fortunes of his family, 
by leaving in the hands of his eldest son the armies and provinces of the West. The intelligence which he soon received of the conduct of Carinus filled him with shame and regret, nor had he concealed his resolution of satisfying the Republic by a severe act of justice, and of adopting, in the place of an unworthy son, the brave and virtuous Constantius, who at that time was governor of Dalmatia, but the elevation of Constantius was for a while deferred, and as soon as the father's death had released Carinus from the control of fear of decency, he displayed to the Romans the extravagancies of Elagabalus, aggravated by the cruelty of Domitian. The only merit of the administration of Carinus that history could record, or poetry celebrate, was the uncommon splendor with which, in his own and his brother's name, he exhibited the Roman games of the theatre, the circus, and the amphitheatre. More than twenty years afterwards, when the courtiers of Diocletian represented to their frugal sovereign the fame and popularity of his munificent predecessor, he acknowledged that the reign of Carinus had indeed been a reign of pleasure, but this vain prodigality, which the prudence of Diocletian might justly despise, was enjoyed with surprise and transport by the Roman people. The oldest of the citizens, recollecting the spectacles of former days, the triumphal pomp of Probar or Orleon, and the secular games of the Emperor Philip, acknowledged that they were all surpassed by the superior magnificence of Carinus. The spectacles of Carinus may therefore be best illustrated by the observation of some particulars, which history has condescended to relate concerning those of his predecessors. If we confine ourselves solely to the hunting of wild beasts, however we may censure the vanity of the design of the cruelty of the execution, we are obliged to confess that neither before nor since the time of the Romans so much art and expense have ever been lavished for the amusement of the people. By the order of Probar, a great quantity of large trees, torn up by the roots, were transplanted into the midst of the circus. The spacious and shady forest was immediately filled with a thousand ostriches, a thousand stags, a thousand fallow deer, and a thousand wild boars, and all this variety game was abandoned to the riotous impetuosity of the multitude. The tragedy of the succeeding day consisted the massacre of a hundred lions, an equal number of lionesses, two hundred leopards, and three hundred bears. The collection prepared by the younger Geordian for his triumph, and which his successor exhibited in the secular games, was less remarkable by the number than by the singularity of the animals. Twenty zebras displayed their elegant forms and variegated beauty to the eyes of the Roman people. Ten elks, and as many camelopards, the loftiest and most harmless creature that wander over the plains of Samartia and Ethiopia, were contrasted with thirty African hyenas and ten Indian tigers, the most implacable savages of the torrid zone. The unoffending strength with which nature has endowed the greater quadrupeds was admired in the rhinoceros, the hippopotamus of the Nile, and a majestic troop of thirty-two elephants. While the populace gaze with stupid wonder on the splendid show, the naturalist might indeed observe the figure and properties of so many different species transported from every part of the ancient world into the amphitheatre of Rome. But this accidental benefit, which science might derive from folly, 
is surely insufficient to justify such a wanton abuse of the public riches. There occurs, however, a single instance in the First Punic War, in which the Senate wisely connected this amusement of the multitude with the interest of the state. A considerable number of elephants, taken in defeat of the Carthaginian army, were driven through the circus by a few slaves, armed only with blunt javelins. The useful spectacle served to impress the Roman soldier with a just contempt for those unwieldy animals, and he no longer dreaded to encounter them in the ranks of war. The hunting or exhibition of wild beasts was conducted with a magnificence suitable to a people who styled themselves the masters of the world, nor was the edifice appropriated to that entertainment less expressive of Roman greatness. Posterity admires, and will long admire, the awful remains of the amphitheatre of Titus, which so well deserved the epithet of colossal. It was a building of an elliptic figure, five hundred and sixty-four feet in length, and four hundred and sixty-seven in breadth, founded on fourscore arches, and rising with four successive orders of architecture, to the height of one hundred and forty feet. The outside of the edifice was encrusted with marble, and decorated with statues. The slopes of the vast concave, which formed the inside, were filled and surrounded with sixty or eighty rows of seats of marble likewise, covered with cushions, and capable of receiving with ease about fourscore thousand spectators. Sixty-four vomitories, for by that name the doors were very aptly distinguished, poured forth the immense multitude, and the entrances, passages, and staircases were contrived with such exquisite skill that each person, whether of the senatorial, the equestrian, or the plebeian order, arrived at his destined place without trouble or confusion. Nothing was omitted, which in any respect could be subservient to the convenience and pleasure of the spectators. They were protected from the sun and rain by an ample canopy, occasionally drawn over their heads. The air was continually refreshed by the playing of fountains, and profusely impregnated by the grateful scent of aromatics. In the centre of the edifice, the arena, or stage, was strewed with the finest sand, and successively assumed the most different forms. At one moment it seemed to rise out of the earth, like the garden of Hesperides, and was afterwards broken into the rocks and caverns of Thrace. The subterraneous pipes conveyed an inexhaustible supply of water, and what had just before appeared a level plain might be suddenly converted into a wide lake, covered with armed vessels, and replenished with the monsters of the deep. In the decoration of these scenes, the Roman emperors displayed their wealth and liberality, and we read on various occasions that the whole furniture of the amphitheatre consisted either of silver, or of gold, or of amber. The poet who describes the games of Carinus, in the character of a shepherd, attracted to the capital by the fame of their magnificence, affirms that the nets designed as a defence against the wild beasts were of gold wire, that the porticoes were gilded, and that the belt or circle which divided the several ranks of spectators from each other was studded with precious mosaic of beautiful stones. In the midst of this glittering pageantry, the Emperor Carinus, secure of his fortune, enjoyed the acclamations of the people, the flattery of his courtiers, and the songs of the poets, who, 
for want of more essential merit, were reduced to celebrate the divine graces of his person. In the same hour, but at the distance of nine hundred miles from Rome, his brother expired, and a sudden revolution transferred into the hands of a stranger, the sceptre of the house of Carus. The sons of Carus never saw each other after their father's death. The arrangements which their new situation required were probably deferred till the return of the younger brother to Rome, where a triumph was decreed to the young emperors of the glorious success of the Persian War. It is uncertain whether they intended to divide between them the administration or the provinces of the empire but it is very unlikely that their union would have proved of any long duration. The jealousy of power must have been inflamed by the opposition characters. In the most corrupt of times, Carinus was unworthy to live. Numerian deserved to reign in a happier period. His affable manners and gentle virtues secured him, as soon as they became known, the regard and the affections of the public. He possessed the elegant accomplishments of a poet and orator, which dignified as well as adorned the humblest and the most exalted station. His eloquence, however, it was applauded by the Senate, was formed not so much on the model of Cicero as on that of the modern declaimers but in an age very far from being destitute of poetical merit, he contended for the prize with the most celebrated of his contemporaries, and still remained the friend of his rivals, a circumstance which evinces either the goodness of his heart or the superiority of his genius. But the talents of Numerian were rather of the contemplative than of the active kind, when his father's elevation reluctantly forced him from the shade of retirement, neither his temper nor his pursuits had qualified him for the command of armies. His constitution was destroyed by the hardships of the Persian War, and he had contracted, from the heat of the climate, such a weakness in his eyes as obliged him, in the course of a long retreat, to confine himself to the solitude and darkness of a tent or litter. The administration of all affairs, civil as well as military, was devolved on Arius Appa, the Praetorian prefect, who, to the power of his important office, added the honour of being father-in-law to Numerian. The imperial pavilion was strictly guarded by his most trusty adherents and during many days Appa delivered to the army the supposed mandates of their invisible sovereign. It was not till eight months after the death of Carus that the Roman army, returning by slow marches from the banks of the Tigris, arrived on those of the Thracian Bosphorus. The legions halted at Chalcedon in Asia, while the court passed over to Heraclea, on the European side of the Propontis. But a report soon circulated through the camp, at first in secret whispers, and at length in loud clamours, of the emperor's death, and of the presumption of his ambitious minister, who still exercised the sovereign power in the name of a prince who was no more. The impatience of the soldiers could not long support a state of suspense. With rude curiosity they broke into the imperial tent and discovered only the corpse of Numerian. The gradual decline of his health might have induced them to believe that his death was natural, but the concealment was interpreted as an evidence of guilt and the measures which Appa had taken to secure his election became the immediate occasion of his ruin. Yet, even in the transport of their rage and grief, the troops observed a regular proceeding, 
which proves how firmly discipline had been re-established by the martial successes of Gallienus. A general assembly of the army was appointed to be held at Chalcedon, whither Aper was transported in chains as a prisoner and a criminal. A vacant tribunal was erected in the midst of the camp, and the generals and tribunes formed a great military council. They soon announced to the multitude that their choice had fallen on Diocletian, commander of the domestics or bodyguards, as the person the most capable of revenging and succeeding their beloved emperor. The future fortunes of the candidate depended on the chance or conduct of the present hour. Conscience that the station which he had filled exposed him to some suspicions. Diocletian ascended the tribunal, and raising his eyes towards the sun, made a solemn profession of his own innocence in the presence of that all-seeing deity. Then, assuming the tone of a sovereign and judge, he commanded that Aper should be brought in chains to the foot of the tribunal. This man, said he, is the murderer of Numerian, and without giving him time to enter on a dangerous justification, drew his sword and buried it in the breast of the unfortunate prefect. A charge supported by such decisive proof was admitted without contradiction, and the legions, with repeated acclamations, acknowledge the justice and authority of the Emperor Diocletian. Before we enter upon the memorable reign of that prince, it will be proper to punish and dismiss the unworthy brother of Numerian. Carinus possessed arms and treasures sufficient to support his legal title to the empire, but his personal vices overbalanced every advantage of birth and situation. The most faithful servants of the father despised the incapacity and dreaded the cruel arrogance of the son. The hearts of the people were engaged in favor of his rival, and even the senate was inclined to prefer a usurper to a tyrant. The arts of Diocletian inflamed the general discontent, and the winter was employed in secret intrigues and open preparations for a civil war. In the spring, the forces of the east and of the west encountered each other in the plains of Margus, a small city of Asia, in the neighborhood of the Danube. The troops, so lately returned from the Persian War, had acquired their glory at the expense of health and numbers, nor were they in a condition to contend with the unexhausted strength of the legions of Europe. Their ranks were broken, and, for a moment, Diocletian despaired of the purple and of life. But the advantage which Carinus had obtained by the valor of his soldiers, he quickly lost by the infidelity of his officers. A tribune, whose wife he had seduced, seized the opportunity of revenge, and, by a single blow, extinguished civil discord in the blood of the adulterer. End of chapter 12, part 3「the Persian War, Victory and Triumph, the new form of administration, abdication and retirement of Diocletian and Maximian. As the reign of Diocletian was more illustrious than any of his predecessors, so was his birth more abject and obscure. 
the strong claims of merit and of violence had frequently superseded the ideal prerogatives of nobility, but a distinct line of separation was hitherto preserved between the free and the servile part of mankind. The parents of Diocletian had been slaves in the house of Anulinus, a Roman senator, nor was he himself distinguished by any other name than that which he derived from a small town in Dalmatia, from whence his mother deduced her origin. It is, however, probable that his father obtained the freedom of the family, and that he soon acquired an office of scribe which was commonly exercised by persons of his condition. Favourable oracles, or rather the consciousness of superior merit, prompted his aspiring son to pursue the profession of arms and the hopes of fortune, and it would be extremely curious to observe the gradation of arts and accidents which enabled him in the end to fulfil those oracles, and to display that merit to the world. Diocletian was successively promoted to the government of Mysia, the honours of the consulship, and the important command of the guards of the palace. He distinguished his abilities in the Persian war, and after the death of Numerian, the slave, by the confession and judgment of his rivals, was declared the most worthy of the imperial throne. The malice of religious zeal, whilst it arraigns the savage fierceness of his colleague Maximian, has affected to cast suspicions on the personal courage of the Emperor Diocletian. It would not be easy to persuade us of the cowardice of a soldier of fortune, who acquired and preserved the esteem of the legions as well as the favour of so many warlike princes. Yet even calumny is sagacious enough to discover and to attack the most vulnerable part. The valour of Diocletian was never found inadequate to his duty, or to the occasion, but he appears not to have possessed the daring and generous spirit of a hero, who courts danger and fame, disdains artifice, and boldly challenges the allegiance of his equals. His abilities were useful rather than splendid. A vigorous mind, improved by the experience and study of mankind, dexterity and application in business, a judicious mixture of liberality and economy, of mildness and rigour, profound dissimulation under the disguise of military frankness, steadiness to pursue his ends, flexibility to vary his means, and above all the great art of submitting his own passions as well as those of others, to the interest of his ambition, and of colouring his ambition with the most specious pretences of justice and public utility. Like Augustus, Diocletian may be considered as the founder of a new empire. Like the adopted son of Caesar, he was distinguished as a statesman rather than as a warrior, nor did either of these princes employ force whenever their purpose could be effected by policy. The victory of Diocletian was remarkable for its singular mildness. A people accustomed to applaud the clemency of the conqueror, if the usual punishments of death, exile, and confiscation were inflicted with any degree of temper and equity, beheld with the most pleasing astonishment a civil war, the flames of which were extinguished in the field of battle. Diocletian received into his confidence Aristobulus, the principal minister of the house of Carus, respected the lives, the fortunes, and the dignity of his adversaries, and even continued in their respective stations the greater number of the servants of Carinus. It is not improbable that motives of prudence might assist the humanity of the artful Dalmatian. Of these servants many had purchased his favour by secret treachery, in others he esteemed their grateful fidelity to an unfortunate master. The discerning judgment of Aurelian, of Probus, and of Carus had filled the several departments of the state and army with officers of approved merit, whose removal would have injured the public service without promoting the interest of his successor. Such a conduct, however, displayed to the Roman world the fairest prospect of the new reign, and the Emperor affected to confirm this favourable prepossession by declaring that, among all the virtues of his predecessors, he was the most ambitious of imitating the humane philosophy of Marcus Antoninus. 
The first considerable action of his reign seemed to evince his sincerity as well as his moderation. After the example of Marcus, he gave himself a colleague in the person of Maximian, on whom he bestowed at first the title of Caesar, and afterwards that of Augustus. But the motives of his conduct, as well as the object of his choice, were of a very different nature from those of his admired predecessor. By investing a luxurious youth with the honours of the purple, Marcus had discharged a debt of private gratitude, at the expense, indeed, of the happiness of the state. By associating a friend and a fellow-soldier to the labours of government, Diocletian, in a time of public danger, provided for the defence both of the East and of the West. Maximian was born a peasant, and, like Aurelian, in the territory of Sirmium. Ignorant of letters, careless of laws, the rusticity of his appearance and manners still betrayed in the most elevated fortune the meanness of his extraction. War was the only art which he professed. In a long course of service he had distinguished himself on every frontier of the empire, and though his military talents were formed to obey rather than to command, though perhaps he never attained the skill of a consummate general, he was capable by his valour, constancy, and experience of executing the most arduous undertakings. Nor were the vices of Maximian less useful to his benefactor. Insensible to pity, and fearless of consequences, he was the ready instrument of every act of cruelty which the policy of that artful prince might at once suggest and disclaim. As soon as a bloody sacrifice had been offered to prudence or to revenge, Diocletian, by his seasonable intercession, saved the remaining few whom he had never designed to punish, gently censured the severity of his stern colleague, and enjoyed the comparison of a golden and an iron age which was universally applied to their opposite maxims of government. Notwithstanding the difference of their characters, the two emperors maintained on the throne that friendship which they had contracted in a private station. The haughty, turbulent spirit of Maximian, so fatal afterwards to himself and to the public peace, was accustomed to respect the genius of Diocletian, and confessed the ascendant of reason over brutal violence. From a motive either of pride or superstition, the two emperors assumed the titles, the one of Jovius, the other Herculius. Whilst the motion of the world, such was the language of their venal orators, was maintained by the all-seeing wisdom of Jupiter, the invincible arm of Hercules purged the earth from monsters and tyrants. But even the omnipotence of Jovius and Herculius was insufficient to sustain the weight of the public administration. The prudence of Diocletian discovered that the empire, assailed on every side by the barbarians, required on every side the presence of a great army and of an emperor. With this view he resolved once more to divide his unwieldy power, and with the inferior title of Caesar's to confer on two generals of approved merit an unequal share of the sovereign authority. Galerius, surnamed Armentarius from his original profession of a herdsman, and Constantius, who from his pale complexion had acquired the denomination of Chlorus, were the two persons invested with the second honours of the imperial purple. In describing the country, extraction, and manners of Herculius, we have already delineated those of Galerius, who was often, and not improperly, styled the younger Maximian, though, in many instances both of virtue and ability, he appears to have possessed a manifest superiority over the elder. The birth of Constantius was less obscure than that of his colleagues. Eutropius, his father, was one of the most considerable nobles of Dardania, and his mother was the niece of the Emperor Claudius. Although the youth of Constantius had been spent in arms, he was endowed with a mild and amiable disposition, and the popular voice had long since acknowledged him worthy of the rank which he at last attained. To strengthen the bonds of political by those of domestic union, 
each of the emperors assumed the character of a father to one of the Caesars, Diocletian to Galerius, and Maximian to Constantius, and each, obliging them to repudiate their former wives, bestowed his daughter in marriage on his adopted son. These four princes distributed amongst themselves the wide extent of the Roman Empire. The defence of Gaul, Spain, and Britain was entrusted to Constantius. Galerius was stationed on the banks of the Danube, as the safeguard of the Illyrian provinces. Italy and Africa were considered the department of Maximian, and for his peculiar portion Diocletian reserved Thrace, Egypt, and the rich countries of Asia. Every one was sovereign with his own jurisdiction, but their united authority extended over the whole monarchy and each of them was prepared to assist his colleagues with his counsels or presents. The Caesars, in their exalted rank, revered the majesty of the emperors, and the three younger princes invariably acknowledged by their gratitude and obedience the common parent of their fortunes. The suspicious jealousy of power found not any place among them, and the singular happiness of their union has been compared to a chorus of music, whose harmony was regulated and maintained by the skilful hand of the first artist. This important measure was not carried into execution till about six years after the association of Maximian, and that interval of time had not been destitute of memorable incidents. But we have preferred, for the sake of perspicuity, first to describe the more perfect form of Diocletian's government, and afterwards to relate the actions of his reign, following rather the natural order of the events than the dates of a very doubtful chronology. The first exploit of Maximian, though it is mentioned in a few words by our imperfect writers, deserves, from its singularity, to be recorded in a history of human manners he suppressed the peasants of Gaul, who, under the appellation of Bagaudi, had risen in a general insurrection, very similar to those which in the fourteenth century successively afflicted both France and England. It should seem that very many of those institutions, referred by an easy solution to the feudal system, are derived from the Celtic barbarians. When Caesar subdued the Gauls, that great nation was already divided into three orders of men, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people. The first governed by superstition, the second by arms, but the third and last was not of any weight or account in their public councils. It was very natural for the plebeians, oppressed by debt or apprehensive of injuries, to implore the protection of some powerful chief who acquired over their persons and property the same absolute right as, among the Greeks and Romans, a master exercised over his slaves. The greatest part of the nation was gradually reduced into a state of servitude. Compelled to perpetual labour on the estates of the Gallic nobles, and confined to the soil either by the real weight of fetters or by the no less cruel and forcible restraints of the laws. During the long series of troubles which agitated Gaul, from the reign of Gallienus to that of Diocletian, the condition of these servile peasants was peculiarly miserable, and they experienced at once the complicated tyranny of their masters, of the barbarians, of the soldiers, and of the officers of the revenue. Their patience was at last provoked into despair. On every side they rose in multitudes, armed with rustic weapons and with irresistible fury. The ploughman became a foot-soldier, the shepherd mounted on horseback, the deserted villages and open towns were abandoned to the flames, and the ravages of the peasants equalled those of the fiercest barbarians. They asserted the natural rights of men, but they asserted those rights with the most savage cruelty. The Gallic nobles, justly dreading their revenge, either took refuge in the fortified cities, or fled from the wild scene of anarchy. The peasants reigned without control, and two of their most daring leaders had the folly and rashness to assume the imperial ornaments. Their power soon expired at the approach of the legions. The strength of union and discipline obtained an easy victory over a licentious and divided multitude. 
a severe retaliation was inflicted on the peasants who were found in arms, the affrighted remnant returned to their respective habitations, and their unsuccessful effort for freedom served only to confirm their slavery. So strong and uniform is the current of popular passions, that we might almost venture, from very scanty materials, to relate the particulars of this war. But we are not disposed to believe that the principal leaders, Aelianus and Amandus, were Christians, or to insinuate that the rebellion, as it happened in the time of Luther, was occasioned by the abuse of those benevolent principles of Christianity which inculcate the natural freedom of mankind. Maximian had no sooner recovered Gaul from the hands of the peasants than he lost Britain by the usurpation of Carousius. Ever since the rash but successful enterprise of the Franks under the reign of Probus, their daring countrymen had constructed squadrons of light brigantines, in which they incessantly ravaged the provinces adjacent to the ocean. To repel their desultory incursions it was found necessary to create a naval power, and the judicious measure was prosecuted with prudence and vigour. Gesoriacum, or Bologna, in the straits of the British Channel, was chosen by the Emperor for the station of the Roman fleet, and the command of it was entrusted to Carousius, a Menapian of the meanest origin, but who had long signalised his skill as a pilot and his valour as a soldier. The integrity of the new admiral corresponded not with his abilities. When the German pirates sailed from their own harbours, he connived at their passage, but he diligently intercepted their return, and appropriated to his own use an ample share of the spoil which they had acquired. The wealth of Carousius was, on this occasion, very justly considered as an evidence of his guilt, and Maximian had already given orders for his death. But the crafty Menapian foresaw and prevented the severity of the Emperor. By his liberality he had attached to his fortunes the fleet which he commanded, and secured the barbarians in his interest. From the port of Bologna he sailed over to Britain, persuaded the legion and the auxiliaries which guarded that island to embrace his party, and, boldly assuming with the imperial purple the title of Augustus, defied the justice and the arms of his injured sovereign. When Britain was thus dismembered from the empire, its importance was sensibly felt and its loss sincerely lamented. The Romans celebrated and perhaps magnified the extent of that noble island, provided on every side with convenient harbours, the temperature of the climate and the fertility of the soil alike adapted for the production of corn or of vines, the valuable minerals with which it abounded, its rich pastures covered with innumerable flocks, and its woods free from wild beasts or venomous serpents. Above all they regretted the large amount of the revenue of Britain, whilst they confessed that such a province well deserved to become the seat of an independent monarchy. During the space of seven years it was possessed by Carousius and fortune continued propitious to a rebellion supported with courage and ability. The British Emperor defended the frontiers of his dominions against the Caledonians of the North, invited from the continent a great number of skilful artists, and displayed, on a variety of coins that are still extant, his taste and opulence. Born on the confines of the Franks, he courted the friendship of that formidable people by the flattering imitation of their dress and manners. The bravest of their youth he enlisted among his land or sea forces, and, in return for their useful alliance, he communicated to the barbarians the dangerous knowledge of military and naval arts. Carousius still preserved the possession of Bologna and the adjacent country. His fleets rode triumphant on the Channel, commanded the mouths of the Seine and of the Rhine, ravaged the coasts of the ocean, and diffused beyond the columns of Hercules the terror of his name. Under his command, Britain, destined in a future age to obtain the empire of the sea, already assumed its natural and respectable station of a maritime power. By seizing the fleet of Bologna, Carousius had deprived his master of the means of pursuit and revenge, and when, after a vast expense of time and labour, a new armament was launched into the water, 
the imperial troops, unaccustomed to that element, were easily baffled and defeated by the veteran sailors of the usurper. This disappointed effort was soon productive of a treaty of peace. Diocletian and his colleague, who justly dreaded the enterprising spirit of Carausius, resigned to him the sovereignty of Britain, and reluctantly admitted their perfidious servant to a participation of the imperial honours. But the adoption of the two Caesars restored new vigour to the Romans' arms, and while the Rhine was guarded by the presence of Maximian, his brave associate Constantius assumed the conduct of the British war. His first enterprise was against the important place of Boulogne. A stupendous mole raised across the entrance of the harbour intercepted all hopes of relief. The town surrendered after an obstinate defence, and a considerable part of the naval strength of Carausius fell into the hands of the besiegers. During the three years which Constantius employed in preparing a fleet adequate to the conquest of Britain, he secured the coast of Gaul, invaded the country of the Franks, and deprived the usurper of the assistance of those powerful allies. Before the preparations were finished, Constantius received the intelligence of the tyrant's death, and it was considered as a sure presage of the approaching victory. The servants of Carousius imitated the example of treason which he had given. He was murdered by his first minister, Electus, and the assassin succeeded to his power and to his danger. But he possessed not equal abilities either to exercise the one or to repel the other. He beheld with anxious terror the opposite shores of the continent already filled with arms, with troops, and with vessels, for Constantius had very prudently divided his forces, that he might likewise divide the attention and resistance of the enemy. The attack was at length made by the principal squadron, which, under the command of the prefect Asclepiodatus, an officer of distinguished merit, had been assembled in the north of the Seine. So imperfect in those times was the art of navigation, that orators have celebrated the daring courage of the Romans who ventured to set sail with a side wind, and on a stormy day. The weather proved favourable to their enterprise. Under the cover of a thick fog, they escaped the fleet of Electus, which had been stationed off the Isle of Wight to receive them, landed in safety on some part of the western coast, and convinced the Britons that a superiority of naval strength will not always protect their country from a foreign invasion. Asclepiodatus had no sooner disembarked the imperial troops than he set fire to his ships, and, as the expedition proved fortunate, his heroic conduct was universally admired. The usurper had posted himself near London to expect the formidable attack of Constantius, who commanded in person the fleet of Bologna, but the descent of a new enemy required his immediate presence in the west. He performed this long march in so precipitate a manner that he encountered the whole force of the prefect with a small body of harassed and disheartened troops. The engagement was soon terminated by the total defeat and death of Electus. A single battle, as it has often happened, decided the fate of this great island, and when Constantius landed on the shores of Kent, he found them covered with obedient subjects. Their acclamations were loud and unanimous, and the virtues of the conqueror may induce us to believe that they sincerely rejoiced in a revolution which, after a separation of ten years, restored Britain to the body of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 13, part 1《Britain had none but domestic enemies to dread, 
and, as long as the governors preserved their fidelity, and the troops their discipline, the incursions of the naked savages of Scotland or Ireland could never materially affect the safety of the province. The peace of the continent, and the defence of the principal rivers which bounded the empire, were objects of far greater difficulty and importance. The policy of Diocletian, which inspired the counsels of his associates, provided for the public tranquillity by encouraging a spirit of dissension among the barbarians, and by strengthening the fortifications of the Roman limit. In the east he fixed a line of camps from Egypt to the Persian dominions, and for every camp he instituted an adequate number of stationary troops, commanded by their respective officers, and supplied with every kind of arms, from the new arsenals which he had formed at Antioch, Emesa, and Damascus. Nor was the precaution of the emperor less watchful against the well-known valour of the barbarians of Europe. From the mouth of the Rhine to that of the Danube, the ancient camps, towns, and citadels were diligently re-established, and, in the most exposed places, new ones were skilfully constructed. The strictest vigilance was introduced among the garrisons of the frontier, and every expedient was practised that could render the long chain of fortifications firm and impenetrable. A barrier so respectable was seldom violated, and the barbarians often turned against each other their disappointed rage. The Goths, the Vandals, the Gepidae, the Burgundians, the Alemanni, wasted each other's strength by destructive hostilities, and whosoever vanquished, they vanquished the enemies of Rome. The subjects of Diocletian enjoyed the bloody spectacle, and congratulated each other that the mischiefs of civil war were now experienced only by the barbarians. Notwithstanding the policy of Diocletian, it was impossible to maintain an unequal and undisturbed tranquillity during a reign of twenty years, and along a frontier of many hundred miles. Sometimes the barbarians suspended their domestic animosities, and the relaxed vigilance of the garrison sometimes gave a passage to their strength or dexterity. Whenever the provinces were invaded, Diocletian conducted himself with that calm dignity which he always affected, or possessed, reserved his presence for such occasions as were worthy of his interposition, never exposed his person or reputation to any unnecessary danger, ensured his success by every means that prudence could suggest, and displayed, with ostentation, the consequences of his victory. In wars of a more difficult nature and more doubtful event he employed the rough valour of Maximian, and that faithful soldier was content to ascribe his own victories to the wise counsels and auspicious influence of his benefactor. But after the adoption of the two Caesars, the emperors themselves, retiring to a less laborious scene of action, devolved on their adopted sons the defence of the Danube and of the Rhine. The vigilant Galerius was never reduced to the necessity of vanquishing an army of barbarians on the Roman territory. The brave and active Constantius delivered Gaul from a very furious inroad of the Alemanni, and his victories of Longre and Vindonissa appear to have been actions of considerable danger and merit. As he traversed the open country with a feeble guard, he was encompassed on a sudden by the superior multitude of the enemy. He retreated with difficulty towards Langres, but in the general consternation the citizens refused to open their gates, and the wounded prince was drawn up the wall by the means of a rope. But, on the news of his distress, the Roman troops hastened from all sides to his relief, and before the evening he had satisfied his honour and revenge by the slaughter of six thousand Alemanni. From the monuments of those times the obscure traces of several other victories over the barbarians of Sarmatia and Germany might possibly be collected, but the tedious search would not be rewarded either with amusement or with instruction. The conduct which the Emperor Probus had adopted in the disposal of the vanquished was imitated by Diocletian and his associates. The captive barbarians, exchanging death for slavery, were distributed among the provincials and assigned to those districts, 
In Gaul, the territories of Amiens, Beauvais, Cambrai, Treves, Langres, and Troyes are specifically mentioned, which had been depopulated by the calamities of war. They were usually employed as shepherds and husbandmen, but were denied the exercise of arms, except when it was found expedient to enrol them in the military service. Nor did the emperors refuse the property of lands, with a less servile tenure, to such of the barbarians as solicited the protection of Rome. They granted a settlement to several colonies of the Carpi, the Bastani, and the Sarmatians, and, by a dangerous indulgence, permitted them in some measure to retain their national manners and independence. Among the provincials it was a subject of flattering exultation that the barbarians, so lately an object of terror, now cultivated their lands, drove their cattle to the neighbouring fair, and contributed by his labour to the public plenty. They congratulated their masters on the powerful accession of subjects and soldiers, but they forgot to observe that multitudes of secret enemies, insolent from favour or desperate from oppression, were introduced into the heart of the empire. While the Caesars exercised their valour on the banks of the Rhine and Danube, the presence of the emperors was required on the southern confines of the Roman world. From the Nile to Mount Atlas, Africa was in arms. A confederacy of five Moorish nations issued from their deserts to invade the peaceful provinces. Julian had assumed the purple at Carthage, Achilleus at Alexandria, and even the Blemies renewed, or rather continued, their incursion into the Upper Egypt. Scarcely any circumstances have been preserved of the exploits of Maximian in the western parts of Africa, but it appears, by the event, that the progress of his arms was rapid and decisive, that he vanquished the fiercest barbarians of Mauritania, and that he removed them from the mountains, whose inaccessible strength had inspired their inhabitants with a lawless confidence, and habituated them to a life of rapine and violence. Diocletian, on his side, opened the campaign in Egypt by the siege of Alexandria, cut off the aqueducts which conveyed the waters of the Nile into every quarter of that immense city, and, rendering his camp impregnable to the sallies of the besieged multitude, he pushed his reiterated attacks with caution and vigour. After a siege of eight months, Alexandria, wasted by the sword and by fire, implored the clemency of the conqueror, but it experienced the full extent of his severity. Many thousands of the citizens perished in a promiscuous slaughter, and there were few obnoxious persons in Egypt who escaped a sentence either of death or at least of exile. The fate of Busiris and of Coptos was still more melancholy than that of Alexandria. These proud cities, the former distinguished by its antiquity, the latter enriched by the passage of the Indian trade, were utterly destroyed by the arms and by the severe order of Diocletian. The character of the Egyptian nation, insensible to kindness but extremely susceptible of fear, could alone justify this excessive rigour. The seditions of Alexandria had often affected the tranquillity and subsistence of Rome itself, since the usurpation of Firmus, the province of Upper Egypt, incessantly relapsing into rebellion, had embraced the alliance of the savages of Ethiopia. The number of the Blemies, scattered between the island of Meroe and the Red Sea, was very inconsiderable, their disposition was unwarlike, their weapons rude and inoffensive. Yet, in the public disorders, these barbarians, whom antiquity, shocked with the deformity of their figure, had almost excluded from the human species, presumed to rank themselves among the enemies of Rome. Such had been the unworthy allies of the Egyptians, and while the attention of the state was engaged in more serious wars, their vexatious inroads might again harass the repose of the province. 
with a view of opposing to the Blemies a suitable adversary, Diocletian persuaded the Nobati, or people of Nubia, to remove from their ancient habitations in the deserts of Libya, and resigned them to an extensive but unprofitable territory above Syene and the cataracts of the Nile, with the stipulation that they should ever respect and guard the frontier of the empire. The treaty long subsisted, and, till the establishment of Christianity introduced stricter notions of religious worship, it was annually ratified by a solemn sacrifice in the Isle of Elephantine, in which the Romans, as well as the barbarians, adored the same visible or invisible powers of the universe. At the same time that Diocletian chastised the past crimes of the Egyptians, he provided for their future safety and happiness by many wise regulations, which were confirmed and enforced under the succeeding reigns. One very remarkable edict which he published, instead of being condemned as the effect of jealous tyranny, deserves to be applauded as an act of prudence and humanity. He caused a diligent inquiry to be made for all the ancient books which treated of the admirable art of making gold and silver, and without pity committed them to the flames, apprehensive, as we are assumed, lest the opulence of the Egyptians should inspire them with confidence to rebel against the empire. But if Diocletian had been convinced of the reality of that valuable art, far from extinguishing the memory, he would have converted the operation of it to the benefit of the public revenue, it is much more likely that his good sense discovered to him the folly of such magnificent pretensions, and that he was desirous of preserving the reason and fortunes of his subjects from the mischievous pursuit. It may be remarked that these ancient books, so liberally ascribed to Pythagoras, to Solomon, or to Hermes, were the pious frauds of more recent adepts. The Greeks were inattentive either to the use or the abuse of chemistry. In that immense register where Pliny has deposited the discoveries, the arts, and the errors of mankind, there is not the least mention of the transmutation of metals, and the persecution of Diocletian is the first authentic event in the history of alchemy. The conquest of Egypt by the Arabs diffused that vain science over the globe congenial to the avarice of the human heart. It was studied in China, as in Europe, with equal eagerness and with equal success. The darkness of the Middle Ages ensured a favourable reception to every tale of wonder, and the revival of learning gave new vigour to hope, and suggested more specious arts of deception. Philosophy, with the aid of experience, has at length banished the study of alchemy, and the present age, however desirous of riches, is content to seek them by the humbler means of commerce and industry. The reduction of Egypt was immediately followed by the Persian War. It was reserved for the reign of Diocletian to vanquish that powerful nation, and to extort a confession from the successors of Artaxerxes of the superior majesty of the Roman Empire. We have observed that, under the reign of Valerian, Armenia was subdued by the perfidy and the arms of the Persians, and that, after the assassination of Chosroes, his son Tiridates, the infant heir of the monarchy, was saved by the fidelity of his friends, and educated under the protection of the emperors. Tiridates derived from his exile such advantages as he could never have obtained on the throne of Armenia the early knowledge of adversity, of mankind, and of the Roman discipline. He signalised his youth by deeds of valour, and displayed a matchless dexterity as well as strength in every martial exercise, and even in the less honourable contests of the Olympian Games. Those qualities were more notably exerted in the defence of his benefactor Licinius. That officer, in the sedition which occasioned the death of Probus, was exposed to the most imminent danger, and the enraged soldiers were forcing their way into his tent, when they were checked by the single arm of the Armenian prince. The gratitude of Tiridates contributed soon afterwards to his restoration. 
Licinius was in every station the friend and companion of Galerius, and the merit of Galerius, long before he was raised to the dignity of Caesar, had been known and esteemed by Diocletian. In the third year of that emperor's reign, Tiridates was invested with the kingdom of Armenia. The justice of the measure was not less evident than its expediency. It was time to rescue from the usurpation of the Persian monarch an important territory which, since the reign of Nero, had always been granted under the protection of the empire to a younger branch of the house of Asrakes. When Tiridates appeared on the frontiers of Armenia, he was received with an unfeigned transport of joy and loyalty. During twenty-six years the country had experienced the real and imaginary hardships of a foreign yoke. The Persian monarchs adorned their new conquest with magnificent buildings, but those monuments had been erected at the expense of the people, and were abhorred as badges of slavery. The apprehension of a revolt had inspired the most rigorous precautions. Oppression had been aggravated by insult, and the consciousness of the public hatred had been productive of every measure that could render it still more implacable. We have already remarked the intolerant spirit of the Magian religion. The statues of the deified kings of Armenia, and the sacred images of the sun and moon, were broken in pieces by the zeal of the conqueror, and the perpetual fire of Ormuzd was kindled and preserved upon an altar erected on the summit of Mount Bagavan. It was natural that a people, exasperated by so many injuries, should arm with zeal in the cause of their independence, their religion, and their hereditary sovereign. The torrent bore down every obstacle, and the Persian garrisons retreated before its fury. The nobles of Armenia flew to the standard of Tiridates, all alleging their past merit, offering their future service, and soliciting from the new king those honours and rewards from which they had been excluded with disdain under the foreign government. The command of the army was bestowed on Artavasdes, whose father had saved the infancy of Tiridates, and whose family had been massacred for that generous action. The brother of Artavasdes obtained the government of a province. One of the first military dignities was conferred on the satrap Otas, a man of singular temperance and fortitude, who presented to the king his sister and a considerable treasure, both of which, in a sequestered fortress, Otas had preserved from violation. Among the Armenian nobles appeared an ally whose fortunes are too remarkable to pass unnoticed. His name was Mamgo, his origin was Scythian, and the horde which acknowledged his authority had encamped a few years before on the skirts of the Chinese Empire, which at that time extended as far as the neighbourhood of Sogdiana. Having incurred the displeasure of his master, Mamgo, with his followers, retired to the banks of the Oxus, and implored the protection of Sapor. The Emperor of China claimed the fugitive, and alleged rights of sovereignty. The Persian monarch pleaded the laws of hospitality, and with some difficulty avoided a war, by the promise that he would banish Mamgo to the uttermost parts of the West, a punishment, as he described it, not less dreadful than death itself. Armenia was chosen for the place of exile, and a large district was assigned to the Scythian horde, on which they might feed their flocks and herds, and remove their encampment from one place to another, according to the different seasons of the year. They were employed to repel the invasion of Tiridates, but their leader, after weighing the obligations and injuries which he had received from the Persian monarch, resolved to abandon his party. The Armenian prince, who was well acquainted with this merit as well as power of Mamgo, treated him with distinguished respect, and, by admitting him into his confidence, acquired a brave and faithful servant, who contributed very effectually to his restoration. For a while fortune appeared to favour the enterprising valour of Tiridates. He not only expelled the enemies of his family and country from the whole extent of Armenia, but in the prosecution of his revenge he carried his arms, at least his incursions, into the heart of Assyria. 
The historian, who has preserved the name of Tiridates from oblivion, celebrates with a degree of national enthusiasm his personal prowess, and, in the true spirit of Eastern romance, describes the giants and the elephants that fell beneath his invincible arm. It is from other information that we discover the distracted state of the Persian monarchy to which the king of Armenia was indebted for some part of his advantages. The throne was disputed by the ambition of contending brothers, and Hormuz, after exerting without success the strength of his own party, had recourse to the dangerous assistance of the barbarians who inhabited the banks of the Caspian Sea. The civil war was, however, soon terminated, either by a victor or by a reconciliation, and Narses, who was universally acknowledged as king of Persia, directed his whole force against the foreign enemy. The contest then became too unequal, nor was the valour of the hero able to withstand the power of the monarch. Tiridates, a second time expelled from the throne of Armenia, once more took refuge in the court of the emperors. Narses soon re-established his authority over the revolted province, and, loudly complaining of the protection afforded by the Romans to rebels and fugitives, aspired to the conquest of the East. Neither prudence nor honour could permit the emperors to forsake the cause of the Armenian king, and it was resolved to exert the force of the empire in the Persian war. Diocletian, with the calm dignity which he constantly assumed, fixed his own station in the city of Antioch, from whence he prepared and directed the military operations. The conduct of the legions was entrusted to the intrepid valour of Galerius, who, for that important purpose, was removed from the banks of the Danube to those of the Euphrates. The armies soon encountered each other in the plains of Mesopotamia and two battles were fought with various and doubtful success. But the third engagement was of a more decisive nature, and the Roman army received a total overthrow, which is attributed to the rashness of Galerius, who, with an inconsiderable body of troops, attacked the innumerable host of the Persians. But the consideration of the country that was the scene of action may suggest another reason for the defeat. The same ground on which Galerius was vanquished had been rendered memorable by the death of Crassus and the slaughter of ten legions. It was a plain of more than sixty miles, which extended from the hills of Cari to the Euphrates, a smooth and barren surface of sandy desert, without a hillock, without a tree, and without a spring of fresh water. The steady infantry of the Romans, fainting with heat and thirst, could neither hope for victory if they preserved their ranks, nor break their ranks without exposing themselves to the most imminent danger. In this situation they were gradually encompassed by the superior numbers, harassed by the rapid evolutions, and destroyed by the arrows of the barbarian cavalry. The king of Armenia had signalized his valour in the battle, and acquired personal glory by the public misfortune. He was pursued as far as the Euphrates, his horse was wounded, and it appeared impossible for him to escape the victorious enemy. In this extremity Tiridates embraced the only refuge which appeared before him. He dismounted and plunged into the stream. His armour was heavy, the river very deep, and at those parts at least half a mile in breadth. Yet such was his strength and dexterity that he reached in safety the opposite bank. With regard to the Roman general, we are ignorant of the circumstances of his escape, but when he returned to Antioch Diocletian received him not with the tenderness of a friend and colleague, but with the indignation of an offended sovereign. The haughtiest of men, clothed in his purple, but humbled by the sense of his fault and misfortune, was obliged to follow the emperor's chariot above a mile on foot, and to exhibit before the whole court the spectacle of his disgrace. As soon as Diocletian had indulged his private resentment, and asserted the majesty of supreme power, he yielded to the submissive entreaties of the Caesar, and permitted him to retrieve his own honour as well as that of the Roman arms. 
In the room of the unwarlike troops of Asia, which had most probably served in the first expedition, a second army was drawn from the veterans and new levies of the Illyrian frontier, and a considerable body of Gothic auxiliaries was taken into the imperial pay. At the head of a chosen army of twenty-five thousand men, Galerius again passed the Euphrates, but, instead of exposing his legions in the open plains of Mesopotamia, he advanced through the mountains of Armenia, where he found the inhabitants devoted to his cause, and the country as favourable to the operations of infantry as it was inconvenient for the motions of cavalry. Adversity had confirmed the Roman discipline, while the barbarians, elated by success, were become so negligent and remiss, that in the moment when they least expected it, they were surprised by the active conduct of Galerius, who, attended only by two horsemen, had with his own eyes secretly examined the state and position of their camp. A surprise, especially in the night-time, was for the most part fatal to a Persian army. Their horses were tied, and generally shackled, to prevent their running away, and, if an alarm happened, a Persian had his housing to fix, his horse to bridle, and his corslet to put on before he could mount. On this occasion, the impetuous attack of Galerius spread disorder and dismay over the camp of the barbarians. A slight resistance was followed by a dreadful carnage, and, in the general confusion, the wounded monarch—for Narses commanded his armies in person— fled towards the deserts of Media. His sumptuous tents, and those of his satraps, afforded an immense booty to the conqueror, and an incident is mentioned which proves the rustic but martial ignorance of the legions in the elegant superfluities of life. A bag of shining leather, filled with pearls, fell into the hands of a private soldier. He carefully preserved the bag but he threw away its contents, judging that whatever was of no use could not possibly be of any value. The principal loss of Narses was of a much more affecting nature. Several of his wives, his sisters, and children, who had attended the army, were made captives in the defeat. But, though the character of Galerius had, in general, very little affinity with that of Alexander, he imitated, after his victory, the amiable behaviour of the Macedonian towards the family of Darius. The wives and children of Narses were protected from violence and rapine, conveyed to a place of safety, and treated with every mark of respect and tenderness that was due from a generous enemy to their age, their sex, and their royal dignity. End of chapter 13, part 2「Thirteen, Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirteen, The Reign of Diocletian and His Three Associates, Part Three. While the East anxiously expected the decision of this great contest, the Emperor Diocletian, having assembled in Syria a strong army of observation, displayed from a distance the resources of the Roman power, and reserved himself for any future emergency of the war. On the intelligence of the victory he condescended to advance towards the frontier, with a view of moderating, by his presence and counsels, the pride of Galerius. The interview of the Roman princes at Nisibis was accompanied with every expression of respect on one side, and of esteem on the other. It was in that city that they soon afterwards gave audience to the ambassador of the great king. The power, or at least the spirit, of Narses had been broken by his last defeat, and he considered an immediate peace as the only means that could stop the progress of the Roman arms. He dispatched Afarban, a servant who possessed his favour and confidence, with a commission to negotiate a treaty, or rather to receive whatever conditions the conqueror should impose. Afarban opened the conference by expressing his master's gratitude for the generous treatment of his family, 
and by soliciting the liberty of those illustrious captives. He celebrated the valour of Galerius, without degrading the reputation of Narses, and thought it no dishonour to confess the superiority of the victorious Caesar, over a monarch who had surpassed in glory all the princes of his race. Notwithstanding the justice of the Persian cause, he was empowered to submit the present differences to the decision of the emperors themselves, convinced as he was that in the midst of prosperity they would not be unmindful of the vicissitudes of fortune. Afarban concluded his discourse in the style of Eastern allegory, by observing that the Roman and Persian monarchies were the two eyes of the world which would remain imperfect and mutilated if either of them should be put out. "'It well becomes the Persians,' replied Galerius, with a transport of fury which seemed to convulse his whole frame, it well becomes the Persians to expiate on the vicissitudes of fortune, and calmly to read us lectures on the virtues of moderation. Let them remember their own moderation towards the unhappy Valerian. They vanquished him by fraud, they treated him with indignity, they detained him till the last moment of his life in shameful captivity, and after his death they exposed his body to perpetual ignominy. Softening, however, his tone, Galerius insinuated to the ambassador that it had never been the practice of the Romans to trample on a prostrate enemy, and that on this occasion they should consult their own dignity rather than the Persian merit. He dismissed Aphaban with a hope that Narses would soon be informed on what conditions he might obtain from the clemency of the emperors a lasting peace, and the restoration of his wives and children. In this conference we may discover the fierce passions of Galerius, as well as his deference to the superior wisdom and authority of Diocletian. The ambition of the former grasped at the conquest of the East, and had proposed to reduce Persia into the state of a province. The prudence of the latter, who adhered to the moderate policy of Augustus and the Antonines, embraced the favourable opportunity of terminating a successful war by an honourable and advantageous peace. In pursuance of their promise, the emperors soon afterwards appointed Sicorius Probus, one of their secretaries, to acquaint the Persian court with their final resolution. As the minister of peace he was received with every mark of politeness and friendship, but under the pretence of allowing him the necessary repose after so long a journey, the audience of Probus was deferred from day to day, and he attended the slow motions of the king till at length he was admitted to his presence near the river Asprudus in Media. The secret motive of Narses in this delay had been to collect such a military force as might enable him, though sincerely desirous of peace, to negotiate with the greater weight and dignity. Three persons only assisted at this important conference, the minister, Aphaban, the prefect of the guards, and an officer who had commanded on the Armenian frontier. The first condition proposed by the ambassador is not at present of a very intelligible nature, that the city of Nisibis might be established for the place of mutual exchange, or, as we should formerly have termed it, for the staple of trade between the two empires. There is no difficulty in conceiving the intention of the Roman princes to improve their revenue by some restraints upon commerce, but as Nisibis was situated within their own dominions, and as they were masters both of the imports and exports, it should seem that such restraints were the objects of an internal law rather than a foreign treaty. To render them more effectual, some stipulations were probably required on the side of the King of Persia, which appeared so very repugnant either to his interest or to his dignity that Narses could not be persuaded to subscribe them. As this was the only article to which he refused his consent, it was no longer insisted on, and the emperors either suffered the trade to flow in its natural channels, or contented themselves with such restrictions as it depended on their own authority to establish. As soon as this difficulty was removed, a solemn peace was concluded and ratified between the two nations. The conditions of a treaty so glorious to the empire and so necessary to Persia may deserve a more peculiar attention, as the history of Rome presents very few transactions of a similar nature, most of her wars having either been terminated by absolute conquest or waged against barbarians ignorant of the use of letters. 
The Aboras, or, as it is called by Xenophon, the Araxes, was fixed as the boundary between the two monarchies. That river, which rose near the Tigris, was increased a few miles below Nisibis by the little stream of the Mygdonius, passed under the walls of Singara, and fell into the Euphrates, at Circasium, a frontier town which, by the care of Diocletian, was very strongly fortified. Mesopotamia, the object of so many wars, was ceded to the empire, and the Persians, by this treaty, renounced all pretensions to that great province. They relinquished to the Romans five provinces beyond the Tigris. Their situation formed a very useful barrier, and the natural strength was soon improved by art and military skill. Four of these, to the north of the river, were districts of obscure fame and inconsiderable extent. Intilini, Zabdikini, Artzanini, and Moxoini. But on the east of the Tigris the empire acquired the large and mountainous territory of Carduini, the ancient seat of the Carducians, who preserved for many ages their manly freedom in the heart of the despotic monarchies of Asia. The ten thousand Greeks traversed their country, after a painful march, or rather engagement, of seven days, and it is confessed by their leader, in his uncomparable relation of the retreat, that they suffered more from the arrows of the Carducians than from the power of the great king. Their posterity, the Kurds, with very little alteration either of name or manners, acknowledge the nominal sovereignty of the Turkish sultan. It is almost needless to observe that Tiridates, the faithful ally of Rome, was restored to the throne of his fathers, and that the rights of the imperial supremacy were fully asserted and secured. The limits of Armenia were extended as far as the fortress of Cintha in Media, and this increase of dominion was not so much an act of liberality as of justice. Of the provinces already mentioned beyond the Tigris, the first four had been dismembered by the Parthians from the crown of Armenia, and when the Romans acquired the possession of them, they stipulated, at the expense of the usurpers, an ample compensation, which invested their ally with the extensive and fertile country of Atropatini. Its principal city, in the same situation perhaps as the modern Tauris, was frequently honoured by the residence of Tiridates and, as it sometimes bore the name of Ekbatana, he imitated, in the buildings and fortifications, the splendid capital of the Medes. The country of Iberia was barren, its inhabitants rude and savage, but they were accustomed to the use of arms, and they separated from the empire barbarians much fiercer and more formidable than themselves. The narrow defiles of Mount Caucasus were in their hands, and it was in their choice either to admit or exclude the wandering tribes of Sarmatia, whenever a rapacious spirit urged them to penetrate into the richer climes of the south. The nomination of the kings of Iberia, which was resigned by the Persian monarch to the emperors, contributed to the strength and security of the Roman power in Asia. The east enjoyed a profound tranquillity during forty years and the treaty between the rival monarchies was strictly observed until the death of Tiridates, when a new generation, animated with different views and different passions, succeeded to the government of the world, and the grandson of Narses undertook a long and memorable war against the princes of the house of Constantine. The arduous work of rescuing the distressed empire from tyrants and barbarians had now been completely achieved by a succession of Illyrian peasants. As soon as Diocletian entered into the twentieth year of his reign, he celebrated that memorable ira as well as the success of his arms by the pomp of a Roman triumph. Maximian, the equal partner of his power, was his only companion in the glory of that day. Two Caesars had fought and conquered, but the merit of their exploits was ascribed, according to the rigour of ancient maxims, to the auspicious influence of their fathers and emperors. The triumph of Diocletian and Maximian was less magnificent, perhaps, than those of Aurelian and Probus, but it was dignified by several circumstances of superior fame and good fortune. Africa and Britain, the Rhine, the Danube, and the Nile furnished their respective trophies, 
but the most distinguished ornament was of a more singular nature, a Persian victory followed by an important conquest. The representations of rivers, mountains, and provinces were carried before the imperial car. The images of the captive wives, the sisters, and the children of the great king afforded a new and grateful spectacle to the vanity of the people. In the eyes of posterity this triumph is remarkable by a distinction of a less honourable kind. It was the last that Rome ever beheld. Soon after this period the emperors ceased to vanquish, and Rome ceased to be the capital of the empire. The spot on which Rome was founded had been consecrated by ancient ceremonies and imaginary miracles. The presence of some god or the memory of some hero seemed to animate every part of the city, and the empire of the world had been promised to the capital. The native Romans felt and confessed the power of this agreeable illusion. It was derived from their ancestors, had grown up with their earliest habits of life, and was protected in some measure by the opinion of political utility. The form and the seat of government were intimately blended together, nor was it esteemed possible to transport the one without destroying the other. But the sovereignty of the capital was gradually annihilated in the extent of conquest, the provinces rose to the same level, and the vanquished nations acquired the name and privileges without imbibing the partial affections of Romans. During a long period, however, the remains of the ancient constitution and the influence of custom preserved the dignity of Rome. The emperors, though perhaps of African or Illyrian extraction, respected their adopted country as the seat of their power and the centre of their extensive dominions. The emergencies of war very frequently required their presence on the frontiers, but Diocletian and Maximian were the first Roman princes who fixed, in time of peace, their ordinary residence in the provinces, and their conduct, however it might be suggested by private motives, was justified by very specious considerations of policy. The court of the Emperor of the West was, for the most part, established at Milan whose situation at the foot of the Alps appeared far more convenient than that of Rome, for the important purpose of watching the motions of the barbarians of Germany. Milan soon assumed the splendour of an imperial city. The houses are described as numerous and well-built, the manners of the people as polished and liberal. A circus, a theatre, a mint, a palace, baths which bore the name of their founder Maximian, porticoes adorned with statues, and a double circumference of walls contributed to the beauty of the new capital. Nor did it seem oppressed even by the proximity of Rome. To rival the majesty of Rome was an ambitious likewise of Diocletian, who employed his leisure and the wealth of the East in the embellishment of Nicomedia, a city placed on the verge of Europe and Asia, almost an equal distance between the Danube and the Euphrates by the taste of the monarch, and at the expense of the people, Nicomedia acquired in the space of a few years a degree of magnificence which might appear to have required the labour of ages, and became inferior only to Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch in extent of populousness. The life of Diocletian and Maximian was a life of action, and a considerable portion of it was spent in camps, or in the long and frequent marches, but whenever the public business allowed them any relaxation they seemed to have retired with pleasure to their favourite residences of Nicomedia and Milan. Till Diocletian, in the twentieth year of his reign, celebrated his Roman triumph, it is extremely doubtful whether he ever visited the ancient capital of the empire. Even on that memorable occasion his stay did not exceed two months. Disgusted with the licentious familiarity of the people, he quitted Rome with precipitation thirteen days before it was expected that he should have appeared in the Senate, invested with the ensigns of the consular dignity. The dislike expressed by Diocletian towards Rome, and Roman freedom, was not the effect of momentary caprice, but the result of the most artful policy. 
that crafty prince had framed a new system of imperial government, which was afterwards completed by the family of Constantine, and, as the image of the old constitution was religiously preserved in the Senate, he resolved to deprive that order of its small remains of power and consideration. We may recollect, about eight years before the elevation, of Diocletian the transient greatness and the ambitious hopes of the Roman Senate. As long as that enthusiasm prevailed, many of the nobles imprudently displayed their zeal in the cause of freedom, and, after the successes of Probus had withdrawn their countenance from the Republican party, the senators were unable to disguise their impotent resentment. As the sovereign of Italy, Maximian was entrusted with the care of extinguishing this troublesome rather than dangerous spirit, and the task was perfectly suited to his cruel temper. The most illustrious members of the Senate, whom Diocletian always affected to esteem, were involved by his colleague in the accusation of imaginary plots, and the possession of an elegant villa or a well-cultivated estate was interpreted as a convincing evidence of guilt. The camp of the Praetorians, which had so long oppressed, began to protect the majesty of Rome, and as those haughty troops were conscious of the decline of their power, they were naturally disposed to unite their strength with the authority of the Senate. By the prudent measures of Diocletian, the numbers of the Praetorians were insensibly reduced, their privileges abolished, and their place supplied by two faithful legions of Illyricum, who, under the new titles of Jovians and Herculeans, were appointed to perform the service of the imperial guards. But the most fatal, though secret, wound which the Senate received from the hands of Diocletian and Maximian was inflicted by the inevitable operation of their absence. As long as the emperors resided at Rome, that assembly might be oppressed, but it could scarcely be neglected. The successors of Augustus exercised the power of dictating whatever laws their wisdom or caprice might suggest, but those laws were ratified by the sanction of the Senate. The model of ancient freedom was preserved in its deliberations and decrees, and wise princes, who respected the prejudices of the Roman people, were in some measure obliged to assume the language and behaviour suitable to the general and first magistrate of the Republic. In the armies, and in the provinces, they displayed the dignity of monarchs, and when they fixed their residence at a distance from the capital, they for ever laid aside the dissimulation which Augustus had recommended to his successors. In the exercise of the legislative as well as the executive power, the sovereign advised with his ministers, instead of consulting the great council of the nation. The name of the Senate was mentioned with honour till the last period of the empire. The vanity of its members was still flattered with honorary distinctions, but the assembly which had so long been the source, and so long the instrument of power, was respectfully suffered to sink into oblivion. The Senate of Rome, losing all connection with the imperial court and the actual constitution, was left a venerable but useless monument of antiquity on the Capitoline Hill. End of chapter 13, part 3《十三》Part IV of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When the Roman princes had lost sight of the Senate and of their ancient capital, they easily forgot the origin and nature of their legal power. The civil offices of consul, of proconsul, of censor, and of tribune, by the union of which it had been formed, betrayed to the people its republican extraction. Those modest titles were laid aside, and if they still distinguished their high station by the appellation of emperor or imperator, that word was understood in a new and more dignified sense, and no longer denoted the general of the Roman armies but the sovereign of the Roman world. 
The name of Emperor, which was at first of a military nature, was associated with another of a more servile kind. The epithet of Dominus, or Lord, in its primitive signification, was expressive not of the authority of a prince over his subjects, or of a commander over his soldiers, but of the despotic power of a master over his domestic slaves. Viewing it in that odious light, it had been rejected with abhorrence by the first Caesars. Their resistance insensibly became more feeble, and the name less odious, till at length the style of our Lord and Emperor was not only bestowed by flattery, but was regularly admitted into the laws and public monuments. Such lofty epithets were sufficient to elate and satisfy the most excessive vanity, and if the successors of Diocletian still declined the title of king, it seems to have been the effect, not so much of their moderation, as of their delicacy. Wherever the Latin tongue was in use, and it was the language of government throughout the empire, the imperial title, as it was peculiar to themselves, conveyed a more respectable idea than the name of king, which they must have shared with a hundred barbarian chieftains, or which, at the best, they could derive only from Romulus, or from Tarquin. But the sentiments of the East were very different from those of the West. From the earliest period of history the sovereigns of Asia had been celebrated in the Greek language by the title of Basileus, or King, and, since it was considered as the first distinction among men, it was soon employed by the servile provincials of the East in their humble addresses to the Roman throne. Even the attributes, or at least the titles, of the divinity were usurped by Diocletian and Maximian, who transmitted them to a succession of Christian emperors. Such extravagant compliments, however, soon lose their impiety by losing their meaning, and when the ear is once accustomed to the sound, they are heard with indifference, as vague, though excessive, professions of respect. From the time of Augustus to that of Diocletian, the Roman princes, conversing in a familiar manner among their fellow-citizens, were saluted only with the same respect that was usually paid to senators and magistrates. Their principal distinction was the imperial or military robe of purple, whilst the senatorial garment was marked by a broad and the equestrian by a narrow band or stripe of the same honourable colour. The pride, or rather the policy, of Diocletian engaged that artful prince to introduce the stately magnificence of the court of Persia. He ventured to assume the diadem, an ornament detested by the Romans as the odious ensign of royalty, and the use of which had been considered as the most desperate act of the madness of Caligula. It was no more than a broad white fillet set with pearls which encircled the emperor's head. The sumptuous robes of Diocletian and his successors were of silk and gold, and it is remarked with indignation that even their shoes were studded with the most precious gems. The access to their sacred person was every day rendered more difficult by the institution of new forms and ceremonies. The avenues of the palace were strictly guarded by the various schools, as they began to be called, of domestic officers. The interior apartments were entrusted to the jealous vigilance of the eunuchs, the increase of whose numbers and influence was the most infallible symptom of the progress of despotism. When a subject was at length admitted to the imperial presence, he was obliged, whatever might be his rank, to fall prostrate on the ground, and to adore, according to the eastern fashion, the divinity of his lord and master. Diocletian was a man of sense, who, in the course of private as well as public life, had formed a just estimate both of himself and of mankind nor is it easy to conceive that, in substituting the manners of Persia to those of Rome, he was seriously actuated by so mean a principle as that of vanity. 
he flattered himself that an ostentation of splendour and luxury would subdue the imagination of the multitude, that the monarch would be less exposed to the rude licence of the people and the soldiers, as his person was secluded from the public view, and that the habits of submission would insensibly be productive of sentiments of veneration. Like the modesty affected by Augustus, the state maintained by Diocletian was a theatrical representation, but it must be confessed that of the two comedies the former was of a much more liberal and manly character than the latter. It was the aim of the one to disguise, and the object of the other to display the unbounded power which the emperors possessed over the Roman world. Ostentation was the first principle of the new system instituted by Diocletian. The second was division. He divided the empire, the provinces, and every branch of the civil as well as military administration. He multiplied the wheels of the machine of government, and rendered its operations less rapid, but more secure. Whatever advantages and whatever defects might attend these innovations, they must be ascribed in a very great degree to the first inventor. But, as the new frame of policy was gradually improved and completed by succeeding princes, it will be more satisfactory to delay the consideration of it till the season of its full maturity and perfection. Reserving, therefore, for the reign of Constantine a more exact picture of the new empire, we shall consent ourselves with describing the principal and decisive outline, as it was traced by the hand of Diocletian. He had associated three colleagues in the exercise of the supreme power, and, as he was convinced that the abilities of a single man were inadequate to the public defence, he considered the joint administration of four princes not as a temporary expedient, but as a fundamental law of the constitution. It was his intention that the two elder princes should be distinguished by the use of the diadem, and the title of Augusti, that, as affection or esteem might direct their choice, they should regularly call to their assistance two subordinate colleagues, and that the Caesars, rising in their turn to the first rank, should supply an uninterrupted succession of emperors. The empire was divided into four parts. The East and Italy were the most honourable, the Danube and the Rhine the most laborious stations. The former claimed the presence of the Augusti, the latter were entrusted to the administration of the Caesars. The strength of the legions was in the hands of the four partners of sovereignty and the despair of successively vanquishing four formidable rivals might intimidate the ambition of an aspiring general. In their civil government the emperors were supposed to exercise the undivided power of the monarch, and their edicts, inscribed with their joint names, were received in all the provinces, as promulgated by their mutual councils and authority. Notwithstanding these precautions, the political union of the Roman world was gradually dissolved, and a principle of division was introduced, which, in the course of a few years, occasioned the perpetual separation of the eastern and western empires. The system of Diocletian was accompanied with another very material disadvantage, which cannot even at present be totally overlooked a more expensive establishment, and consequently an increase of taxes and the oppression of the people. Instead of a modest family of slaves and freedmen such as had contented the simple greatness of Augustus and Trajan, three or four magnificent courts were established in the various parts of the empire, and as many Roman kings contended with each other and with the Persian monarch for the vain superiority of pomp and luxury. The number of ministers, of magistrates, of officers, and of servants, who filled the different departments of the state, was multiplied beyond the example of former times, and, if we may borrow the warm expression of a contemporary, when the proportion of those who received exceeded the proportion of those who contributed, the provinces were oppressed by the weight of tributes. 
from this period to the extinction of the empire it would be easy to deduce an uninterrupted series of clamours and complaints according to his religion and situation each writer chooses either diocletian or constantine or valens or theodosius for the object of his invectives but they unanimously agree in representing the burden of the public impositions and particularly the land tax and capitation as the intolerable and increasing grievance of their own times from such a concurrence an impartial historian who is obliged to extract truth from satire as well as from panegyric will be inclined to divide the blame among the princes whom they accuse and to ascribe their exactions much less to their personal vices than to the uniform system of their administration the emperor diocletian was indeed the author of that system but during his reign the growing evil was confined within the bounds of modesty and discretion and he deserves the reproach of establishing pernicious precedents rather than of exercising actual oppression it may be added that his revenues were managed with prudent economy and that after all the current expenses were discharged there still remained in the imperial treasury an ample provision either for judicious liberality or for any emergency of the state it was in the twenty-first year of his reign that diocletian executed his memorable resolution of abdicating the empire an action more naturally to have been expected from the elder or the younger antoninus than from a prince who had never practised the lessons of philosophy either in the attainment or in the use of supreme power diocletian acquired the glory of giving to the world the first example of a resignation which has not been very frequently imitated by succeeding monarchs the parallel of charles v however will naturally offer itself to our mind not only since the eloquence of a modern historian has rendered that name so familiar to an english reader but from the very striking resemblance between the characters of the two emperors whose political abilities were superior to their military genius and whose specious virtues were much less the effect of nature than of art the abdication of charles appears to have been hastened by the vicissitude of fortune and the disappointment of his favourite schemes urged him to relinquish a power which he found inadequate to his ambition but the reign of diocletian had flowed with a tide of uninterrupted success nor was it till after he had vanquished all his enemies and accomplished all his designs that he seems to have entertained any serious thoughts of resigning the empire neither charles nor diocletian were arrived at a very advanced period of life since the one was only fifty-five and the other was no more than fifty-nine years of age but the active life of those princes their wars and journeys the cares of royalty and their application to business had already impaired their constitution and brought on the infirmities of a premature old age notwithstanding the severity of a very cold and rainy winter diocletian left italy soon after the ceremony of his triumph and began his progress towards the east round the circuit of the illyrian provinces from the inclemency of the weather and the fatigue of the journey he soon contracted a slow illness and though he made easy marches and was generally carried in a close litter his disorder before he arrived at nicomedia about the end of the summer was become very serious and alarming during the whole winter he was confined to his palace his danger inspired a general and unaffected concern but the people could only judge of the various alterations of his health from the joy or consternation which they discovered in the countenances and behaviour of his attendants. The rumour of his death was for some time universally believed, and it was supposed to be concealed with a view to prevent the troubles that might have happened during the absence of the Caesar Galerius. At length, however, on the first of March, Diocletian once more appeared in public, but so pale and emaciated that he could scarcely have been recognised by those to whom his person was the most familiar. 
it was time to put an end to the painful struggle which he had sustained during more than a year between the care of his health and that of his dignity. The former required indulgence and relaxation. The latter compelled him to direct from the bed of sickness the administration of a great empire. He resolved to pass the remainder of his days in honourable repose, to place his glory beyond the reach of fortune, and to relinquish the theatre of the world to his younger and more active associates. The ceremony of his abdication was performed in a spacious plain about three miles from Nicomedia. The Emperor ascended a lofty throne, and, in a speech full of reason and dignity, declared his intention both to the people and to the soldiers who were assembled on this extraordinary occasion. As soon as he had divested himself of the purple, he withdrew from the gazing multitude, and, traversing the city in a covered chariot, proceeded without delay to the favourite retirement which he had chosen in his native country of Dalmatia. On the same day, which was the first of May, Maximian, as it had been previously concerted, made his resignation of the imperial dignity at Milan. Even in the splendour of the Roman triumph, Diocletian had meditated his design of abdicating the government. As he wished to secure the obedience of Maximian, he extracted from him either a general assurance that he would submit his actions to the authority of his benefactor, or a particular promise that he would descend from the throne whenever he should receive the advice and the example. This engagement, though it was confirmed by the solemnity of an oath before the altar of the Capitoline Jupiter, would have proved a feeble restraint on the fierce temper of Maximian, whose passion was the love of power, and who neither desired present tranquillity nor future reputation. But he yielded, however reluctantly, to the ascendant which his wiser colleague had acquired over him, and retired, almost immediately after his abdication, to a villa in Lucania, where it was almost impossible that such an impatient spirit could find any lasting tranquillity. Diocletian, who, from a servile origin, had raised himself to the throne, passed the nine last years of his life in a private condition. Reason had dictated and content seems to have accompanied his retreat, in which he enjoyed for a long time the respect of those princes to whom he had resigned the possession of the world. It is seldom that minds long exercised in business have formed the habits of conversing with themselves, and in the loss of power they principally regret the want of occupation. The amusements of letters and of devotion which afford so many resources in solitude were incapable of fixing the attention of Diocletian, but he had preserved, or at least he soon recovered, a taste for the most innocent as well as natural pleasures, and his leisure hours were sufficiently employed in building, planting, and gardening. His answer to Maximian is deservedly celebrated. He was solicited by that restless old man to reassume the reins of government and the imperial purple. He rejected the temptation with a smile of pity, calmly observing that if he could show Maximian the cabbages which he had planted with his own hands at Salona, he should no longer be urged to relinquish the enjoyment of happiness for the pursuit of power. In his conversations with his friends he frequently acknowledged that, of all arts, the most difficult was the art of reigning, and he expressed himself on that favourite topic with a degree of warmth which could be the result only of experience. How often, was he accustomed to say, is it the interest of four or five ministers to combine together to deceive their sovereign? secluded from mankind by his exalted dignity the truth is concealed from his knowledge he can see only with their eyes he hears nothing but their misrepresentations he confers the most important offices upon vice and weakness and disgraces the most virtuous and deserving among his subjects by such infamous arts 
added Diocletian, the best and wisest princes are sold to the venal corruption of their courtiers. A just estimate of greatness, and the assurance of immortal fame, improve our relish for the pleasures of retirement, but the Roman Emperor had filled too important a character in the world to enjoy without alloy the comforts and security of a private condition. It was impossible that he could remain ignorant of the troubles which afflicted the empire after his abdication. It was impossible that he could be indifferent to their consequences. Fear, sorrow, and discontent sometimes pursued him into the solitude of Salona. His tenderness, or at least his pride, was deeply wounded by the misfortunes of his wife and daughter, and the last moments of Diocletian were embittered by some affronts which Licinius and Constantine might have spared the father of so many emperors, and the first author of their own fortune. A report, though of a very doubtful nature, has reached our times, that he prudently withdrew himself from their power by a voluntary death. Before we dismiss the consideration of the life and character of Diocletian, we may for a moment direct our view to the place of his retirement. Salona, a principal city of his native province of Dalmatia, was near two hundred Roman miles, according to the measurement of the public highways, from Aquileia and the confines of Italy, and about two hundred and seventy from Sirmium, the usual residence of the emperors whenever they visited the Illyrian frontier. A miserable village still preserves the name of Salona. But so late as the sixteenth century the remains of a theatre, and a confused prospect of broken arches and marble columns, continued to attest its ancient splendour. About six or seven miles from the city, Diocletian constructed a magnificent palace, and we may infer from the greatness of the work how long he had meditated his design of abdicating the empire. The choice of a spot which united all that could contribute either to health or to luxury did not require the partiality of a native. The soil was dry and fertile, the air is pure and wholesome, and, though extremely hot during the summer months, this country seldom feels those sultry and noxious winds to which the coasts of Istria and some parts of Italy are exposed. The views from the palace are no less beautiful than the soil and climate were inviting. Towards the west lies the fertile shore that stretches along the Adriatic, in which a number of small islands are scattered in such a manner as to give this part of the sea the appearance of a great lake. On the north side lies the bay, which led to the ancient city of Salona and the country beyond it, appearing in sight, forms a proper contrast to that more extensive prospect of water which the Adriatic presents, both to the south and to the east. Towards the north the view is terminated by high and irregular mountains, situated at a proper distance, and in many places covered with villages, woods, and vineyards. Though Constantine, from a very obvious prejudice, affects to mention the palace of Diocletian with contempt, yet one of their successors, who could only see it in a neglected and mutilated state, celebrates its magnificence in terms of the highest admiration. It covered an extent of ground consisting of between nine and ten English acres. The form was quadrangular, flanked with sixteen towers. Two of the sides were near six hundred, and the other two near seven hundred feet in length. The whole was constructed of a beautiful freestone, extracted from the neighbouring quarries of Trau, or Tragutium, and very little inferior to marble itself. Four streets, intersecting each other at right angles, divided the several parts of this great edifice, and the approach to the principal apartment was from a very stately entrance, which is still denominated the Golden Gate. The approach was terminated by a peristylium of granite columns, on one side of which we discover the square temple of Aesculapius, and on the other the octagon temple of Jupiter. The latter of those deities Diocletian revered as the patron of his fortunes. 
the former as the protector of his health. By comparing the present remains with the precepts of Vitruvius, the several parts of the building, the baths, bedchamber, the atrium, the basilica, and the Syzicini, Corinthian, and Egyptian halls, have been described with some degree of precision, or at least of probability. Their forms were various, their proportions just, but they were all attended with two imperfections very repugnant to our modern notions of taste and conveniency. These stately rooms had neither windows nor chimneys. They were lighted from the top, for the building seems to have consisted of no more than one story, and they received their heat by the help of pipes that were conveyed along the walls. The range of principal apartments was protected towards the south-west by a portico five hundred and seventeen feet long, which must have formed a very noble and delightful walk when the beauties of painting and sculpture were added to those of the prospect. Had this magnificent edifice remained in a solitary country, it would have been exposed to the ravages of time, but it might, perhaps, have escaped the rapacious industry of man. The village of Aspalathus, and long afterwards the provincial town of Spalatro, have grown out of its ruins. The Golden Gate now opens into the market-place. St. John the Baptist has usurped the honours of Esculapius, and the Temple of Jupiter, under the protection of the Virgin, is converted into the cathedral church. For this account of Diocletian's palace, we are principally indebted to an ingenious artist of our own time and country, whom a very liberal curiosity carried into the heart of Dalmatia. But there is room to suspect that the elegance of his designs and engraving has somewhat flattered the objects which it was their purpose to represent. We are informed by a more recent and very judicious traveller that the awful ruins of Spalatro are not less expressive of the decline of the art than of the greatness of the Roman Empire at the time of Diocletian. If such was indeed the state of architecture, we must naturally believe that painting and sculpture had experienced a still more sensible decay. The practice of architecture is directed by a few general and even mechanical rules, but sculpture, and above all painting, propose to themselves the imitation not only of the forms of nature, but of the characters and passions of the human soul. In those sublime arts the dexterity of the hand is of little avail, unless it is animated by fancy, and guided by the most correct taste and observation. It is almost unnecessary to remark that the civil distractions of the empire, the license of the soldiers, the inroads of the barbarians, and the progress of despotism, had proved very unfavourable to genius and even to learning. The succession of Illyrian princes restored the empire without restoring the sciences. Their military education was not calculated to inspire them with the love of letters, and even the mind of Diocletian, however active and capacious in business, was totally uninformed by study or speculation. The professions of law and physic are of such common use and certain profit that they will always secure a sufficient number of practitioners, endowed with a reasonable degree of abilities and knowledge but it does not appear that the students in those two faculties appeal to any celebrated masters who have flourished within that period. The voice of poetry was silent. History was reduced to dry and confused abridgments, alike destitute of amusement and instruction. A languid and affected eloquence was still retained in the pay and service of the emperors, who encouraged not any arts except those which contributed to the gratification of their pride, or the defence of their power. The declining age of learning and of mankind is marked, however, by the rise and rapid progress of the new Platonists. 
the school of Alexandria silenced those of Athens, and the ancient sects enrolled themselves under the banners of the more fashionable teachers, who recommended their system by the novelty of their method and by the austerity of their manners. Several of these masters, Ammonius, Plotinus, Amelius, and Porphyry, were men of profound thought and intense application. But, by mistaking the true object of philosophy, their labours contributed much less to improve than to corrupt the human understanding. The knowledge that is suited to our situation and powers, the whole compass of moral, natural, and mathematical science, was neglected by the new Platonists, whilst they exhausted their strength in the verbal disputes of metaphysics, attempted to explore the secrets of the invisible world, and studied to reconcile Aristotle with Plato, on subjects of which both these philosophers were as ignorant as the rest of mankind. Consuming their reason in these deep but unsubstantial meditations, their minds were exposed to illusions of fancy. They flattered themselves that they possessed the secret of disengaging the soul from its corporal prison, claimed a familiar intercourse with demons and spirits, and, by a very singular revolution, converted the study of philosophy into that of magic. The ancient sages had derided the popular superstition. After disguising its extravagance by the thin pretense of allegory, the disciples of Plotinus and Porphyry became its most zealous defenders. As they agreed with the Christians in a few mysterious points of faith, they attacked the remainder of their theological system with all the fury of civil war. The new Platonists would scarcely deserve a place in the history of science, but in that of the Church the mention of them will very frequently occur. End of chapter 13, part 4「Chapter 14, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14, Six Emperors at the Same Time, Reunion of the Empire, Part 1. Troubles after the abdication of Diocletian, death of Constantius, elevation of Constantine and Maxentius, six emperors at the same time, death of Maximian and Galerius, victories of Constantine over Maxentius and Licinus, reunion of the empire under the authority of Constantine. The balance of power established by Diocletian subsisted no longer than while it was sustained by the firm and dexterous hand of the founder. It required such a fortunate mixture of different tempers and abilities as could scarcely be found or even expected a second time. Two emperors without jealousy, two Caesars without ambition, and the same general interest invariably pursued by four independent princes. The abdication of Diocletian and Maximian was succeeded by eighteen years of discord and confusion. The empire was afflicted by five civil wars, and the remainder of the time was not so much a state of tranquillity as a suspension of arms between several hostile monarchs, who, viewing each other with an eye of fear and hatred, strove to increase their respective forces at the expense of their subjects. As soon as Diocletian and Maximian had resigned the purple, their station, according to the rules of the new constitution, was filled by the two Caesars, Constantius and Galerius, who immediately assumed the title of Augustus. The honours of seniority and precedence were allowed to the former of those princes, and he continued under a new appellation to administer his ancient department of Gaul, Spain, and Britain. The government of those ample provinces was sufficient to exercise his talents and to satisfy his ambition. Clemency, temperance, and moderation distinguished the amiable character of Constantius, 
and his fortunate subjects had frequently occasion to compare the virtues of their sovereign with the passions of Maximian, and even with the arts of Diocletian. Instead of imitating their eastern pride and magnificence, Constantius preserved the modesty of a Roman prince. He declared, with unaffected sincerity, that his most valued treasure was in the hearts of his people, and that, whenever the dignity of the throne or the danger of the state required any extraordinary supply, he could depend with confidence on their gratitude and liberality. The provincials of Gaul, Spain, and Britain, sensible of his worth and of their own happiness, reflected with anxiety on the declining health of the Emperor Constantius, and the tender age of his numerous family, the issue of his second marriage with the daughter of Maximian. The stern temper of Galerius was cast in a very different mould, and while he commanded the esteem of his subjects, he seldom condescended to solicit their affections. His fame in arms, and above all the success of the Persian war, had elated his haughty mind, which was naturally impatient of a superior, or even of an equal. If it were possible to rely on the partial testimony of an injudicious writer, we might ascribe the abdication of Diocletian to the menaces of Galerius, and relate the particulars of a private conversation between the two princes, in which the former discovered as much pusillanimity as the latter displayed ingratitude and arrogance. But these obscure anecdotes are sufficiently refuted by an impartial view of the character and conduct of Diocletian. Whatever might otherwise have been his intentions, if he had apprehended any danger from the violence of Galerius, his good sense would have instructed him to prevent the ignominious contest, and, as he had held the sceptre with glory, he would have resigned it without disgrace. After the elevation of Constantius and Galerius to the rank of Augusti, two new Caesars were required to supply their place, and to complete the system of the imperial government. Diocletian was sincerely desirous of withdrawing himself from the world. He considered Galerius, who had married his daughter, as the firmest support of his family and of the empire, and he consented without reluctance that his successor should assume the merit as well as the envy of the important nomination. It was fixed without consulting the interest or inclination of the princes of the West. Each of them had a son, who was arrived at the age of manhood, and who might have been deemed the most natural candidates for the vacant honour. But the impotent resentment of Maximian was no longer to be dreaded, and the moderate Constantius, though he might despise the dangers, was humanely apprehensive of the calamities of civil war. The two persons whom Galerius promoted to the rank of Caesar were much better suited to serve the views of his ambition and their principal recommendation seems to have consisted in the want of merit or personal consequence. The first of these was Daza, or, as he was afterwards called, Maximin, whose mother was the sister of Galerius. The unexperienced youth still betrayed, by his manners and language, his rustic education, when, to his own astonishment, as well as that of the world, he was invested by Diocletian with the purple, exalted to the dignity of Caesar, and entrusted with the sovereign command of Egypt and Syria. At the same time Severus, a faithful servant, addicted to pleasure but not incapable of business, was sent to Milan to receive from the reluctant hands of Maximian the Caesarian ornaments and the possession of Italy and Africa. According to the forms of the constitution, Severus acknowledged the supremacy of the Western Emperor, but he was absolutely devoted to the commands of his benefactor Galerius, who, reserving to himself the intermediate countries, from the confines of Italy to those of Syria, firmly established his power over three-fourths of the monarchy. In the full confidence that the approaching death of Constantius would leave him sole master of the Roman world, we are assured that he had arranged in his mind a long succession of future princes, and that he meditated his own retreat from public life, after he should have accomplished a glorious reign of about twenty years. But, within less than eighteen months, two unexpected revolutions overturned the ambitious schemes of Galerius. The hopes of uniting the western provinces to his empire were disappointed by the elevation of Constantine, 
whilst Italy and Africa were lost by the unsuccessful revolt of Maxentius. The fame of Constantine has rendered posterity attentive to the most minute circumstances of his life and actions. The place of his birth, as well as the condition of his mother Helena, have been the subject not only of literary but of national disputes. Notwithstanding the recent tradition which assigns for her father a British king, we are obliged to confess that Helena was the daughter of an innkeeper. But, at the same time, we may defend the legality of her marriage against those who have represented her as the concubine of Constantius. The great Constantine was most probably born at Naissus in Dacia, and it is not surprising that, in a family and province distinguished only by the profession of arms, the youth should discover very little inclination to improve his mind by the acquisition of knowledge. He was about eighteen years of age when his father was promoted to the rank of Caesar, but that fortunate event was attended with his mother's divorce, and the splendour of an imperial alliance reduced the son of Helena to a state of disgrace and humiliation. Instead of following Constantius in the west, he remained in the service of Diocletian, signalised his valour in the wars of Egypt and Persia, and gradually rose to the honourable station of a tribune of the first order. The figure of Constantine was tall and majestic. He was dexterous in all his exercises, intrepid in war, affable in peace. In his whole conduct the active spirit of youth was tempered by habitual prudence, and while his mind was engrossed by ambition, he appeared cold and insensible to the allurements of pleasure. The favour of the people and soldiers who had named him as a worthy candidate for the rank of Caesar served only to exasperate the jealousy of Galerius, and, though prudence might restrain him from exercising any open violence, an absolute monarch is seldom at a loss how to execute a sure and secret revenge. Every hour increased the danger of Constantine and the anxiety of his father, who, by repeated letters, expressed the warmest desire of embracing his son. For some time the policy of Galerius supplied him with delays and excuses, but it was impossible long to refuse so natural a request of his associate, without maintaining his refusal by arms. The permission of the journey was reluctantly granted, and whatever precautions the Emperor might have taken to intercept a return, the consequences of which he, with so much reason, apprehended, they were effectually disappointed by the incredible diligence of Constantine. Leaving the palace of Nicomedia in the night, he travelled post through Bithynia, Thrace, Dacia, Pannonia, Italy, and Gaul, and, amidst the joyful acclamations of the people, reached the port of Bologna in the very moment when his father was preparing to embark for Britain. The British expedition, and an easy victory over the barbarians of Caledonia, were the last exploits of the reign of Constantius. He ended his life in the imperial palace of York, fifteen months after he had received the title of Augustus, and almost fourteen years and a half after he had been promoted to the rank of Caesar. His death was immediately succeeded by the elevation of Constantine. The ideas of inheritance and succession are so very familiar, that the generality of mankind consider them as founded not only in reason but in nature itself. Our imagination readily transfers the same principles from private property to public dominion, and whenever a virtuous father leaves behind him a son whose merit seems to justify the esteem or even the hopes of the people, the joint influence of prejudice and of affection operates with irresistible weight. The flower of the western armies had followed Constantius into Britain, and the national troops were reinforced by a numerous body of Alemanni who obeyed the orders of Crocus, one of their hereditary chieftains. The opinion of their own importance, and the assurance that Britain, Gaul, and Spain would acquiesce in their nomination, were diligently inculcated to the legions by the adherents of Constantine. The soldiers were asked whether they could hesitate a moment between the honour of placing at their head the worthy son of their beloved emperor, and the ignominy of tamely expecting the arrival of some obscure stranger on whom it might please the sovereign of Asia to bestow the armies and provinces of the West. It was insinuated to them 
that gratitude and liberality held a distinguished place among the virtues of Constantine. Nor did that artful prince show himself to the troops, till they were prepared to salute him with the names of Augustus and Emperor. The throne was the object of his desires, and, had he been less actuated by ambition, it was his only means of safety. He was well acquainted with the character and sentiments of Galerius, and sufficiently apprised that, if he wished to live, he must determine to reign. The decent and even obstinate resistance which he chose to effect was contrived to justify his usurpation, nor did he yield to the acclamations of the army till he had provided the proper materials for a letter, which he immediately dispatched to the Emperor of the East. Constantine informed him of the melancholy event of his father's death, modestly asserted his natural claim to the succession, and respectfully lamented that the affectionate violence of his troops had not permitted him to solicit the imperial purple in the regular and constitutional manner. The first emotions of Galerius were those of surprise, disappointment, and rage, and, as he could seldom restrain his passions, he loudly threatened that he would commit to the flames both the letter and the messenger. But his resentment insensibly subsided, and when he recollected the doubtful chance of war, when he had weighed the character and strength of his adversary, he consented to embrace the honourable accommodation which the prudence of Constantine had left open to him. Without either condemning or ratifying the choice of the British army, Galerius accepted the son of his deceased colleague as the sovereign of the provinces beyond the Alps, but he gave him only the title of Caesar, and the fourth rank among the Roman princes, while he conferred the vacant place of Augustus on his favourite Severus. The apparent harmony of the empire was still preserved, and Constantine, who already possessed the substance, expected without impatience an opportunity of obtaining the honours of supreme power. The children of Constantius by his second marriage were six in number, three of either sex, and whose imperial descent might have solicited a preference over the meaner extraction of the son of Helena. But Constantine was in the thirty-second year of his age, in the full vigour both of mind and body, at the time when the eldest of his brothers could not possibly be more than thirteen years old. His claim of superior merit had been allowed and ratified by the dying emperor. In his last moments Constantius bequeathed to his eldest son the care of the safety as well as greatness of the family, conjuring him to assume both the authority and the sentiments of a father with regard to the children of Theodora. Their liberal education, advantageous marriages, the secure dignity of their lives, and the first honours of the state with which they were invested, attest the fraternal affection of Constantine. And, as those princes possessed a mild and grateful disposition, they submitted without reluctance to the superiority of his genius and fortune. The ambitious spirit of Galerius was scarcely reconciled to the disappointment of his views upon the Gallic provinces, before the unexpected loss of Italy wounded his pride as well as power in a still more sensible part. The long absence of the emperors had filled Rome with discontent and indignation, and the people gradually discovered that the preference given to Nicomedia and Milan was not to be ascribed to the particular inclination of Diocletian, but to the permanent form of government which he had instituted. It was in vain that, a few months after his abdication, his successors dedicated under his name those magnificent baths whose ruins still supply the ground as well as the materials for so many churches and convents. The tranquillity of those elegant recesses of ease and luxury was disturbed by the impatient murmurs of the Romans, and a report was insensibly circulated that the sums expended in erecting those buildings would soon be required at their hands. About that time the avarice of Galerius, or perhaps the exigencies of the state, had induced him to make a very strict and rigorous inquisition into the property of his subjects, for the purpose of a general taxation, both on their lands and on their persons. A very minute survey appears to have been taken of their real estates, and, wherever there was the slightest suspicion of concealment, torture was very freely employed to obtain a sincere declaration of their personal wealth. 
the privileges which had exalted Italy above the rank of the provinces were no longer regarded, and the officers of the revenue already began to number the Roman people, and to settle the proportion of the new taxes. Even when the spirit of freedom had been utterly extinguished, the tamest subjects have sometimes ventured to resist an unprecedented invasion of their property, but on this occasion the injury was aggravated by the insult, and the sense of private interest was quickened by that of national honour. The conquest of Macedonia, as we have already observed, had delivered the Roman people from the weight of personal taxes. Though they had experienced every form of despotism, they had now enjoyed that exemption near five hundred years, nor could they patiently brook the insolence of an Illyrian peasant, who, from his distant residence in Asia, presumed to number Rome among the tributary cities of his empire. The rising fury of the people was encouraged by the authority, or at least the connivance, of the Senate, and the feeble remains of the Praetorian guards, who had reason to apprehend their own dissolution, embraced so honourable a pretence, and declared their readiness to draw their swords in the service of their oppressed country. It was the wish, and it soon became the hope, of every citizen, that after expelling from Italy their foreign tyrants, they should elect a prince who, by the place of his residence, and by the maxims of government, might once more deserve the title of Roman Emperor. The name, as well as the situation, of Maxentius determined in his favour the popular enthusiasm. Maxentius was the son of the emperor Maximian, and he had married the daughter of Galerius. His birth and alliance seemed to offer him the fairest promise of succeeding to the empire, but his vices and incapacity procured him the same exclusion from the dignity of Caesar, which Constantine had deserved by a dangerous superiority of merit. The policy of Galerius preferred such associates as would never disgrace the choice, nor dispute the commands of their benefactor. An obscure stranger was therefore raised to the throne of Italy, and the son of the late Emperor of the West was left to enjoy the luxury of a private fortune in a villa a few miles distant from the capital. The gloomy passions of his soul, shame, vexation, and rage, were inflamed by envy on the news of Constantine's success, but the hopes of Maxentius revived with the public discontent, and he was easily persuaded to unite his personal injury and pretensions with the cause of the Roman people. Two Praetorian tribunes and a commissary of provisions undertook the management of the conspiracy, and, as every order of men was actuated by the same spirit, the immediate event was neither doubtful nor difficult. The prefect of the city, and a few magistrates, who maintained their fidelity to Severus, were massacred by the guards, and Maxentius, invested with the imperial ornaments, was acknowledged by the applauding senate and people as the protector of the Roman freedom and dignity. It is uncertain whether Maximian was previously acquainted with the conspiracy, but as soon as the standard of rebellion was erected at Rome, the old emperor broke from the retirement where the authority of Diocletian had condemned him to pass a life of melancholy and solitude, and concealed his returning ambition under the disguise of paternal tenderness. At the request of his son and of the senate, he condescended to resume the purple. His ancient dignity— his experience, and his fame in arms, added strength as well as reputation to the party of Maxentius. According to the advice, or rather the orders, of his colleague, the Emperor Severus immediately hastened to Rome in the full confidence that, by his unexpected celerity, he should easily suppress the tumult of an unwarlike populace, commanded by a licentious youth but he found on his arrival the gates of the city shut against him, the walls filled with men and arms, an experienced general at the head of the rebels, and his own troops without spirit or affection. A large body of Moors deserted to the enemy, allured by the promise of a large donative, and, if it be true that they had been levied by Maximian in his African war, preferring the natural feelings of gratitude to the artificial ties of allegiance. Anulinus, the Praetorian prefect, declared himself in favour of Maxentius, and drew after him the most considerable part of the troops, accustomed to obey his commands. 
Rome, according to the expression of an orator, recalled her armies, and the unfortunate Severus, destitute of force and of counsel, retired, or rather fled with precipitation, to Ravenna. Here he might for some time have been safe. The fortifications of Ravenna were able to resist the attempts, and the morasses that surrounded the town were sufficient to prevent the approach of the Italian army. The sea, which Severus commanded with a powerful fleet, secured him an inexhaustible supply of provisions, and gave a free entrance to the legions, which, on the return of spring, would advance to his assistance from Illyricum and the east. Maximian, who conducted the siege in person, was soon convinced that he might waste his time and his army in the fruitless enterprise, and that he had nothing to hope, either from force or famine. With an art more suitable to the character of Diocletian than to his own, he directed his attack not so much against the walls of Ravenna as against the mind of Severus. The treachery which he had experienced disposed that unhappy prince to distrust the most sincere of his friends and adherents. The emissaries of Maximian easily persuaded his credulity that a conspiracy was formed to betray the town and prevailed upon his fears not to expose himself to the discretion of an irritated conqueror, but to accept the faith of an honourable capitulation. He was, at first, received with humanity and treated with respect. Maximian conducted the captive emperor to Rome, and gave him the most solemn assurances that he had secured his life by the resignation of the purple. But Severus could obtain only an easy death and an imperial funeral. When the sentence was signified to him, the manner of executing it was left to his own choice. He preferred the favourite mode of the ancients, that of opening his veins, and as soon as he expired, his body was carried to the sepulchre which had been constructed for the family of Gallienus. End of chapter 14, part 1《Though the characters of Constantine and Maxentius had very little affinity with each other, their situation and interest were the same, and prudence seemed to require that they should unite their forces against the common enemy. Notwithstanding the superiority of his age and dignity, the indefatigable Maximian passed the Alps, and, courting a personal interview with the sovereign of Gaul, carried with him his daughter Fausta as a pledge of the new alliance. The marriage was celebrated at Arles with every circumstance of magnificence, and the ancient colleague of Diocletian, who again asserted his claim to the Western Empire, conferred on his son-in-law and ally the title of Augustus. By consenting to receive that honour from Maximian, Constantine seemed to embrace the cause of Rome and of the Senate, but his professions were ambiguous and his assistance slow and ineffectual. He considered with attention the approaching contest between the masters of Italy and the Emperor of the East, and was prepared to consult his own safety or ambition in the event of the war. The importance of the occasion called for the presence and abilities of Galerius. At the head of a powerful army collected from Illyricum in the East, he entered Italy, resolved to revenge the death of Severus, and to chastise the rebellious Romans or, as he expressed his intentions, in the furious language of a barbarian, to extirpate the senate, and to destroy the people by the sword. But the skill of Maximian had concerted a prudent system of defence. The invader found every place hostile, fortified, and inaccessible, and, though he forced his way as far as Narni, within sixty miles of Rome, his dominion in Italy was confined to the narrow limits of his camp. Sensible of the increasing difficulties of his enterprise, the haughty Galerius made the first advances towards a reconciliation, 
and dispatched two of his most considerable officers to tempt the Roman princes by an offer of a conference, and the declaration of his paternal regard for Maxentius, who might obtain much more from his liberality than he could hope from the doubtful chance of war. The offers of Galerius were rejected with firmness, his perfidious friendship refused with contempt, and it was not long before he discovered that, unless he provided for his safety by a timely retreat, he had some reason to apprehend the fate of Severus. The wealth which the Romans defended against his rapacious tyranny they freely contributed for his destruction. The name of Maximian, the popular arts of his son, the secret distribution of large sums, and the promise of still more liberal rewards, checked the ardour and corrupted the fidelity of the Illyrian legions, and when Galerius at length gave the signal of the retreat, it was with some difficulty that he could prevail on his veterans not to desert a banner which had so often conducted them to victory and honour. A contemporary writer assigns two other causes for the failure of the expedition, but they are both of such a nature that a cautious historian will scarcely venture to adopt them. We are told that Galerius, who had formed a very imperfect notion of the greatness of Rome by the cities of the East with which he was acquainted, found his forces inadequate to the siege of that immense capital. But the extent of a city serves only to render it more accessible to the enemy. Rome had long since been accustomed to submit on the approach of a conqueror, nor could the temporary enthusiasm of the people have long contended against the discipline and valour of the legions. We are likewise informed that the legions themselves were struck with horror and remorse, and that those pious sons of the Republic refused to violate the sanctity of their venerable parent. But when we recollect with how much ease, in the more ancient civil wars, the zeal of party and the habits of military obedience had converted the native citizens of Rome into her most implacable enemies, we shall be inclined to distrust this extreme delicacy of strangers and barbarians, who had never beheld Italy till they entered it in a hostile manner. Had they not been restrained by motives of a more interested nature, they would probably have answered Galerius in the words of Caesar's veterans, if our general wishes to lead us to the banks of the Tiber, we are prepared to trace out his camp. Whatsoever walls he has determined to level with the ground, our hands are ready to work the engines, nor shall we hesitate should the name of the devoted city be Rome itself. These are indeed the expressions of a poet, but of a poet who has been distinguished and even censured for his strict adherence to the truth of history. The legions of Galerius exhibited a very melancholy proof of their disposition, by the ravages which they committed in their retreat. They murdered, they ravished, they plundered, they drove away the flocks and herds of the Italians, they burnt the villages through which they passed, and they endeavoured to destroy the country which it had not been in their power to subdue. During the whole march Maxentius hung on their rear, but he very prudently declined a general engagement with those brave and desperate veterans. His father had undertaken a second journey into Gaul, with the hope of persuading Constantine, who had assembled an army on the frontier, to join in the pursuit, and to complete the victory. But the actions of Constantine were guided by reason, and not by resentment. He persisted in the wise resolution of maintaining a balance of power in the divided empire, and he no longer hated Galerius, when that aspiring prince had ceased to be an object of terror. The mind of Galerius was the most susceptible of the sterner passions, but it was not, however, incapable of sincere and lasting friendship. Licinius, whose manners as well as character were not unlike his own, seems to have engaged both his affection and esteem. Their intimacy had commenced in the happier period, perhaps, of their youth and obscurity. It had been cemented by the freedom and dangers of a military life. They had advanced almost by equal steps through the successive honours of the service, and as soon as Galerius was invested with the imperial dignity, he seems to have conceived the design of raising his companion to the same rank with himself. During the short period of his prosperity he considered the rank of Caesar as unworthy of the age and merit of Licinius, and rather chose to reserve for him the place of Constantius and the Empire of the West. While the Emperor was employed in the Italian war, he entrusted his friend with the defence of the Danube, and, immediately after his return from that unfortunate expedition, he invested Licinius with the vacant purple of Severus, 
resigning to his immediate command the provinces of Illyricum. The news of his promotion was no sooner carried into the east than Maximin, who governed, or rather oppressed, the countries of Egypt and Syria, betrayed his envy and discontent, disdained the inferior name of Caesar, and, notwithstanding the prayers as well as arguments of Galerius, exacted, almost by violence, the equal title of Augustus. For the first, and indeed for the last time, the Roman world was administered by six emperors. In the west, Constantine and Maxentius affected to reverence their father Maximian. In the east, Licinius and Maximin honoured with more real consideration their benefactor Galerius. The opposition of interest and the memory of a recent war divided the empire into two great hostile powers, but their mutual fears produced an apparent tranquillity, and even a feigned reconciliation, till the death of the elder princes, of Maximian, and more particularly of Galerius, gave a new direction to the views and passions of their surviving associates. When Maximian had reluctantly abdicated the empire, the venal orators of the times applauded his philosophic moderation. When his ambition excited, or at least encouraged, a civil war, they returned thanks to his generous patriotism, and gently censured that love of ease and retirement which had withdrawn him from the public service but it was impossible that minds like those of Maximian and his son could long possess in harmony an undivided power. Maxentius considered himself as the legal sovereign of Italy, elected by the Roman Senate and people, nor would he endure the control of his father, who arrogantly declared that by his name and abilities the rash youth had been established on the throne. The cause was solemnly pleaded before the Praetorian guards, and those troops, who dreaded the severity of the old emperor, espoused the party of Maxentius. The life and freedom of Maximian were, however, respected, and he retired from Italy into Illyricum, affecting to lament his past conduct, and secretly contriving new mischiefs. But Galerius, who was well acquainted with his character, soon obliged him to leave his dominions, and the last refuge of the disappointed Maximian was the court of his son-in-law Constantine. He was received with respect by that artful prince, and with the appearance of filial tenderness by the Empress Fausta. That he might remove every suspicion, he resigned the imperial purple a second time, professing himself at length convinced of the vanity of greatness and ambition. Had he persevered in this resolution, he might have ended his life with less dignity, indeed, than in his first retirement, yet, however, with comfort and reputation. But the near prospect of a throne brought back to his remembrance the state from whence he was fallen, and he resolved by a desperate effort either to reign or to perish. An incursion of the Franks had summoned Constantine with a part of his army to the banks of the Rhine. The remainder of the troops were stationed in the southern provinces of Gaul, which lay exposed to the enterprises of the Italian emperor, and a considerable treasure was deposited in the city of Arles. Maximian either craftily invented, or easily credited, a vain report of the death of Constantine. Without hesitation he ascended the throne, seized the treasure, and scattering it with his accustomed profusion amongst the soldiers, endeavoured to awake in their minds the memory of his ancient dignity and exploits. Before he could establish his authority, or finish the negotiation which he appears to have entered into with his son Maxentius, the celerity of Constantine defeated all his hopes. On the first news of his perfidy and ingratitude, that prince returned by rapid marches from the Rhine to the Seine, embarked on the last-mentioned river at Chalon, and at Lyon, trusting himself to the rapidity of the Rhone, arrived at the gates of Arles with a military force which it was impossible for Maximian to resist and which scarcely permitted him to take refuge in the neighbouring city of Marseilles. The narrow neck of land which joined that place to the continent was fortified against the besiegers, whilst the sea was open, either for the escape of Maximian, or for the succour of Maxentius, if the latter should choose to disguise his invasion of Gaul under the honourable pretence of defending a distressed, or, as he might allege, an injured father. Apprehensive of the fatal consequences of delay, Constantine gave orders for an immediate assault, but the scaling ladders were found too short for the height of the walls, and Marseilles might have sustained as long a siege as it formerly did against the arms of Caesar, if the garrison, 
conscious either of their fault or of their danger, had not purchased their pardon by delivering up the city and the person of Maximian. A secret but irrevocable sentence of death was pronounced against the usurper. He obtained only the same favour which he had indulged to Severus, and it was published to the world that, oppressed by the remorse of his repeated crimes, he had strangled himself with his own hands. After he had lost the assistance, and disdained the moderate counsels of Diocletian, the second period of his active life was a series of public calamities and personal mortifications, which were terminated in about three years by an ignominious death. He deserved his fate, but we should find more reason to applaud the humanity of Constantine if he had spared an old man, the benefactor of his father, and the father of his wife. During the whole of this melancholy transaction, it appears that Fausta sacrificed the sentiments of nature to her conjugal duties. The last years of Galerius were less shameful and unfortunate, and though he had filled with more glory the subordinate station of Caesar than the superior rank of Augustus, he preserved till the moment of his death the first place among the princes of the Roman world. He survived his retreat from Italy about four years, and wisely relinquishing his views of universal empire, he devoted the remainder of his life to the enjoyment of pleasure, and to the execution of some works of public utility, among which we may distinguish the discharging into the Danube the superfluous waters of the Lake Pelso, and the cutting down of the immense forests that encompassed it, an operation worthy of a monarch, since it gave an extensive country to the agriculture of his Pannonian subjects. His death was occasioned by a very painful and lingering disorder. His body, swelled by an intemperate course of life to an unwieldy corpulence, was covered with ulcers, and devoured by innumerable swarms of those insects which have given their name to a most loathsome disease. But, as Galerius had offended a very zealous and powerful party among his subjects, his sufferings, instead of exciting their compassion, have been celebrated as the visible effects of divine justice. He had no sooner expired in his palace of Nicomedia than the two emperors who were indebted for their purple to his favours, began to collect their forces with the intention either of disputing or of dividing the dominions which he had left without a master. They were persuaded, however, to desist from the former design, and to agree in the latter. The provinces of Asia fell to the share of Maximin, and those of Europe augmented the portion of Licinius. The Hellespont and the Thracian Bosphorus formed their mutual boundary, and the banks of those narrow seas which flowed in the midst of the Roman world were covered with soldiers, with arms, and with fortification. The deaths of Maximian and of Galerius reduced the number of emperors to four. The sense of their true interest soon connected Licinius and Constantine. A secret alliance was concluded between Maximin and Maxentius, and their unhappy subjects expected with terror the bloody consequences of their inevitable dissensions, which were no longer restrained by the fear or the respect which they had entertained for Galerius. Among so many crimes and misfortunes occasioned by the passions of the Roman princes, there is some pleasure in discovering a single action which may be ascribed to their virtue. In the sixth year of his reign, Constantine visited the city of Autun, and generously remitted the arrears of tribute, reducing at the same time the proportion of their assessment from twenty-five to eighteen thousand heads, subject to the real and personal capitation. Yet even this indulgence affords the most unquestionable proof of the public misery. This tax was so extremely oppressive, either in itself or in the mode of collecting it, that whilst the revenue was increased by extortion, it was diminished by despair. A considerable part of the territory of Autun was left uncultivated, and great numbers of the provincials chose rather to live as exiles and outlaws than to support the weight of civil society. It is but too probable that the bountiful emperor relieved, by a partial act of liberality, one among the many evils which he had caused by his general maxims of administration. But even those maxims were less the effect of choice than of necessity. And if we accept the death of Maximian, the reign of Constantine in Gaul seems to have been the most innocent and even virtuous period of his life. The provinces were protected by his presence from the inroads of the barbarians, who either dreaded or experienced his active valour. 
after a signal victory over the Franks and Alemanni, several of their princes were exposed by his order to the wild beasts in the amphitheatre of Treves, and the people seem to have enjoyed the spectacle, without discovering, in such a treatment of royal captives, anything that was repugnant to the laws of nations or of humanity. The virtues of Constantine were rendered more illustrious by the vices of Maxentius. While the Gallic provinces enjoyed as much happiness as the condition of the times was capable of receiving, Italy and Africa groaned under the dominion of a tyrant, as contemptible as he was odious. The zeal of flattery and faction had indeed too frequently sacrificed the reputation of the vanquished to the glory of their successful rivals, but even those writers who have revealed with the most freedom and pleasure the faults of Constantine unanimously confess that Maxentius was cruel, rapacious, and profligate. He had the good fortune to suppress a slight rebellion in Africa. The governor and a few adherents had been guilty, the province suffered for their crime. The flourishing cities of Kirtha and Carthage, and the whole extent of that fertile country, were wasted by fire and sword. The abuse of victory was followed by the abuse of law and justice. A formidable army of sycophants and delators invaded Africa. The rich and the noble were easily convicted of a connection with the rebels, and those among them who experienced the emperor's clemency were only punished by the confiscation of their estates. So signal a victory was celebrated by a magnificent triumph, and Maxentius exposed to the eyes of the people the spoils and captives of a Roman province. The state of the capital was no less deserving of compassion than that of Africa. The wealth of Rome supplied an inexhaustible fund for his vain and prodigal expenses, and the ministers of his revenue were skilled in the arts of rapine. It was under his reign that the method of exacting a free gift from the senators was first invented, and as the sum was insensibly increased, the pretences of levying it—a victory, a birth, a marriage, or an imperial consulship—were proportionably multiplied. Maxentius had imbibed the same implacable aversion to the senate which had characterized most of the former tyrants of Rome nor was it possible for his ungrateful temper to forgive the generous fidelity which had raised him to the throne and supported him against all his enemies. The lives of the senators were exposed to his jealous suspicions. The dishonour of their wives and daughters heightened the gratification of his sensual passions. It may be presumed that an imperial lover was seldom reduced to sigh in vain, but whenever persuasion proved ineffectual he had recourse to violence and there remains one memorable example of a noble matron who preserved her chastity by a voluntary death. The soldiers were the only order of men whom he appeared to respect, or studied to please. He filled Roman Italy with armed troops, connived at their tumults, suffered them with impunity to plunder and even to massacre the defenceless people, and indulging them in the same licentiousness which their emperor enjoyed, Maxentius often bestowed on his military favourites the splendid villa or the beautiful wife of a senator. A prince of such character, alike incapable of governing, either in peace or in war, might purchase the support, but he could never obtain the esteem of the army. Yet his pride was equal to his other vices. Whilst he passed an indolent life either within the walls of his palace or in the neighbouring gardens of Sallust, he was repeatedly heard to declare that he alone was emperor, and that the other princes were no more than his lieutenants, on whom he had devolved the defence of the frontier provinces, that he might enjoy without interruption the elegant luxury of the capital. Rome, which had so long regretted the absence, lamented during the six years of his reign the presence of her sovereign. Though Constantine might view the conduct of Maxentius with abhorrence, and the situation of the Romans with compassion, we have no reason to presume that he would have taken up arms to punish the one or to relieve the other. But the tyrant of Italy rashly ventured to provoke a formidable enemy, whose ambition had been hitherto restrained by considerations of prudence rather than principles of justice. After the death of Maximian, his titles, according to the established custom, had been erased, and his statues thrown down with ignominy. His son, who had persecuted and deserted him when alive, effected to display the most pious regard for his memory, and gave orders that a similar treatment should be immediately inflicted on all the statues that had been erected in Italy and Africa to the honour of Constantine. 
That wise prince, who sincerely wished to decline a war, with the difficulty and importance of which he was sufficiently acquainted, at first dissembled the insult, and sought for redress by the milder expedient of negotiation, till he was convinced that the hostile and ambitious designs of the Italian emperor made it necessary for him to arm in his own defence. Maxentius, who openly avowed his pretensions to the whole monarchy of the West, had already prepared a very considerable force to invade the Gallic provinces on the side of Raetia, and though he could not expect any assistance from Licinius, he was flattered with the hope that the legions of Illyricum, allured by his presence and promises, would desert the standard of that prince and unanimously declare themselves his soldiers and subjects. Constantine no longer hesitated. He had deliberated with caution he acted with vigour. He gave a private audience to the ambassadors, who, in the name of the senate and people, conjured him to deliver Rome from a detested tyrant, and, without regarding the timid remonstrances of his council, he resolved to prevent the enemy, and to carry the war into the heart of Italy. The enterprise was as full of danger as of glory, and the unsuccessful event of two former invasions was sufficient to inspire the most serious apprehensions. The veteran troops, who revered the name of Maximian, had embraced in both those wars the party of his son, and were now restrained by a sense of honour, as well as of interest, by entertaining an idea of a second desertion. Maxentius, who considered the Praetorian guards as the firmest defence of his throne, had increased them to their ancient establishment, and they composed, including the rest of the Italians who were enlisted into his service, a formidable body of fourscore thousand men. Forty thousand Moors and Carthaginians had been raised since the reduction of Africa. Even Sicily furnished its proportion of troops, and the armies of Maxentius amounted to one hundred and seventy thousand foot and eighteen thousand horse. The wealth of Italy supplied the expenses of the war, and the adjacent provinces were exhausted to form immense magazines of corn and every other kind of provisions. The whole force of Constantine consisted of ninety thousand foot and eight thousand horse, and, as the defence of the Rhine required an extraordinary attention during the absence of the Emperor, it was not in his power to employ above half his troops in the Italian expedition, unless he sacrificed the public safety to his private quarrel. At the head of about forty thousand soldiers, he marched to encounter an enemy whose numbers were at least four times superior to his own. But, the armies of Rome, placed at a secure distance from danger, were enervated by indulgence and luxury. Habituated to the baths and theatres of Rome, they took the field with reluctance, and were chiefly composed of veterans who had almost forgotten, or of new levies who had never acquired the use of arms and the practice of war. The hardy legions of Gaul had long defended the frontiers of the empire against the barbarians of the north, and in the performance of that laborious service their valour was exercised and their discipline confirmed. There appeared the same difference between the leaders as between the armies. Caprice or flattery had tempted Maxentius with the hopes of conquest, but these aspiring hopes soon gave way to the habits of pleasure and the consciousness of his inexperience. The intrepid mind of Constantine had been trained from his earliest youth to war, to action, and to military command. End of chapter 14, part 2《when Hannibal marched from Gaul into Italy, he was obliged first to discover, and then to open, a way over mountains and through savage nations that had never yielded a passage to a regular army. The Alps were then guarded by nature, they are now fortified by art. Citadels, constructed with no less skill than labour and expense, command every avenue into the plain and on that side render Italy almost inaccessible to the enemies of the King of Sardinia. 
but in the course of the intermediate period the generals who have attempted the passage have seldom experienced any difficulty or resistance in the age of constantine the peasants of the mountains were civilized and obedient subjects the country was plentifully stocked with provisions and the stupendous highways which the romans had carried over the alps opened several communications between gaul and italy constantine preferred the road of the cotian alps or as it is now called of mount canis and led his troops with such active diligence that he descended into the plain of piedmont before the court of maxentius had received any certain intelligence of his departure from the banks of the rhine the city of susa however which is situated at the foot of mount canis was surrounded with walls and provided with a garrison sufficiently numerous to check the progress of an invader but the impatience of constantine's troops disdained the tedious forms of a siege the same day that they appeared before susa they applied fire to the gates and ladders to the walls and mounting to the assault amidst a shower of stones and arrows they entered the place sword in hand and cut in pieces the greatest part of the garrison the flames were extinguished by the care of constantine and the remains of susa preserved from total destruction about forty miles from thence a more severe contest awaited him a numerous army of italians was assembled under the lieutenants of maxentius in the plains of turin its principal strength consisted in a species of heavy cavalry which the romans since the decline of their discipline had borrowed from the nations of the east the horses as well as the men were clothed in complete armour the joints of which were artfully adapted to the motions of their bodies the aspect of this cavalry was formidable their weight almost irresistible, and as on this occasion their generals had drawn them up in a compact column or wedge, with a sharp point and with spreading flanks, they flattered themselves that they could easily break and trample down the army of Constantine. They might, perhaps, have succeeded in their design, had not their experienced adversary embraced the same method of defence which in similar circumstances had been practised by Aurelian the skilful evolutions of constantine divided and baffled this massy column of cavalry the troops of maxentius fled in confusion towards turin and as the gates of the city were shut against them very few escaped the sword of the victorious pursuers by this important service turin deserved to experience the clemency and even favour of the conqueror he made his entry into the imperial palace of milan and almost all the cities of Italy between the Alps and the Po not only acknowledged the power, but embraced with zeal the party of Constantine. From Milan to Rome the Emilian and Flaminian highways offered an easy march of about four hundred miles, but though Constantine was impatient to encounter the tyrant, he prudently directed his operations against another army of Italians, who, by their strength and position, might either oppose his progress, or, in the case of a misfortune, might intercept his retreat. Ruricius Pompeianus, a general distinguished by his valour and ability, had under his command the city of Verona, and all the troops that were stationed in the province of Venetia. As soon as he was informed that Constantine was advancing towards him, he detached a large body of cavalry which was defeated in an engagement near Brescia, and pursued by the Gallic legions as far as the gates of Verona. The necessity, the importance, and the difficulties of the siege of Verona immediately presented themselves to the sagacious mind of Constantine. The city was accessible only by a narrow peninsula towards the west as the other three sides were surrounded by the Adige, a rapid river which covered the province of Venetia, from whence the besieged derived an inexhaustible supply of men and provisions. It was not without great difficulty, and after several fruitless attempts, that Constantine found means to pass the river at some distance above the city, and in a place where the torrent was less violent. He then encompassed Verona with strong lines, pushed his attacks with prudent vigour, and repelled a desperate sally of Pompeianus. That intrepid general, when he had used every means of defence that the strength of the place or that of the garrison could afford, secretly escaped from Verona, anxious not for his own but for the public safety. 
with indefatigable diligence he soon collected an army sufficient either to meet Constantine in the field, or to attack him, if he obstinately remained within his lines. The emperor, attentive to the motions, and informed of the approach of so formidable an enemy, left a part of his legions to continue the operations of the siege, whilst, at the head of those troops on whose valour and fidelity he more particularly depended, he advanced in person to engage the general of Maxentius. The army of Gaul was drawn up in two lines, according to the usual practice of war, but their experienced leader, perceiving that the numbers of the Italians far exceeded his own, suddenly changed his disposition, and, reducing the second, extended the front of his first line to a just proportion with that of the enemy. Such evolutions, which only veteran troops can execute without confusion in a moment of danger, commonly prove decisive. But, as this engagement began towards the close of the day, and was contested with great obstinacy during the whole night, there was less room for the conduct of the generals than for the courage of the soldiers. The return of light displayed the victory of Constantine, and a field of carnage covered with many thousands of the vanquished Italians. Their general, Pompeianus, was found among the slain. Verona immediately surrendered at discretion, and the garrison were made prisoners of war. When the officers of the victorious army congratulated their master on this important success, they ventured to add some respectful complaints of such a nature, however, as the most jealous monarchs will listen to without displeasure. They represented to Constantine that, not contented with all the duties of a commander, he had exposed his own person with an excess of valour which almost degenerated into rashness, and they conjured him for the future to pay more regard to the preservation of a life in which the safety of Rome and of the empire was involved. While Constantine signalised his conduct and valour in the field, the sovereign of Italy appeared insensible of the calamities and danger of a civil war which reigned in the heart of his dominions. Pleasure was still the only business of Maxentius. Concealing, or at least attempting to conceal from public knowledge the misfortunes of his arms, he indulged himself in a vain confidence which deferred the remedies of the approaching evil, without deferring the evil itself. The rapid progress of Constantine was scarcely sufficient to awaken him from his fatal security. He flattered himself that his well-known liberality, and the majesty of the Roman name, which had already delivered him from two invasions, would dissipate with the same facility the rebellious army of Gaul. The officers of experience and ability who had served under the banners of Maximian were at length compelled to inform his effeminate son of the imminent danger to which he was reduced, and, with a freedom that at once surprised and convinced him, to urge the necessity of preventing his ruin by a vigorous exertion of his remaining power. The resources of Maxentius, both of men and money, were still considerable. The Praetorian guards felt how strongly their own interest and safety were connected with his cause, and a third army was soon collected, more numerous than those which had been lost in the battles of Turin and Verona. It was far from the intention of the Emperor to lead his troops in person. A stranger to the exercises of war, he trembled at the apprehension of so dangerous a contest, and, as fear is commonly superstitious, he listened with melancholy attention to the rumours of omens and presages which seemed to menace his life and empire. Shame at length supplied the place of courage, and forced him to take the field. He was unable to sustain the contempt of the Roman people. The circus resounded with their indignant clamours, and they tumultuously besieged the gates of the palace, reproaching the pusillanimity of their indolent sovereign, and celebrating the heroic spirit of Constantine. Before Maxentius left Rome, he consulted the Sibylline books. The guardians of these ancient oracles were as well versed in the arts of this world as they were ignorant of the secrets of fate, and they returned him a very prudent answer which might adapt itself to the event, and secure their reputation, whatever should be the chance of arms. The celerity of Constantine's march has been compared to the rapid conquest of Italy by the first of the Caesars. 
nor is the flattering parallel repugnant to the truth of history, since no more than fifty-eight days elapsed between the surrender of Verona and the final decision of the war. Constantine had always apprehended that the tyrant would consult the dictates of fear, and perhaps of prudence, and that, instead of risking his last hopes in a general engagement, he would shut himself up within the walls of Rome. His ample magazines secured him against the danger of famine, and, as the situation of Constantine admitted not of delay, he might have been reduced to the sad necessity of destroying with fire and sword the imperial city, the noblest reward of his victory, and the deliverance of which had been the motive, or rather indeed the pretence, of the civil war. It was with equal surprise and pleasure that on his arrival at a place called Saxa Rubra, about nine miles from Rome, he discovered the army of Maxentius prepared to give him battle. Their long front filled a very spacious plain, and their deep array reached to the banks of the Tiber, which covered their rear and forbade their retreat. We are informed, and we may believe, that Constantine disposed his troops with consummate skill, and that he chose for himself the post of honour and danger. Distinguished by the splendour of his arms, he charged in person the cavalry of his rival, and his irresistible attack determined the fortune of the day. The cavalry of Maxentius was principally composed either of unwieldy cuirassiers, or of light moors and Numidians. They yielded to the vigour of the Gallic horse, which possessed more activity than the one, more firmness than the other. The defeat of the two wings left the infantry without any protection on its flanks, and the undisciplined Italians fled without reluctance from the standard of a tyrant whom they had always hated, and whom they no longer feared. The Praetorians, conscious that their offences were beyond the reach of mercy, were animated by revenge and despair. Notwithstanding their repeated efforts, those brave veterans were unable to recover their victory. They obtained, however, an honourable death, and it was observed that their bodies covered the same ground which had been occupied by their ranks. The confusion then became general, and the dismayed troops of Maxentius, pursued by an implacable enemy, rushed by thousands into the deep and rapid stream of the Tiber. The Emperor himself attempted to escape back into the city over the Milvian Bridge, but the crowds which pressed together through that narrow passage forced him into the river, where he was immediately drowned by the weight of his armour. His body, which had sunk very deep into the mud, was found with some difficulty the next day. The sight of his head, when it was exposed to the eyes of the people, convinced them of their deliverance, and admonished them to receive with acclamations of loyalty and gratitude the fortunate Constantine, who thus achieved by his valour and ability the most splendid enterprise of his life. In the use of victory, Constantine neither deserved the praise of clemency, nor incurred the censure of immoderate rigour. He inflicted the same treatment to which a defeat would have exposed his own person and family, put to death the two sons of the tyrant, and carefully extirpated his whole race. The most distinguished adherents of Maxentius must have expected to share his fate, as they had shared his prosperity and his crimes, but when the Roman people loudly demanded a greater number of victims, the conqueror resisted with firmness and humanity those servile clamours which were dictated by flattery as well as by resentment. Informers were punished and discouraged, the innocent who had suffered under the late tyranny were recalled from exile and restored to their estates. A general act of oblivion quieted the minds and settled the property of the people both in Italy and in Africa. The first time that Constantine honoured the Senate with his presence, he recapitulated his own services and exploits in a modest duration, assured that illustrious order of his sincere regard, and promised to re-establish its ancient dignity and privileges. The grateful Senate repaid these unmeaning professions by the empty titles of honour which it was yet in their power to bestow, and without presuming to ratify the authority of Constantine they passed a decree to assign him in the first rank among the three Augusti who governed the Roman world. Games and festivals were instituted to preserve the fame of his victory, and several edifices raised at the expense of Maxentius were dedicated to the honour of his successful rival. The triumphal arch of Constantine still remains a melancholy proof of the decline in the arts, and a singular testimony of the meanest vanity. 
as it was not possible to find in the capital of the empire a sculptor who was capable of adorning that public monument, the arch of Trajan, without any respect either for his memory or for the rules of propriety, was stripped of its most elegant figures. The difference of times and persons, of actions and characters, was totally disregarded. The Parthian captives appear prostrate at the feet of a prince who never carried his arms beyond the Euphrates, and curious antiquarians can still discover the head of Trajan on the trophies of Constantine. The new ornaments which it was necessary to introduce between the vacancies of ancient sculpture are executed in the rudest and most unskilful manner. The final abolition of the Praetorian Guards was a measure of prudence as well as of revenge. Those haughty troops, whose numbers and privileges had been restored, and even augmented by Maxentius, were for ever suppressed by Constantine. Their fortified camp was destroyed, and the few Praetorians who had escaped the fury of the sword were dispersed among the legions and banished to the frontiers of the empire, where they might be serviceable without again becoming dangerous. By suppressing the troops which were usually stationed in Rome, Constantine gave the fatal blow to the dignity of the senate and people and the disarmed capital was exposed without protection to the insults or neglect of its distant master. We may observe that in this last effort to preserve their expiring freedom, the Romans, from the apprehension of a tribute, had raised Maxentius to the throne. He exacted that tribute from the Senate under the name of a free gift. They implored the assistance of Constantine. He vanquished the tyrant, and converted the free gift into a perpetual tax. The senators, according to the declaration which was required of their property, were divided into several classes. The most opulent paid annually eight pounds of gold, the next class paid four, the last two, and those whose poverty might have claimed an exemption were assessed, however, at seven pieces of gold. Besides the regular members of the senate, their sons, their descendants, and even their relations, enjoyed the vain privileges and supported the heavy burdens of the senatorial order nor will it any longer excite our surprise that Constantine should be attentive to increase the number of persons who were included under so useful a description. After the defeat of Maxentius, the victorious emperor passed no more than two or three months in Rome, which he visited twice during the remainder of his life, to celebrate the solemn festivals of the tenth and of the twentieth years of his reign. Constantine was almost perpetually in motion to exercise the legions, or to inspect the state of the provinces. Treves, Milan, Aquileia, Siemium, Naissus, and Thessalonica were the occasional places of his residence, till he founded a new Rome on the confines of Europe and Asia. Before Constantine marched into Italy, he had secured the friendship, or at least the neutrality, of Licinius the Illyrian emperor. He had promised his sister Constantia in marriage to that prince, but the celebration of the nuptials was deferred till after the conclusion of the war, and the interview of the two emperors at Milan, which was appointed for that purpose, appeared to cement the union of their families and interests. In the midst of the public festivity they were suddenly obliged to take leave of each other. An inroad of the Franks summoned Constantine to the Rhine, and the hostile approach of the sovereign of Asia demanded the immediate presence of Licinius. Maximin had been the secret ally of Maxentius, and without being discouraged by his fate, he resolved to try the fortune of a civil war. He moved out of Syria towards the frontiers of Bithynia in the depth of winter. The season was severe and tempestuous, great numbers of men as well as horses perished in the snow, and as the roads were broken up by incessant rains, he was obliged to leave behind him a considerable part of the heavy baggage, which was unable to follow the rapidity of his forced marches. By this extraordinary effort of diligence, he arrived with a harassed but formidable army on the banks of the Thracian Bosphorus, before the lieutenants of Licinius were appraised of his hostile attentions. Byzantium surrendered to the power of Maximin after a siege of eleven days. He was detained some days under the walls of Heraclea, and he had no sooner taken possession of that city than he was alarmed by the intelligence that Licinius had pitched his camp at a distance of only eighteen miles. After a fruitless negotiation, in which the two princes attempted to seduce the fidelity of each other's adherents, they had recourse to arms. The Emperor of the East commanded a disciplined and veteran army of above seventy thousand men, and Licinius, who had collected about thirty thousand Illyrians, was at first oppressed by the superiority of numbers. 
his military skill, and the firmness of the troops, restored the day, and obtained a decisive victory. The incredible speed which Maximin exerted in his flight is much more celebrated than his prowess in the battle. Twenty-four hours afterwards he was seen pale, trembling, and without his imperial ornaments, at Nicomedia, one hundred and sixty miles from the place of his defeat. The wealth of Asia was yet unexhausted, and, though the flower of his veterans had fallen in the late action, he still had power, if he could obtain time, to draw very numerous levies from Syria and Egypt. But he survived his misfortune only three or four months. His death, which happened at Tarsus, was variously ascribed to despair, to poison, and to the divine justice. As Maximin was alike destitute of abilities and of virtue, he was lamented neither by the people nor by the soldiers. The provinces of the East, delivered from the terrors of civil war, cheerfully acknowledged the authority of Licinius. The vanquished emperor left behind him two children, a boy of about eight, and a girl of about seven years old. Their inoffensive age might have excited compassion, but the compassion of Licinius was a very feeble resource, nor did it restrain him from extinguishing the name and memory of his adversary. The death of Severianus will admit of less excuse, as it was dictated neither by revenge nor by policy. The conqueror had never received any injury from the father of that unhappy youth, and the short and obscure reign of Severus in a distant part of the empire was already forgotten. But the execution of Candidianus was an act of the blackest cruelty and ingratitude. He was the natural son of Galerius, the friend and benefactor of Licinius. The prudent father had judged him too young to sustain the weight of a diadem, but he hoped that, under the protection of princes who were indebted to his favour for the imperial purple, Candidianus might pass a secure and honourable life. He was now advancing towards the twentieth year of his age, and the royalty of his birth, though unsupported either by merit or ambition, was sufficient to exasperate the jealous mind of Licinius. To these innocent and illustrious victims of his tyranny, we must add the wife and daughter of the Emperor Diocletian. When that prince conferred on Galerius the title of Caesar, he had given him in marriage his daughter Valeria, whose melancholy adventures might furnish a very singular subject for tragedy. She had fulfilled and even surpassed the duties of a wife. As she had not any children herself, she condescended to adopt the illegitimate son of her husband, and invariably displayed towards the unhappy Candidianus the tenderness and anxiety of a real mother. After the death of Galerius, her ample possessions provoked the avarice, and her personal attractions excited the desires of his successor Maximin. He had a wife still alive, but divorce was permitted by the Roman law, and the fierce passions of the tyrant demanded an immediate gratification. The answer of Valeria was such as became the daughter and widow of emperors, but it was tempered by the prudence which her defenceless condition compelled her to observe. She represented to the persons whom Maximin had employed on this occasion, that even if honour could permit a woman of her character and dignity to entertain a thought of second nuptials, decency at least must forbid her to listen to his addresses at a time when the ashes of her husband and his benefactor were still warm, and while the sorrows of her mind were still expressed by her mourning garments. She ventured to declare that she could place very little confidence in the professions of a man whose cruel inconstancy was capable of repudiating a faithful and affectionate wife. On this repulse the love of Maximin was converted into fury, and, as witnesses and judges were always at his disposal, it was easy for him to cover his fury with an appearance of legal proceedings, and to assault the reputation as well as the happiness of Valeria. Her estates were confiscated, her eunuchs and domestics devoted to the most inhuman tortures, and several innocent and respectable matrons, who were honoured with her friendship, suffered death on a false accusation of adultery. The empress herself, together with her mother Prisca, was condemned to exile, and, as they were ignominiously hurried from place to place before they were confined to a sequestered village in the deserts of Syria, they exposed their shame and distress to the provinces of the east, which, during thirty years, had respected their august dignity. Diocletian made several ineffectual efforts to alleviate the misfortunes of his daughter, and, 
as the last return that he expected for the imperial purple, which he had conferred upon Maximin, he entreated that Valeria might be permitted to share his retirement of Salona, and to close the eyes of her afflicted father. He entreated, but, as he could no longer threaten, his prayers were received with coldness and disdain, and the pride of Maximin was gratified in treating Diocletian as a suppliant, and his daughter as a criminal. The death of Maximin seemed to assure the empresses of a favourable alteration in their fortune. The public disorders relaxed the vigilance of their guard, and they easily found means to escape from their place of exile, and to repair, though with some precaution and in disguise, to the court of Licinius. His behaviour in the first days of his reign, and the honourable reception which he gave to young Candidianus, inspired Valeria with a secret satisfaction, both on her own account and on that of her adopted son. But these grateful prospects were soon succeeded by horror and astonishment, and the bloody executions which stained the palace of Nicomedia sufficiently convinced her that the throne of Maximin was filled by a tyrant more inhuman than himself. Valeria consulted her safety, by a hasty flight, and, still accompanied by her mother Prisca, they wandered above fifteen months through the provinces, concealed in the disguise of plebeian habits. They were at length discovered at Thessalonica, and, as the sentence of their death was already pronounced, they were immediately beheaded, and their bodies thrown into the sea. The people gazed on this melancholy spectacle, but their grief and indignation were suppressed by the terrors of a military guard. Such was the unworthy fate of the wife and daughter of Diocletian. We lament their misfortunes, we cannot discover their crimes, and whatever idea we may justly entertain of the cruelty of Licinius, it remains a matter of surprise that he was not contented with some more secret and decent method of revenge. The Roman world was now divided between Constantine and Licinius the former of whom was master of the west, the latter of the east. It might perhaps have been expected that the conquerors, fatigued with civil war and connected by a private as well as public alliance, would have renounced, or at least would have suspended, any further designs of ambition. And yet a year had scarcely elapsed after the death of Maximin, before the victorious emperors turned their arms against each other. The genius, the success, and the aspiring temper of Constantine may seem to mark him out as the aggressor but the perfidious character of Licinius justifies the most unfavourable suspicions, and by the faint light which history reflects on this transaction, we may discover a conspiracy fomented by his arts against the authority of his colleague. Constantine had lately given his sister Anastasia in marriage to Bassianus, a man of a considerable family and fortune, and had elevated his new kinsman to the rank of Caesar. According to the system of government instituted by Diocletian, Italy and perhaps Africa were designed for his department in the empire. But the performance of the promised favour was either attended with so much delay, or accompanied with so many unequal conditions, that the fidelity of Bassianus was alienated rather than secured by the honourable distinction which he had obtained. His nomination had been ratified by the consent of Licinius, and that artful prince— by the means of his emissaries, soon contrived to enter into a secret and dangerous correspondence with the new Caesar, to irritate his discontents, and to urge him to the rash enterprise of extorting by violence what he might in vain solicit from the justice of Constantine. But the vigilant emperor discovered the conspiracy before it was ripe for execution, and, after solemnly renouncing the alliance of Bassianus, despoiled him of the purple, and inflicted the deserved punishment on his treason and ingratitude. The haughty refusal of Licinius, when he was required to deliver up the criminals who had taken refuge in his dominions, confirmed the suspicions already entertained of his perfidy, and the indignities offered at Haimona on the frontiers of Italy to the statues of Constantine became the signal of discord between the two princes. The first battle was fought near Cibalis, a city of Pannonia, situated on the river Save, about fifty miles above Sirmium. From the inconsiderable forces which, in this important contest, two such powerful monarchs brought into the field, it may be inferred that the one was suddenly provoked, and that the other was unexpectedly surprised. The Emperor of the West had only twenty thousand, the Sovereign of the East no more than five and thirty thousand men. The inferiority of number was, however, compensated by the advantage of the ground. 
Constantine had taken his post in a defile about half a mile in breadth, between a steep hill and a deep morass, and in that situation he steadily expected and repulsed the first attack of the enemy. He pursued his success and advanced into the plain. But the veteran legions of Illyricum rallied under the standard of a leader who had been trained to arms in the school of Probus and Diocletian. The missile weapons on both sides were soon exhausted. The two armies, with equal valour, rushed to a closer engagement of swords and spears, and the doubtful contest had already lasted from the dawn of the day to a late hour of the evening when the right wing, which Constantine led in person, made a vigorous and decisive charge. The judicious retreat of Licinius saved the remainder of his troops from a total defeat, but when he computed his loss, which amounted to more than twenty thousand men, he thought it unsafe to pass the night in the presence of an active and victorious enemy. Abandoning his camp and magazines, he marched away with secrecy and diligence at the head of the greatest part of his cavalry, and was soon removed beyond the danger of a pursuit. His diligence preserved his wife, his son, and his treasures which he had deposited at Sirmium. Licinius passed through that city, and, breaking down the bridge on the Save, hastened to collect a new army in Dacia and Thrace. In his flight he bestowed the precarious title of Caesar on Valens, his general of the Illyrian frontier. End of chapter 14, part 3